listening to that much. And, uh, you know, actually, I, I was running one year, and, you know, every once in a while, you, you know, you run in, you fall a lot. And, uh, but it, it, not really, you know, it's when you catch your toe and you really splat, you know, roll. I thought, you know, I'm going to keep track of this, how often I fall. You know, how many times do I fall each year? And about the next week, I went for a uh, solo snowshoe up Wilson Mountain. I fell 10 times on that trip and I decided, well, you know, maybe we fall a lot more than we ever thought, think we do, you know? So I, read a I, I read a definition of how you know you're getting old. And it is when, when you fall and everybody uh, just kind of laughs, you know, you're still young. If you fall and everybody comes running over and says, are you okay? So, <laughs> um, I'm happy. I see that they let Matt in. <laughs> Matt. Yeah. They, they were holding me hostage in a little, you know, side room there. But here we are. Let's see. Actually, we're uh, we're at time nine o'clock. So let's uh, let's see who we have out there. Steve, can you check and see if you have who you went in here? Um, there. Mr. Chairman, um, waiting for Trey. He's going to be presenting right up. <laughs> okay. Let me see if he's on the train. No, my panelists. I, I don't see Lena. Yeah, Lena's not here yet. Yeah, she was in, uh, I, I just talked to her earlier this morning. She had two back-to-back -back meetings. She was going to try and get on, uh, uh, you know, expediter thing. Uh, is Geronimo out there? Yes, he's on. There he is. Let me see. Oh, there he is. Yep. I don't know. Is that District 2 or District 3 in his background? Or District 1? Uh, I don't know. I just like the picture. <laughs> I took that picture. <laughs> That's in district. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll give credit where credit's due. It's a beautiful picture. That's why I keep it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Geronimo. <laughs> when you have the San Francisco peaks to photograph, you can't take a bad picture. That's <laughs> true. Oh, boy. I was just going to say, why don't you have one of my pictures in there? <laughs> Let me, right. let, me uh, let me check with Trey real quick because okay. he's first to, to go over boards and commissions with you. Yeah, we'll wait, uh, you know, for the sake of anybody that's out there, uh, uh, you know, before we call the meeting to order, we just want to make sure, you know, electronic days, let's see who's out there, make sure their mics work and all that kind of thing. So just uh, for the sake of the board, uh, uh, Val can't be with us today. We're, we're thinking of her uh, and her family. Uh, but Nico will be uh, doing the electronics and Lindsay's going to be taking minutes. Uh, that's what it was. Nico, what did you do? You didn't let me in uh, so I could respond uh, uh, to my fellow board members. There's Lindsay. Who is She's my in computer? <laughs> yeah, you're up in your grove now. Huh? The Aspen Grove. All right, good deal. Um, I've got two. Trey, Steve. What's that? I've got Trey, I'm just trying to get him in as a panelist. He just need. there he goes. Thank you. I all one if one second I need to pull up my documents. I was in another meeting. So yeah, we're, we're not quite we're not quite there yet, Trey. But we just wanted to make sure you're on deck. So, Mr. Chairman, you can proceed in opening the meeting. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Steve. All right, and the computer says recording in process. Uh, okay, uh, today I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, it's nine o'clock, a special session. Uh, providing the opportunity for us to play a little bit of catch up and do our round tables and get caught up on legislation, et cetera, in this first hour. Um, after that, we'll have a regular session uh, where we'll initiate taking action uh, associated with uh, uh, items of business and eventually uh, get into uh, uh, more work session scenarios for the afternoon. Uh, just a piece of note, I do have to leave the meeting today at uh, uh, 20 till 11. I'm kind of on multiple duty down here. Uh, uh, you know, I'm down in Chandler uh, uh, at this point. Uh, I know Vice Chair will, uh, Lena Fowler will be stepping in to uh, pick up the meeting uh, for that piece. 
Uh, so, uh, first item of business that we have is we call the meeting to order and we have the Pledge of Allegiance. If everybody could please rise and uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And then next item of business is a call to the public. And this is a courtesy that we provide uh, to provide people uh, an opportunity to bring items to our attention uh, that are, is, are not on our agenda. And uh, I'll catch you in a second here, Patrice. Uh, and with that, um, yeah. uh, we, we, we cannot Sorry, discuss- Sorry, Chair, Chair we, we really need to indicate the board members that are present, we forgot to do the- uh, Oh uh, gosh. So sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but we should know who's here. Oh. <laughs> I'll be, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> Thank you, Patrice. Yes, we do that. Uh, actually, a couple of different reasons. One, we acknowledge the board members are present, but it provides the opportunity for the board members to say hello also. So we'll start it out with District 1, Supervisor Horseman. Thank you, Patrice. <laughs> Hello, it's wonderful to be here and good morning all and good morning staff and members of the public and uh, let's move on. So thank you, Chair. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Patrice. Uh, next we have District 2, uh, Geronimo Vasquez. Uh, Geronimo? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. Look forward to having a good meeting. And then we have a, a healthy, wonderfully healthy uh, District 4 Supervisor Judy Begay back. Uh, thank, welcome back, Judy. Thank you so much, Chair, and my colleagues and staff and um, people that are on, on our, our, our stream here today. I'm really looking forward to the uh, agenda items that we're going to be discussing today, and I look forward to a productive meeting. Thank you. All right. And as noted, I'm not seeing it on. Uh, we, Vice Chair Fowler will be participating. I did have a, a check-in with her this morning. She said she would be, but she, she will be running late with uh, uh, meetings here. Okay, uh, so uh, let's go back to the call to the public. Uh, courtesy that we provide to uh, folks uh, for items that are not on our agenda uh, 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 so that you can bring them to our attention. And so uh, let's see, Lindsay, are you explaining or is Nico explaining how to use the call to the public? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and explain, Chair Ryan. If you are in the Zoom meeting and you'd like to make a comment at this time, you can hover down below on your screen and hit the raise hand icon that looks like a hand, and that will notify us that you would like to speak. And I don't see anyone on the phone, um, so it's just the raise hand icon that needs to be um, checked. And as I scroll through, I'm not seeing anybody, and you're not either, uh, Lindsay. That's correct. I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay, so we'll go back to, uh, I'll go ahead and close this portion of the call to the public, uh, and we'll continue to proceed through the agenda. And then, uh, let's see, first item that we have is... Uh, we're scheduled for 15 minutes to have a discussion on possible action on appointment of supervisors and staff on local boards. Steve, uh, were you suggesting that you want to go through legislative before we go through the boards and commissions? We don't have lean on either. Uh, at this um, point. Trey, are you able to pivot and do legislative update first so that we have Supervisor Fowler uh, in attendance for boards and commissions? Is, is, is that probably, probably would be beneficial to do that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, would that be okay with the board to reorder the agenda? Everybody okay with that? It's very easy. Right. Yep, let's go for it. Uh, so, uh, actually, we'll we'll go back to item one, uh, boards and commissions, and this is a discussion, possible direction uh, regarding state and federal legislative priorities. Uh, uh, we have Trey Williams, our public affairs director here. Trey. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Supervisors. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. I'm here to provide my um, uh, legislative update as I do, so I'm gonna share my screen here. 
get my presentation going. Sorry, my computer's a little slow. My computer's a little slow, I do apologize. It seems to, everything's kind of slow today technologically for some reason. I was getting, I was having trouble earlier today. Yeah, my computer is completely frozen. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but in terms of trying to get my presentation up, my computer is completely frozen. Okay, we can hear you, Trey. So one second, let me just do some troubleshooting here. Okay. Yeah, it seems to be one of those days. Uh, yes. uh, every, everybody's uh, having a little bit of a challenge. Uh, yeah, I got knocked off of Teams a couple times today, so, so we're just going to stay Mr. Chairman, this is Sue Brown. Yeah, go ahead, Sue. Apologize, but I just wanted to let you know, we'll contact IT and see if there's anything happening, but it appears that it's not a county only issue. It appears it's also at people's homes. So uh, we'll ask them to contact the provider. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, sorry about that delay and thank you, Sue, uh, for that. So this is just my legislative update for this week. Wanted to provide you for a, a legislative update on um, issues that are happening before the state. Uh, uh, and then to briefly go over some legislation for uh, your review, just some bills for you to be aware of, um, and uh, to also get some direction, some feedback um, on certain legislation that is before the legislature. As a reminder, my uh, name is Trey Williams. I am the Public Affairs Director for Coconino County. Um, Todd Medesca, um, with Elevated Advocacy, is my partner, uh, who's our state consultant and helps us work on legislation. As I do every uh, week or every uh, meeting, I provide uh, an overview of the calendar. Um, so as you can see where we're at here, we're, um, yesterday was the, uh, what is known as the intro set deadline. So that means for senators, it was their deadline to request uh, intro sets for their bills, um, which basically means that you can't, that's the last day for, for requests. And then we're going into um, next week the Senate bill introduction deadline. And so we will see more legislation introduced. Um, there's also some key deadlines in the house that are coming up. And then we're actually now coming up on three weeks away, two to three weeks away from a key deadline in which bills have to be heard in their chamber of origin. Otherwise they die. Of course, we always have strike everything amendments um, at the legislature, but um, that, that's another key deadline that's looming soon. In terms of session statistics, we are in the 16th day of session. Uh, there have been 1,061 bills introduced. If you'll recall, um, I believe two weeks ago or a week or two ago, we were at like something like 200, um, 200 two to 300. So as you can see, they're very busy down at the legislature. No bills have passed yet. Um, no bills have been vetoed. No bills have been signed. 83 memorials and resolutions have been posted and one memorial and resolution have been passed. And that is to honor the life and work of the late representative Frank Pratt. In terms of the, um, uh, the, the budget, the governor um, released his 2023 executive budget recommendation um, for fiscal year 23, even though it happened in 2022. Uh, and it was a proposed, he proposed a $14.24 billion budget last week. Um, he also unveiled several key policy priorities and the funding associated with them and provided those details in the executive budget recommendation. Some of those are the things that we saw him outline in his state of the state, such as the $1 billion deposit into the drought mitigation fund, um, $248 million investment to increase select state worker salaries, that superior court judges, justices of the peace, DPS officers and DOC and Department of Juvenile Correction Workers. In terms of the county touch points for the executive budget recommendation, uh, there was a $1.2 million a pro, uh, a proposed expenditure for probation salary increases. There was um, increases to, or mandatory increases to the county contributions to all techs. And then there was um, the, uh, excuse me, not mandatory increases, increases to our mandatory county contributions, uh, just to be clear on that. And then of course it continued the cost shift um, to Maricopa and Pima counties related to the, um, the $8.5 million that they are required to help fund the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Um, in terms of how this um, impacts CSA, 
Um, you will all note that one of CSA's priorities is the elimination of those cost shifts for Maricopa and Pima counties. So the governor did recommend to continue that. Um, and then of course there, was, uh, there were a lot of um, uh, items in the governor's budget recommendation that uh, will continue to um, inform and, and help bolster uh, CSA's budget priorities. Um, so not really much of an update here. Um, just something I wanted to, um, that I flag for you every meeting. And then in terms of the adopted legislative proposals, we've seen quite a bit of movement on these particular items. As of right now, all of the CSA coalition legislative agenda priorities have been introduced um, as bills. Uh, we, there's just one um, that actually is just run into a roadblock. Um, so these bills are continuing to um, advance. Uh, one of the ones that um, continues to advance, which I don't think it was part of their coalition agenda, but it relates to the, uh, the cost shift to Maricopa and Pima counties requiring them to help fund the Arizona Department of Juvenile Corrections. Um, that's moving through the process. And then one of these bills was up for committee last week, um, but was postponed. So these bills are, are continuing to move through the process. In terms of an overall CSA update, the CSA Board of Directors did meet last week on uh, Thursday, January 20th. As part of that, they did also conduct their legislative policy committee agenda or policy committee meeting. Um, so that was considered by the entire CSA Board of Directors. The CSA Legislative Policy Committee began their uh, legislative policy committee meetings on January 14th. They met for their inaugural meeting. So far of the two meetings that have been uh, had, the C uh, CSA Legislative Policy Committee and Board has taken positions on 18 bills. They've opposed 12 bills based on county feedback. Six of those bills are election bills with a negative or problematic impact or no discernible benefit. Some of those bills that are the six election bills that CSA is opposing, CSA is working with the sponsors and stakeholders to try to reach some sort of compromise to be able to achieve whatever goal or outcome the sponsor is, is working on. Um, but some of those bills are obviously the CSA outright opposes them. Um, then there are six bills that CSA opposed just based off fiscal administrative impact, some of which um, I will present shortly. And then of course, CSA is supporting um, six bills, has, has voted to support six bills overall. Uh, and then they also discussed um, an overall federal update um, and NACO update at their board of directors meeting. The next meeting for the board of directors will be on February 17th. And then the LPC will meet of course this Friday. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't know if I wanted to turn it over to you to see if there was anything you wanted to add about CSA LPC to your colleagues since you are our representative on the committee. No, I, I, yeah, just a quick note. Uh, we're, we're getting off and uh, as you get off and launch into another legislative year, uh, it's, it's a reminder there are many bills. Uh, and, and so uh, as we got into our first LPC meeting, there were people wanting specific information uh, that staff would, uh, CSA staff would be working on and bringing back to the board. Uh, oh no, you know, it's, it's usually newer supervisors just learn, learning process associated with it. I think it really settled down this past week uh, with everybody uh, understanding, you know, the impact of counties, that's what we're looking at. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's smoothing out and I think it's going well. Uh, Trey covered the bills uh, quite well uh, associated with that. Um, yeah, that's that. Okay. Mr. Chair, then I'm just gonna continue on. Um, there's just a list of bills I wanted to very quickly go through um, just so that you all um, can see them. So I'm just going to eliminate some of my tabs here. So this is just a, a, a list of about 10 or 11 bills that I wanted you to be aware of. There are new bills that are being introduced as I mentioned. We have those key deadlines. So this is by no means an exhaustive list. What Todd and I try to do is we try to bring bills to your attention that we know that are moving, that might have a potential impact. So you will notice on your list, um, for instance, it talks about the posted hearings and calendars. So that is the committee uh, along with the date and time that it's meeting, uh, which as you can see, most of them are, some of them are moving this week. And then others are just ones that I know have been items of interest for the board. Um, that I wanted you to be aware of. 
this is something, this is a, a running list that I can add to. If there are specific bills you hear about that you would like me to present or to track, please let me know. Um, but as I said, we are, it's, it's a moving target at this point as bills are being introduced. And so for your next meeting, I do anticipate to have more bills in this list that have more uh, of a direct impact to us. We're still assessing where these bills are at in the process, the stakeholders who have been involved in them, the sponsors uh, desired outcome and goals, that sort of thing. So without further ado, I'm just gonna run through a few of them. Um, HB 2070 is a bill that would uh, require all public bodies, which includes the board, to provide for a reasonable amount of seating to accommodate um, the attendance of the public uh, at all deliberations and proceedings. And then it also uh, requires the notice in the, a notice in the agenda uh, to have the time that the public will have physical access to that meeting. And if a public body doesn't, you know, is in violation of this section, uh, consistent with open meeting law violations, they are liable for a civil penalty. Um, and that would be the head of the public body. So that would be the chair of the board. In determining the impetus for this bill, it's not, we're not quite clear where Representative Kavanaugh uh, is going with it. There, there are uh, efforts to reach out to him to, to uh, learn more about this bill. There is some indication that it is related to schools and school district board meetings, uh, but it obviously affects all uh, public bodies, which includes the Board of Supervisors and any of the other uh, ancillary committees or commissions that the county operates. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the bill will be heard tomorrow in House Government and Elections Committee at 9 a.m. Um, any questions on that bill before I move on to some other ones? Just a few more I would like you to be aware of. Any questions? Just, uh... Trey has the screen up, speak up if you do have them. I can't see everybody. I'm not seeing it up. Go ahead, Trey. Thank you. And then I just want you to, uh, wanted you all to be aware that there are bills both in the House and the Senate um, related to the, the regulations uh, for short-term vacation rentals um, and what counties and municipalities can do um, with them. Um, they're not moving at this point yet. We are still collecting information on them. There is a bill sponsored by Representative, <clears throat> excuse me, Kaiser in the House and Senator Mesner in the Senate um, that has been ongoing. Um, to my understanding, we're still collecting information, but I wanted you to be aware of them as these bills come to a committee agenda and as CSA begins, we learn where our, our fellow counties are at with them as well as the league. Um, I will keep you posted on them. For now, I wanted you to be aware that they are out there and that they could move. Um, and then, there are several election bills uh, that have been um, introduced that a both ACO and CSA are opposing. Um, so uh, there's a few of them that are on this list that were heard in the Senate Government Committee yesterday that did pass out. So that includes SB 1119 and SB 1120. So, so Trey, uh, you're, we're not seeing any bills listed in, on the screen here. We okay. have your, you, you have your introductory legislative uh, and age reads bills. Uh, but we don't have the bills you're speaking to. Oh, I'm on the list, so it's not showing. Um, you're not able to see the list that I'm running down on my screen for the rest. That's correct. That's correct. Well, um, let me just. And in the meantime, Lindsay, can you let me in? Let me redo that then. What about now? Yes, we can see. Okay. Sorry about that, troubleshooting um, with the technology. So as you can see, if there are any questions, um, HB 2070, that's the first bill here that I talked about. Um, and then in the vacation, sh the short-term vacation rental bills that have been introduced, one in the House, one in the Senate, there are several of these bills. There's a bill in fact sponsored by our, one of our LD, our LD6 Senator, uh, Wendy Rogers, to completely repeal the preemption that the legislature enacted um, several years ago. So, but these are the ones that potentially have the most viability, HB 2234, and then Senator Mesner's companion bill in the Senate. So it's just, that's the bill I was referring to um, in terms of wanting you to be aware that it's out there, isn't moving yet. There are bills, for instance, that impact um, counties and uh, are uh, the larger counties. So there is a bill um, sponsored by Representative Hoffman that would, the, the salary increase that the legislature enacted last year that will go into effect on January 1st, 2025. 
um, this would uh, no longer increase that salary for uh, large counties. So for counties with a population of more than 500,000 people. So just wanted you to be aware of that as that doesn't impact you directly if you see it, um, but that is a bill that's out there. Whenever there are bills that are introduced and they are germane to other amendments, we could see this bill amended. So since it is relative to counties and supervisors and supervisorial salaries, I, I just wanted you to be aware of that one. Um, uh, then I, the election bills I was mentioning before Supervisor Ryan informed me you couldn't see were these SB 1119 and SB 1120. Uh, those bills, as I mentioned, did pass the Senate Government Committee. There were about 11 election bills that passed the Senate Government Committee yesterday um, that ACO and CSA did weigh in on in the committee, did weigh in with their opposition, and they're continuing to work with the sponsor and the Senate on these particular uh, election bills. And then one that I just wanted everyone to be aware of is a bill that sponsored um, both in the House and the Senate, SB 1198, and it prohibits counties and political subdivisions overall from um, hiring contract lobbyists. Uh, again, we're assessing the uh, impetus of this bill, um, but it would have an impact in that the work that we do with CSA and ACO would no longer be allowed. Uh, the work that we do with some of our private consultants would not be allowed. So it's just something that it's a, um, the board to be aware of as it is, does impact legislative matters for the board. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions right now? Yes, if I could, Chair Ryan. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, just, um, and, and Trey, I, I know you don't have any crystal ball to tell us what the future is going to bring with the legislature, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, we've gone through the short term. I mean, short term rentals, rentals remain a problem for um, uh, many of our neighborhoods here in Coconino County. Uh, and, you know, do these look like they have more support given the sponsors or uh, is this just gonna be more of the same and no action? Uh, Mr. Chair, Supervisor Horseman, I think that that's, we, we may see some action this year. Um, I don't, I, again, the, using, you know, having a crystal ball and making predictions with the legislature is, is dangerous, but those two bills that I mentioned, HB 2234 and the companion bill over in the Senate, do seem to be the ones that appear to move. Whether or not they will make it to the finish line remains to be seen. Uh, but I do think that those bills, along with bills that were introduced by Representative Blackman and Senator Rogers, both of whom are our representative and senator, uh, that there is there, the conversation is there, right? So the potential for a good, for an actual outcome where we solve this problem, for instance, for the board, um, your ability to respond to short-term vacation rentals and and exercise more, uh, more innovative and beneficial regulatory authority in this space. That opportunity is certainly there with the number of bills that have been introduced um, that have the potential to advance through the process. And so my understanding is we could see something this year. The conversation will certainly move through the process, but um, with all of the various stakeholders and what's happened in the past, never say never. So, I mean, it, 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 something could, you know, we could still not see resolution, but the the framework is there to see a good outcome on this issue. Yeah, and I probably add to that real quick, uh, Patrice. Uh, we're having uh, some of our more conservative legislators moving into the group uh, that would have been opposition in the past. So it, it's a good sign uh, associated with that uh, possibility. Is it's election year, uh, which plays into the dynamic uh, with that. Uh, however, legislation is like making sausage. What kind of sausage are we going to get, you know, when it comes out? Uh, the other piece of it is, you know, it, it, it seems like it, you throw it against the wall and it doesn't stick. It's, it takes three tries. We're, we're about at our third try of getting these through. And so a lot of momentum and understanding has grown over the years. So that helps too. Yeah, thank you. I, I know we've kind of held off on, um, you know, looking at this for changes within the county because of the limitations of the current law. And so um, keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. Anything else from the board? Uh, seeing it. Okay, just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Steve. No, uh, I think we're going to mention the same bill. So did yeah. you want to speak on that first and then I'll follow? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I actually, uh, we um, uh, 
Coconino Community College uh, has been working with uh, representative black men uh, to try and put together a, uh, a training program uh, that, as including law enforcement. So very important to uh, sheriff's office and deputies that can really benefit uh, you know, the programs that they already have and they, they need funding for some of the infrastructure. So they're asking for a uh, million dollars. Uh, the house bill is 2110. Uh, enough to get some of the background support equipment. Uh, and they asked if we would uh, help weigh in associated with it. So uh, uh, myself, along with the sheriff, with the sheriff staff, uh, with uh, Dr. Smith, uh, 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 Steve uh, was down with us with the contingent. We were able to uh, advocate with that in, in the House uh, Military Affairs and Public Safety uh, Committee. Uh, so it, it got a 13 to two vote uh, uh, in getting approved. It has two more uh, committees to go through uh, appropriations. I forget what the second one is, but it is, it's usually a kiss of death when you get three committees. They've gotten it through the first committee quickly, uh, which is a good sign. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll see where it goes, Steve. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. As originally drafted, you will see that the focus is initially on firefighting training programs. However, there is a need for law enforcement training as well. We currently send our deputy new recruits, new hires to other academies, Yuma County, uh, Yuma County, Yavapai, La Paz. And so the need uh, for a local law enforcement training academy is, is very much needed. It would reduce our, our, our expenditure basically in, in that area. Uh, we currently have an agreement with uh, CCC to provide uh, the Detention Officer Academy. And so and they've been providing that academy for a number of years. Uh, and so the goal and the vision is to uh, create uh, a firefighting as well as a law enforcement academy. This, is, this takes years in the making. Uh, a good example is, is uh, Yuma County. Uh, Arizona Western, in particular, uh, created the, the academy in, in Yuma that has been uh, there for many years uh, as, a, as a collaboration with Yuma County and Arizona Western. And so, uh, again, it, that certainly would be the example that at some point we would be looking to, to partner with other law enforcement and firefighting agencies to, to create. So, Mr. Chair, um, back to you, sir. All right. And then, you know, just checking in uh, with the board, it was one that came up quickly. And so it's, it's one of those ones that you can see the benefit associated with the county, but wanted to make you aware uh, that we did provide testimony in that way. Uh, anybody have questions or comments on that? Mr. Chair, I just wanted to provide this specific information on its uh, progress through the legislature and uh, the legislative information. So yesterday, they appeared, uh, we appeared before the House Military and Public, uh, Public Safety Committee, the MAPS Committee, and but the bill has been double assigned uh, to the MAPS Committee as well as House Appropriations. So even though it passed its first committee in the Military Affairs and Public Safety, it will now proceed to appropriations. And then once it passes that committee, it will have to go through rules, uh, caucus, and then it will proceed on to the floor. So just if you have any questions procedurally on the bill, um, please let me know that I just wanted you all to have that specific information so you know which committees it's going through. And I believe that hearing for uh, House Appropriations is on Wednesday. Um, so it'll move through those committees this week. And because it's been heard early in the process, there's a good chance of, of making it out, at least out of the House. So a long road to travel, but uh, yeah, good sign at least in the beginning on that. Uh, anything further on legislative? Yeah, I got a question. So yeah. it said that uh, there were several bills that went through the governmental committee that passed yesterday. What's the process with those bills now? Sure, Mr. Chair. So those bills now will, uh, um, all of those bills have been single assigned to government to my understanding. So now those bills are going to go from, from there um, they then have to go through rules. Um, and then after those bills go through rules, then they will be discussed in majority and minority caucus. Uh, so that is, in, you know, if you're, if you're interested in any of these particular bills, uh, rules is more procedural. So rules is a, typically they don't take any testimony in rules. The rules committee in both chambers 
just examines and analyzes the bills to determine if they're con what's known as constitutional and proper. Um, so they they uh, talk about the legality um, and uh, whether or not the bill meets process. And then from there it goes to caucus. Both majority and minority caucuses discuss the bill uh, in an open meeting. They can also close their caucuses though if they want to, but typically caucuses are open. Um, and then from there, um, then it heads to the floor. Uh, for bills, there's one thing to know that there are, cal um, there are consent calendars. And so for bills that don't receive amendments and the Senate and House rules are different um, in terms of consent calendars. So for bills that don't receive amendments, they can be put on a consent calendar. And then from that consent calendar, they proceed directly to what is known as third reading, meaning that that bill goes up for an up or down vote in the chamber. So it will be, we'll, we'll wait to see if any of these bills are put on a consent calendar, either a Cal consent or third reading calendar. Um, but um, at this point, that's, that's the next steps are, the next steps where they will be debated is in majority and minority caucus. And those typically happen on Tuesdays uh, in the morning. Some rules will meet on Monday, they'll, they'll go through rules. And then on Tuesday, majority and minority caucus will consider the bills. And then from there, they proceed to floor action. The Senate, Senate leadership is very interested. It's a high priority for them. Senator Mesner was sick yesterday and they replaced him on the committee with Senator Rogers. So I anticipate these bills to move pretty quickly out of the chamber. We could see them up for a vote as early as next week. Thank you. Trying to get off mute. Uh, actually, probably should move us on if you have any additional questions associated with legislation. Uh, have Trey available and the bills are going to keep rolling in. So, uh, and so we're going to be on a, you know, pretty heavy defense of uh, particularly associated with the election bills. Uh, uh, so just keep watching and please uh, reach out to Trey and we'll continue to convey our message. Um, okay. Um, let's go back to the first item of discussion, uh, which is associated with the, uh, Boards and committees, uh, and actually, I think we could probably take care of it pretty quick, unless uh, people want to shift all over the place, you know, and if you do, we can do that too, uh, on that, uh, but um, uh, we have a list that's in our packet that was provided, um, rather than going through everyone one after the other, um, you know, it, it might be an opportunity just to see does anybody want to make changes uh, and or do we anticipate particular changes occurring? And the first one, you know, I'll, I'll bring up is um, uh, I've, I've stepped off of uh, Nate Maycock's uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. Usually that one is an appointee um, from uh, uh, the county uh, to have one position over there. Uh, with that available, uh, actually, uh, Chris Fetzer reached out to uh, uh, Hieronymo, uh, asked if he would be interested in doing it, uh, and, and, uh, but we would need to check in with Hieronymo. It's not a heavy commitment, it's a pretty light one, but it's, it, it makes sense uh, you know, in terms of you're involved with uh, uh, two of the transportation elements to cover that, that third one, uh, so it's comprehensive one, making sense. Uh, so Hieronymo, you know, would you be interested in that? And then let's check in with the board and see if the board's okay uh, on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. And I've already let Chris know that I would be interested in doing it, so. Okay, okay I, I told Chris, uh, we haven't decided, so we'll, we'll see, you know, on that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually, our, I'll check in with the board. Uh, are, are you okay with uh, Ronimo being our point eight that goes over to uh, NACOC? Go ahead, Patrice. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, uh, Geronimo has taken a lead in this area. He now uh, sits as the vice chair for Metro Plan. Thank you, Geronimo. And uh, he really has taken a lead uh, in this uh, area. So I absolutely support it. And thank you, Geronimo, for taking that on. Uh, uh, other board members, uh, Lena, are you okay with uh, Geronimo hopping into NAGOG Transportation now? And Judy, I'd say, uh, I see. I think that's a great appointment. Thank you. Okay. Judy's nodding her head also. Okay. Um, uh, that's an easy one. 
Uh, some of the, you know, other changes that uh, will occur, the chairmanship, when we shift chairmanship, that will be shifted to the chair, vice chair. Uh, you know, I think uh, as we adopt these, we could go ahead and just, you know, I, I, my suggestion is we just put chair, vice chair, and when it's available, they make the name changes uh, uh, in that perspective. Uh, everybody okay with that? You yes. see Patrice nodding her head, yep. nodding heads there. Uh, okay. Um, other uh, committees of uh, adjustments. Uh, anybody looking to hop off of one, hop on in one, want to shift around associated with them? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, I, have ahead, been asked, I have been asked to be on the NACOC Economic Development Committee. Um, apparently, there is a vacancy now. I know the board had. Um, had me assigned to that, but um, former supervisor Art Babbitt was still on there. So um, I don't know if it's him or someone else that have stepped down. So I'll be, I have agreed to join that. Um, well, that's a, that's, that's a good one to put in. So that one, we don't make a determination in uh, for the Geronimo seat. Yes. They take it from Coconino County, but for economic development, that's an appointment by NACOG. Uh, but what we could do is put together a letter in support of Lena uh, going for that. Are you okay with us putting a letter of support in? I'm Absolutely. seeing thumb, thumbs up uh, on that. Yeah, thank okay. you. And, and I just wanted to just bring that up. So um, as far as committees are concerned. So thank you. Okay. Uh, some of the typo, you know, some things that you want to go in uh, and check on would be, uh, you took a, a uh, this would be Lindsay uh, on this. Uh, it would be, I see Jimmy Jane still under the launch piece. I don't, I don't know if they're even meeting right now, but uh, um, it, you need to shift uh, Steve or Steve's designee uh, into that position as staff uh, support. It is, and it is still active, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay. Uh, on that. Um, others uh, going out to board members. Uh, not seeing any changes on that. Uh, I have a question, Chair, if I can. Yeah. On please, the uh, County uh, Supervisors Association Legislative Policy Committee, we've already put in our recommendation to appoint you for that. So I assume that's happened. And I think I was the alternate. I will still be willing to be alternate if they're needing an alternate on that? Yeah, we have uh, down at uh, CSA, that's already been posted. So yeah, we need to put that in. Uh, I think I'm still listed there, Patrice, but I didn't see you in as alternate on that. So we need to put that in there uh, for that. And then uh, that's the LPC, Ronimo on that. Uh, there, there's one, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. There's no one from the county assigned. If we don't have anybody that would be willing to do that, I'd be willing to, to be assigned for that. Now, that one is, uh, we don't designate for NACO uh, associated with that. You need to put your name in uh, for that. Uh, and usually they take uh, those uh, enrollments in October. Uh, through CSA, right? Is it October or November? Trey can get back to you on the, the detail associated with that. Is I'm that right, Trey? You're committee. talking about Maleo, right? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about the, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, Maleo, not sure. NAC. Yeah, that's not a designation by us. Uh, but if, yeah. Can you uh, help Geronimo out, Trey, with the. Uh, uh, application process and the time associated with that. Absolutely. But you have an interest, and if you get on it, we can get it listed uh, that that you're on that uh, particular one. Someone else likes that idea too. What's, what's that? Someone else likes that idea also. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I thought. Uh, sorry about that. Dog in the background. Uh, the one uh, that, uh, oh, there it is. Yep. I don't have any others that I saw. Um, uh, do we have any committees that we need to remove? I didn't fully take a look at that and or that we have staff assigned to. 
Don't say anything. Okay. And we have a, a chance. We can always come back and uh, make an amendment associated with this. Uh, how are we posted for this? Is this discussion? Uh, mm -hmm. we, we're, we're also posted for action associated with that. Um, uh, everybody good uh, with what we have in there? Yeah. And like I said, we can always come back later on if we need to do a modification and amendment. Uh, so, Patrice, uh, go ahead. I'd like to make a motion if we can. Okay. If, okay. That would be wonderful. Just to move on here. And um, uh, I would like to make the motion that we appoint supervisors and staff members to the various selected local boards, state boards, and national boards and commissions as set forth in the materials as presented. I have a motion by Supervisor Worsman. Uh, second. I have, I have a second by Supervisor Vasquez. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed? All right, fantastic. Okay, next item of business is discussion review, uh, possible direction uh, associated with the planning calendar. Steve? Great. Mr. Chair, very quickly, do you want to go right to roundtable? Because you have about 15 minutes. I, I think it would make sense that we do that, come back. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. we're okay with that. We haven't had a roundtable in a while. So, uh, okay, let's let's go ahead and start off. Uh, Supervisor Horseman, District 1. Well, you know it's been a while because I have as my first item from back a couple of weeks ago, Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> so it's so been a while. Um, you know, the other, uh, on a, a much sadder note, I, I want to uh, acknowledge and extend my um, sincere condolences uh, to the family of the um, uh, child uh, that uh, uh, was a fatality on an incident that occurred on 180. Um, and, you know, we always strive in the county um, uh, Deputy Sheriff was uh, the first uh, law enforcement to arrive on the scene. Uh, and I want to extend, you know, my deep appreciation for that deputy as well. I'm sure this was a very difficult response for, for him uh, and uh, uh, for him to have to be out there for. And, and just, uh, you know, to, to let the board know and members of the public, um, the county has been a longtime uh, partner with DPS and ADOT, who actually control 180, and have uh, continued and we're continuing uh, this ongoing partnership uh, to bring all parties to the table to work in conjunction with each other uh, for uh, continuing our safety and precautions taken on 180, and especially in the snow play area. Um, obviously, that's going to continue to happen. Uh, we are looking for even more ways uh, for education, for outreach, uh, and for enforcement. So I want to ensure uh, the, the board uh, and members of the public that uh, we are doing what we can and taking a, a, a very serious look as we move forward on this. Um, you know, sometimes even with our best efforts, uh, these things, these tragedies occur. So. Uh, and I want to thank the county manager and the county staff and the sheriff's department. You, you all have done a great job. Wes Dyson has done just a great job on, uh, you know, a response. So thank you all. Um, so on a, a much happier note, I also want to congratulate Teresa Hatopoli, Senator Hatopoli, uh, for all the reasons that uh, we have uh, looked at when we got our review, our legislative review um, from Trey it's important that we had that seat filled, and we certainly wish her well in, in her new position down there in uh, uh, the, the state legislature. And then uh, Metro Plan, I wanted to announce that um, although I remain on Metro Plan and look forward to uh, continuing to serve the county in that area, uh, Geronimo Vasquez is the new vice chair of Metro Plan. Um, and I really appreciate him stepping up and assuming a leadership role. Uh, and again, uh, he will continue to do great service for our county. Uh, and I've been working uh, continually uh, with collaborations, with Forest Service, with Four Fry, um, working with uh, Lucinda Andriani and others here at the county uh, for uh, ongoing uh, flood mitigation efforts. Uh, we have. Believe it or not, a short window before the monsoons come here soon. 
and uh, certainly have appreciated the expedited work done by county, Lucinda Andriani and county staff in that direction. And I know both um, Supervisor Vasquez and myself have tried to remain up to speed on what's going on so that we can act as a conduit within members of our community. Uh, we have had a Mount Eldon Estates meeting uh, and outreach on, on this just to give them an update on uh, where we are going with the flood mitigation, watershed restoration, uh, and um, uh, the efforts that we will be hopefully uh, starting uh, before our monsoon season this year. And then, of course, uh, both um, um, uh, Supervisor Vasquez and myself continue to work with outreach with uh, her, um, uh, Representative O'Halloran's office and both of our senators for their assistance and help uh, with regards to forest management and uh, forest restoration. And uh, I have been working with uh, the uh, town of Tuzian. Uh, they have some very exciting news on rural broadband. Uh, they have been um, their the, uh, school district there in Grand Canyon Unified School District uh, had an E-rate grant and were able to put a fiber optic cable to the school and the town of Tuzian uh, was able to hook up to that and have uh, basically built their own um, uh, fiber circle in the city of Tuzian. And they are also exploring some very exciting um, uh, internet capabilities and outreach into some of the surrounding areas, including Valley. So I'll keep you updated as, as that gets developed. Uh, it's nice to see that some of the ARPA funds uh, and some of the federal monies uh, that have come out are really assisting some of our uh, small rural towns uh, to develop a broadband system. So uh, that's exciting for me. Um, and then uh, just, I was going to talk about this year, I really wanted us to really take a look at short-term rentals. Uh, you know, every year we don't look at it because we keep thinking the legislature is finally going to do something about this bill. Uh, let's see. Um, although I would like for us uh, as the Board of Supervisors to take a real look at our nuisance ordinance because that is right now the only way to enforce uh, short-term rentals and, and noise and parties and everything else. Uh, that we're hearing um, that are causing some real disturbances within our neighborhoods. So I'd like us to take that on sometime uh, this year. Uh, it's January, so I guess we could still look forward to opportunities uh, for us as a board. And then last but not least, and you know, it's with um, you know a great sadness that I have to report that Julian, uh, my district director, uh, has uh, decided that. He is going to um, look to LA as his principal home, although he's assured me that Flagstaff will always be a secondary home for he and his grandfather. So he will be leaving me uh, at the uh, end of this week. Uh, and I certainly wish him well and wish he and his grandfather um, uh, great um, opportunities in, in our, uh, there in the LA area. And I am happy to report that I do have a district director to fill that seat. Her name is Chris Newell. Um, hopefully at the next meeting, I can do a quick introduction of her. Uh, she is a um, longtime resident here at Flag and then moved away for about 10 years, came back, former teacher, former director of, of uh, Willow Bend, uh, worked for Grand Canyon Trust and the Girl Scouts. So uh, I'm very, very happy to have her join the District 1 staff and the only staff, but join the District 1 team and uh, look forward to uh, working with her. And I know she's looking forward to meeting all of you, uh, working with our wonderful county staff and our, our other district directors. So, uh, Mr. Chair, that is my report. You're on, you're on mute. Now we go, did it again. All right, uh, Supervisor Vasquez. District 2. You're um, you. First you were muted and then I was muted. Sorry about that. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, thank you. I, I was looking at my notes for round table and just realized we haven't done round table since December. So there's some things that even before Christmas that I wanted to kind of share with folks before we moved on. Uh, December 20th, I had the opportunity to do the tour of the jail and wanted to thank deputy chief, uh, 
Axland, uh, Commander Figueroa, and Lieutenants Hoover, and all of their other staff at the uh, facility for taking the time to give me the tour. I got lucky. I got in and got to see what was going on in the jail with COVID before the COVID outbreak hit and closed the jail down. So, uh, but it was a great opportunity to see the services that are provided by our county staff and, and the quality of, of, um, of work done by our staff. So I just wanted to put a shout out to them and I'm really excited to see about the proposed Pathways to Community program for, for those leaving and re-entering society. That's, uh, that's really exciting to see what, what happens with that program. Um, then I was also had the opportunity to go uh, volunteer at the Family Food Center. We went with the county green team and we distributed food for a couple hours at the, at the drive-through. That was a lot of fun. Uh, really highlighted the need in our community. I was really surprised at the amount of families and and, uh, and who was in line. It, it, it wasn't, you know, your usual suspects. It, it was obvious that there were families and communities that, that are just being pushed over the edge and need that extra support that, you know, by, by the vehicles that I was seeing coming through the drive-through, I saw some newer vehicles and that kind of surprised me. You know, it wasn't your, your stereotypical uh, participants at the food center. And so, you know, it was, it was good to be right before Christmas to be able to help uh, pass out food to, to our community. Um, then on the 22nd, I went to, the, to the, um, the mall location for vaccinations and got my booster, uh, took my son, got his first vaccination, and then took my mom and got her booster and, and went. And I was really impressed with the team over there. Uh, took some time to to meet them and and kind of give a, a little morale boost and and talk a little bit about you know how important their work is and then you know found out that there were some at least three staff members there that spoke Spanish so we made a little video to the Spanish community to let folks know that the vaccination is is available and there are staff that speak Spanish and then on a personal personal note. Uh, last week, uh, two of my children came out positive with COVID, and so I've been COVID exposed. And so for the last uh, week, I've been, it changed my, my calendar because all the, the in-person meetings and tours that I had planned for this last week had to be changed to virtual, just out of everybody's protection. I did go to the Elks Logs Lodge to get tested, and a week later, still haven't received my results. So I'm not sure what's going on. But because my kids tested positive, I'm just assuming that, that uh, I was exposed. Um, then on top of that, uh, I had the opportunity to attend the CSA engagement uh, state webinar and just learn more about the legislative process. Uh, last year when I came in, appointed in February, the, the legislature was already in process. So I didn't get some of those introduction uh, meetings. And so it was good to, to be able to sit through that and learn more about you know, both uh, the state legislature and also CSA's role in the state legislature. Um, then, of course, the, the special session to elect our uh, LD7 state senator, Teresa Hatathili. Uh, I want to say congratulations to her and then also thank you for the staff for, for taking us through that process. It was grueling, but you, the staff did an awesome job in, in preparing and get us ready for that. So thank you. And then I wanted to take the, the opportunity to introduce, um, we added an intern to the District 2 team. And so uh, our spring semester intern is Ariana Kelly, and she's uh, in her final semester uh, at NAU studying women and gender studies with a minor in community engagement and queer, stu queer studies. And uh, she'll be she'll be working with us as an intern for this next uh, this next semester. So that's really exciting. Um, also had an opportunity to meet with Catholic Charities with Sandy Flores from Catholic Charities to learn more about what programs they provide to the community and, and listen to ideas of potential partnerships moving forward. Um, I also met with the city of Flagstaff on January 13th to talk about uh, the flood update. Got an update with what's going on with Dortha, Maine, and also their plan for communication as, as uh, future events happen uh, uh, related to the, to the flooding and, and giving updates to the community. Uh, it took a while to get some of these plans and communications out there, but based on the, the briefing that I got, it looks like there's some good things are happening and we should be able to get some good things uh, going before uh, the next monsoon season, including the sirens, including the detention basin at Killup and working at the North and Main Inlet. So there, there, are, there is progress happening, uh, maybe not as fast as some folks would like it, but you know, the, the wheels turn slowly in, in government, but we're finally there and, and hopefully this spring we'll be able to crank out those projects as need be. 
the air, the fern, the Oni Park uh, Timberline Fernwood Area Plan, uh, working on committee comments and finalizing the goals and policies. Uh, there were some public comments that were brought in that that created the, the area plan team to have to take a minute for a second and kind of take consideration some, some uh, feedback that was a little different than what they had heard up till that point. And so they're going through that process of, of kind of digesting that and seeing how that applies to the, to the future area plan. Uh, then on MLK day, I, I had the opportunity to go to the NAU Office of Inclusion. And I spoke to students about public service and what it means back means to give back to your community and the importance of being engaged, especially politically right now, especially with what's going on with the legislature and voting rights, how important it is for folks to stand up and be engaged to protect their right to vote. Um, and then uh, finally, our, uh, our District 2 newsletter came out on the 19th. It was sent out via email, but if you have any questions or want some details, please email Arena to get a copy of it. And then I guess the last thing I'll, I'll add is I had the opportunity to attend the Naleo uh, year, year one in review with uh, Vice President Camille Harris. And she talked about the impact of the Biden administration's policies on Latino communities and, and how, it, how the, it supported both young families and small businesses. And so it was very enlightening and, and, and a great opportunity to listen to the Vice President speak about some of the accomplishments over this first year. So that's, uh, that's my report. Uh, things are going well and uh, just appreciate all the support from everybody. Thank you. And many more items in between, I'm sure. So we are time certain, uh, uh, particularly on uh, one of the facility elements that we have to go over uh, uh, for the board for the 10 o'clock meeting. Uh, we can continue this uh, with, uh, we still need to do uh, District four, uh, three, four, and five, uh, as far as reporting back the county managers, uh, item number three, and uh, 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 the planning calendar, as well as the county manager's update. So we can cover those uh, later on. Uh, we need to uh, now pause and go back to our regular meeting, uh, you know, start a regular meeting that we are posted for. I'm just trying to get my agenda set up uh, appropriately here. Uh, and the first item of business associated with that is item no number six. Uh, in, in item number six, we have the consideration and possible action designating January, 2022 as human trafficking awareness and prevention month. And it might take us just a moment to uh, uh, cue this up, uh, but we have our public affairs director, Trey Williams, that will introduce the item. And as I understand, we also have uh, uh, Kate Wyatt from Northland Family uh, Health uh, Center to help us out uh, uh, in the reading of the proclamation and updating us on this item. So I'll turn to uh, Trey Williams. Trey? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I can see that uh, Ms. Wyatt is with us also. So, Trey, are you there? Or has he had? Mr. Hey. Chairman, this is Sue again. I yeah, apologize. Go ahead, I'm gonna, I will go uh, double check on Trey, but I believe he was having some problem with his audio mic, um, but I will go and double check. Well, that's okay. Uh, if you could do that, Sue, but I, I yeah. think uh, we can go ahead and proceed uh, okay. with the item. Uh, and uh, just uh, uh, every year, uh, uh, we pause for a moment for this proclamation, and, and uh, uh, we want to welcome Kate Wyatt and helping us with the proclamation, uh, e explaining the importance of uh, uh, making this proclamation. Um, Kate, I, I need you to test your microphone now. Let's see if it's working okay. Good morning, Chair and Board of Supervisors. Can you hear me? We sure can. Wonderful. And so, actually, I'm going to go ahead and uh, provide you the floor, uh, introducing the item of the proclamation. Oh, and just as I say that, Trey Williams hops on. So uh, let's, let's give Trey uh, a second here. Trey, do you want to go ahead and introduce the audience? Okay, there you go. Sure. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And I apologize for the technical difficulties. We have with us today here, Kay Wyatt. She is here to read a proclamation regarding uh, uh, proclaiming January as uh, Human Trafficking Awareness Month. So Kate, I don't want to, I know we're on short on time, so I'll turn it over to you to read the proclamation. Thank you for being here today. Yes, thank you all again. Whereas Arizona's geographic location and network of freeways makes it a hub for illicit activity, and according to the U.S. State Department, Arizona is a main destination and transit point for labor and sex trafficking from within the U.S. and multiple regions of the world. And whereas the biggest misconception is that trafficking is something that happens overseas, local and federal law enforcement has indicated that sex trafficking is happening in Arizona at an alarming rate. The income potential and the use of technology are reasons why the crime is prevalent. Currently, sex trafficking is estimated to be a $12 billion per year industry. And whereas the profit from sex trafficking is a billion dollar business, second only to illegal arms trafficking and the illicit drug trade, sex trafficking is a high profit, low risk business where the commodity can be sold repeatedly. There appears to be a growing demand fueled by easy access through the internet and a ready supply of underage girls that are constantly being recruited and exploited. Whereas in the past five years, various agencies in the Flagstaff community have come into contact with over 500 victims. Through various sting operations, there have been over 500 individuals attempting to purchase sex with a minor and 12 arrests. And whereas the Flagstaff Initiative Against Trafficking is a community collective of professional service providers and volunteers who want to end human trafficking. The goals of FIA are to construct a unified response for trafficking victims and survivors to get out of the life safely, educate and bring awareness to our community on human trafficking in order to drive down demand, and to collect data to, to determine the true impact of human trafficking in Flagstaff. Once again, I'm on mute, so I apologize. Uh, uh, we're, we're managing through technical, and then you have uh, uh, me with making uh, my human errors here uh, associated with technology. Uh, but, uh, you know, and as noted, throughout the county, uh, beyond Flagstaff uh, and, and throughout, you know, the U.S., uh, you know, this is uh, our, a horrendous practice, uh, most important. Uh, I know we work together, uh, our various law enforcement agencies, uh, uh, trying to intervene, stop, uh, but more importantly, uh, a note of uh, uh, where your agency steps in and other agencies is the support of those that are victims. Uh, that We encourage people to uh, uh, reach out uh, and provide a safe haven uh, for those uh, uh, involved in this horrendous activity. Uh, I'll, I'll turn to other board members if you'd like to make comments. Uh, uh, looks like I'll go ahead and just start with uh, Go Numerical, uh, Supervisor Horston. Yes, and, and thank you for bringing this uh, uh, forward for us, uh, Kate. Again, I, I think it is important that we take a stand um, in um, not only denouncing this type of exploitation, which primarily and disproportionately affects women, but really bring this forward for awareness uh, so that we can help be part of the solution to stop this type of exploitation. So thank you again for bringing this uh, to our attention. Thank you. Right. Supervisor Vasquez. Yeah, I just, again, want to reiterate, thank you for, for bringing this to our attention, for the hard work that you do working to, to save uh, mostly women and children from this kind of this kind of activity. Um, you know, on a personal note, uh, I, I had a relative in Guatemala get kidnapped and, and put in that kind of situation. And so uh, on a personal level, I've experienced what it feels like to lose a family member to that kind of trafficking and don't want to ever see anybody experience that here locally. And so uh, thank you for what you do. And, and please continue the hard work because, you know, it doesn't get easier, you know, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Supervisor Begay. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you for making the uh, giving this presentation regarding um, human trafficking awareness and prevention month for the month of January. Um, I personally think that you know um, we really need to make people aware that these illegal activities are actually out there within our communities. It may not seem so, but you know underage um, ch uh, girls are being recruited and exploited, and it's, this is something that we should not stand for. So I'm really glad that um, this proclamation is being um, presented to us for approval and I fully support that. Thank you. All right, and Vice Chair uh, Sal. Yeah. Um, yes, well, thank you. Uh, you know, a number of years ago, we talked about have, um, doing, doing education, providing education to hotel, um, the front desk, uh, they, um, the bus, different kinds of the, you know, transportation providers out there, even Uber and um, other forms of transportation. Um, how, was that ever implemented? Is there, what kind of education are you providing to the public right now? Um, if there's any way that we can help, we're, um, you know, that, that we're, we're here to help you. Yes, thank you. And thank you for that question. Um, so as far as hotels, um, we were working with a few here in town prior to COVID on getting education and awareness going um, and training for the hotel staff. Um, and that's something that we hope to start again this year. Um, one of our partners down in the Valley Trust, which is Training and Resources, United to Stop Trafficking, um, they have a wonderful hotel uh, program. And so we will be partnering with them um, and learning how we can expand um, that training to our Flagstaff area. And then um, in 2019 through 2021, um, we had a very close partnership with NAFTA, um, our local transportation system. Um, they received a grant that was specific to raising awareness about human trafficking. And so many of you might have seen the posters on the buses. Um, they were both on the outside and the inside. Um, that also did include a training component. Um, so all of the NASA staff participates in a two-part training series. Um, the first one is kind of a 101. And then the second um, part has more specific questions and information related to transportation. Um, and then we will also be releasing a video that we made with their assistance um, at the end of this week. And I'm happy to share that with you all as well um, so that we can share that as far as, as wide as possible. That would be great. Yeah, you know, we, we, we have been, I know you've been working with the Sheriff's Department and our county management for several years now. So we just really thank you for that partnership and any way that we can help out, you know, getting the, the word out and um, that we're here for that. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Vice Chair. Kate, any wrap up comments? I just wanna thank you all for your continued support. Um, the county has always been a wonderful support for us and um, we just always appreciate everything that you do and, um, the sheriff's department, like you said, has been a great partner as well. So um, just a huge thank you to you all as well and for inviting us every year um, in January for this proclamation. And back, thank you for what you do. Very hard uh, topic, uh, a very difficult situations. Uh, thank you. Uh, next item of business uh, in the agenda is actually, uh, we have our uh, consent Mr. agenda. Chair. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, Trey has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Trey, go ahead. Yes, just uh, one point of information. I just wanted to make sure I don't know that the um, now therefore clause was read. So I just wanted to be sure when I was looking uh, over it. Let me, let me move the proclamation too. I was so. Gonna say, so I don't know that. <laughs> uh, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair, um, she didn't read the, uh, the now therefore clause. So I can read that just so the board knows. And then of course, if you want to entertain a motion, but I just wanted the board to have that as a point of information. Okay, please. Try, try. So um, with everything that Kate read, 
Um, this, uh, the now therefore, we do hereby proclaim January 2022 as Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month to bring awareness to this issue. All right, thank you for passing that, Trey. And I'll turn to the board. Uh, looks like Supervisor Horstman has her hand up. I so yeah. move uh, this proclamation. I have a motion by Supervisor Horstman. I need a second. Second. Second by Supervisor Vasquez. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 All right. All right, I'm a little rusty on my business. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, starting out, uh, introducing everybody, now that. Um, so next item of business uh, that we have is actually uh, uh, our uh, consent agenda. And the consent agenda is routine in nature. Uh, we have, in this case, items 7 through 21. Uh, listed under our consent agenda that we take a single motion rather than a motion for each item. Uh, we may have had work sessions uh, or, you know, it's a, a return to a contract in next year uh, as an example of that uh, type item that we have here. Unless uh, board members care to separate an item. Is there any item anybody would like to separate from the consent agenda? Yes, I like to separate item num number 19. Okay, Super or, uh, Vice Chair Fowler would like, uh, what number 17 did you say? 19. 19, 19. Okay, item 19, any others that we want separated? Okay, I need a motion uh, on the consent agenda. I see Supervisor Horseman raising her hand. Oh, uh, Supervisor Vasquez is raising his hand also. Um, go ahead, Supervisor Vasquez. I saw that and I saw, so one hand moving and one hand, you know, oh, that's not you. Okay, that's my my little uh, problem on the computer. <laughs> okay, Supervisor Horst, go ahead. Well, on that, uh, I hereby move that we accept the consent agenda as presented, removing item 19 for further discussion. Okay, I have uh, a motion by Supervisor Horstman. I need a second. 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 Oh, it looks like uh, District 2 beat not District 5 by a second there. So uh, uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? Not opposed. Motion carries. Uh, so we just uh, approved items uh, 7 through 21, and we've separated item number 19 for further discussion. I'll turn to uh, Vice Chair Fowler for item number 19. Um, I just want to make a comment about this. I know that our sheriff, the our sheriff and the deputies are doing um, as much as they can in our public lands and really appreciate their work and this partnership. Uh, uh, and um, we, as a board, continue to advocate on behalf of the, our law enforcement and our public lands agencies to have the federal agencies hire more um, law enforcement, uh, be allowed to um, hire their law enforcement so that, it, that our um, sheriff and deputies are not overburdened um, by these, um, on th the work that they do on public lands. I'm happy there is an agreement and there is some compensation um, I guess back uh, the, through this partnership, but I, I believe that we are all working to, um, our work is important to continue to advocate for more law enforcement on these federal lands. So I just want to just, um, just bring that up again and that um, our deputies, our sheriffs, they do a great job out there with all the partners, not just the federal agencies, but the state and other um, cities and towns um, and the law enforcement continue to be overwhelmed by the work that they, they do um, as first responders and very, very much, um, they just really need the su public support and be patient with them and to be able to get the work done that they need to do. 
um, and there are limited law enforcement everywhere. Um, and so we just need to continue to support them. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just to highlight that, I'll, I'll agree with the Vice Chair. Uh, you know, we're, we're being overwhelmed on our public lands around here and county stepping in to provide the uh, uh, law enforcement services and additional services that uh, test our own capacity when uh, uh, we, we definitely, uh, it's important to be there uh, but it's hard to be all things. Even so, uh, what we have before us here is uh, a, a reoccurring um, a, a intergovernmental agreement that we have with the Apache, Sick, Greaves, Coconino, and Kaibab National Forest uh, uh, related to uh, uh, funding uh, to provide law enforcement and control uh, associated with these, which is really important that we do have money here that we can do it. But I also know part of our federal advocacy is uh, uh, to uh, push our uh, our representatives uh, into helping us. Uh, uh, the, our federal agencies need their own law enforcement, uh, the LEOs, local enforcement officers out there uh, uh, helping us. We can't, we can't continue to fulfill the void that's created uh, in the capacity needed for the volume that we're seeing on our public land. So I, I definitely would agree with uh, uh, the notes of Vice, Challer, uh, Vice Chair Feller is uh, making. I just combined Chair and Feller and got Chowler out of that way. There. <laughs> you can see I'm struggling today here. <laughs> uh, anybody else, any uh, further comments on this item? Uh, Lena, do, would you care to move this one? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I move that we approve this agreement with our federal um, forest service agencies, uh, which is item number 19 on our board agenda. Thank you. I like uh, the motion with the, with the amount, annual funding amount of 65,000 um, as um, an addition through 12-31-26. All right, I have a motion by Supervisor Fowler, uh, a second. Uh, uh, by uh, Supervisor Begay noting the amount that we have before us in uh, the consent agenda uh, uh, that we've removed for the separate consideration. Uh, any further comments or questions? If not, we'll go ahead and call for the vote. All in favor of the motion, go ahead and vote aye. 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 And any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. Uh, okay, next we need to resolve is the Board of Directors of the Flood Control District. Uh, and so I need a motion to do so now. A motion that we resolve to the Board of Directors of the Flood Control District. A motion by Supervisor Vasquez, okay. second by, was that Vice Chair Fowler that I heard in there? Yes. Yep. Uh, uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 We're now acting in the capacity of the Flood Control District Board of Directors. We have one item under the consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to separate that? And I'm not seeing a desire there. Uh, with that, I'll consider a motion uh, associated with this item. So it uh, looks like a, a supervisor or a director in this case, Forsman, uh, has her hand raised. Go ahead, uh, uh, Yes, uh, the, uh, I would at this time move uh, that we accept consent agenda item number 22 from the Flood Control District consent agenda. Okay, I have a motion, I need a second. Second. Second by uh, Vice, uh, not Vice Chair, but second by Super Director Vasquez. Uh, <laughs> we'll get through this, guys. Uh, and actually, a uh, really, uh, really good item of, uh, uh, as we've been updated regularly uh, on investment that's going up into the museum, fire, flood area, and federal money coming in. Um, uh, any discussion? Not seeing discussion. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Not opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Next, we need to resolve is the Board of Supervisors. I need a motion to do so. I'll move. A motion by uh, Director Begay. I need a second. Second. Second by Vice Chair Fowler. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 We're now acting in the capacity of the Board of Supervisors, and we're on item number 23. It's consideration and possible action to approve a lease between Coconino County and the Flagstaff Arts Council for the Center of Arts. And so uh, we have uh, 
Tom Hanacek, uh, our staff member to present on this. Steve, did you want to uh, start off or just turn it over to Tom at this point? Um, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board, uh, Tom Hanachek is here. Also, we have uh, Jonathan Stone, who's the director of Creative Flagstaff. Uh, we're discussing the, the Center for the Arts uh, lease. Um, you know, just a bit of background, the Center for the Arts was constructed many years ago with the federal grant uh, back then. Um, it's held, uh, you know, it's, it's been a very important cornerstone to the arts community here in Flagstaff. Uh, the Coconino County Board of Supervisors several years ago uh, did partner with the nonprofit community in reopening it because it, it, it did uh, sit dormant for several years uh, as a result of, 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 you know, working with the nonprofit community. And so as a result of that and many other good things and obviously very much uh, uh, a lot of you know, input and enthusiasm from the arts community, we now have the, the facility that is managed by Creative Flagstaff. And so I'm going to turn the presentation part over to Mr. Hanacek and then he can go from there and then, of course, have the opportunity for, for Jonathan to make some comments. So with your permission, right. sir, we'll go with Tom. All right, Tom, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, I won't speak for very long. I just want to uh, uh, say thank you for taking about 10 or 10 minutes or so to allow us to introduce uh, the new executive director of Creative Flagstaff, although he's been with them for about three years, about a week ago. So Jonathan Stone, uh, we want to give him an opportunity to kind of debrief the Board of Supervisor members here on some of the programs and services that uh, they have done over the last couple of years and that they plan to do in upcoming years. So as Steve mentioned, a little bit of the history, we have been, uh, the county has been in a partnership with uh, Flagstaff Cultural Partners was the original name, then it's Flagstaff Arts Council, and now Creative Flagstaff doing business as Flagstaff Arts Council for over 20 years. So it's a longstanding relationship. Um, since Jonathan's arrival here, uh, he has done a lot, not only for the arts and culture uh, regionally, but he's also done a lot of improvements to the actual facility. Uh, which for those of you that have been there is definitely uh, very welcomed and we're thankful for that. And he's secured a lot of funding through partnerships and donors, including uh, upgrades to the theater and lighting, uh, audio visual. Um, he's also done a lot of stuff to the administrative offices there and uh, did some improvements to the gallery, including removal of that old carpet, uh, staining the concrete and really bringing it up to a modern uh, a modern facility, um, at least on the inside at this point. So uh, for the sake of brevity, I, I won't continue for very much longer. I'd like to turn it over to Jonathan, Jonathan Stone. All right, Jonathan, floor is yours. Great, wow. thank you. Um, I'm told I have like five to seven minutes. Uh, I have a few slides I wanna share, uh, just to kind of share uh, you know, some important information about how we're thinking about the facility going forward and kind of what it means in, in the context of our overall strategic plan. So if I'm able to do that, I will. Um, the first thing that was mentioned, that we have a new name. Uh, we're no longer Flagstaff Arts Council. Uh, we're known as Creative Flagstaff, but I also want to make sure that you understand that we take very seriously the brand and identity of Coconino Center for the Arts. In fact, uh, this week we're starting on a um, a, a project to kind of reimagine uh, the identity, the visual identity of the center um, with uh, local designer, uh, Julie uh, Sullivan. Um, this is draft statements, but one of the things that we've been doing is working, we've established an advisory board for the center and uh, we've created a mission and vision for the center that which it's never really had independently of the, the arts council that really talks about its role in, in the greater North uh, Northern Arizona region, and especially, you know, we, we think of that in terms of Coconino County. So this is formative work. It's still in process. Uh, but I just wanted you to see how we're thinking about moving forward uh, with the center. And I wanted to highlight one of our draft strategic plan goals that the advisory board has, and that is a community-centered accessible gathering place. And it talks about things like meaningful resource for Coconino County, involving more stakeholders, inclusive cultural experiences, a variety of programming and career development and the like, um, all you know, kind of rooted in, in activities that could potentially happen at the center. Um, so we've started as a partnership. Coconino County has been a founding uh, member, uh, so to speak, of uh, Flagstaff Cultural Partners uh, since the beginning, along with these other government agencies and private um, nonprofits. Um, 
just to remind you, our economic impact, um, we, we've done a study every so many years uh, with uh, the, the arts in economic prosperity study that's about to begin again. That is focused on Flagstaff, but I do think it paints a really bit important picture about the um, economic impact of the nonprofit cultural sector uh, uh, in Coconino County. And so for Flagstaff, that's about 90 million in economic impact. And then I also want to really point to the fact that through COVID, uh, uh, government uh, stimulus and, and resources have been absolutely critical to supporting the cultural sector um, in uh, our community. Without that support, um, I believe many of our nonprofits would not have um, uh, survived uh, the pandemic. Uh, we, in June, announced a new strategic plan. And one of the important parts of that strategic plan is a plan to make a plan. And I, and, and I know that sounds kind of silly, but we want to formalize and finalize a CCA strategic plan in our first phase, uh, which began in June. And, and so that is part of the process that the advisory board will take up. Um, we've reframed kind of our role from arts to creative. And when we think about that, we think about arts and ideas. And so that is how does arts intersect with so many other things that are important to our community. And so we think of art, science, social justice, that translates into things like experience, collaboration, gathering, celebration. Um, so we're really trying to reframe how we think about the role of creativity, creative practice and arts uh, in our community. Um, we've taken a lot of steps, as Tom mentioned, I won't repeat some of the things that he mentioned, but you can get a visual here if you haven't been to the center since we've done this, we've done a lot of removal of old things. And, um, and making it to feel like a more modern space. Uh, we've installed AV systems. We've established the exhibitions and programs director position. Um, and I would say that, you know, while we've been relatively quiet uh, for, for events here at the center during the pandemic, um, that for example, we've uh, the 10 by 10 exhibition, which was held later uh, last this past spring, um, we had uh, some of the greatest uh, um, uh, participation from the reservation uh, than we've ever had uh, in that exhibition. All, and a lot of that thanks to some of our board members who did a lot of that outreach. Our next steps, um, we wanna complete the resource center, uh, which you, I, if I have time, I will explain to you what it is, uh, but that's a construction of about $60,000 in value. That project actually will potentially be happening this week. If not next week, that'll begin. Um, and then um, we will, in, we intend to reopen fully and the first exhibition is Youth Art, uh, which includes uh, schools and student artists from both Navajo and Coconino counties. And so we're continuing to do that outreach to get as great, as great of participation as we can. Uh, we're intending to repair and replace the lighting grid um, and eventually upgrade some of the lighting in the theater and formalize our call for entries process for 2023 and beyond. We've been a little bit of an ad hoc phase due to the uncertainty, but we feel confident that we can return to a more formal uh, process uh, for programming uh, the exhibition space. And then uh, with the approval of this lease begins the opportunity for a government liquor license, which is an important part of our sustainable operations plan uh, for the center. Um, a minute or two, just to explain. These are renderings, concept renderings. It turns out all that glass you see there in that rendering is very expensive. Uh, so we won't necessarily be doing um, that kind of glazing, but we do intend to repurpose a couple of the rooms that are that you don't see from the lobby and turning them into uh, what we're calling a digital resource and education center. And so that means, you know, what was the green room becomes an office. What was, believe it or not, this tiny room back here used to be my office. Um, that will become uh, a media lab for podcasting and recording. And then what was the kitchen will become uh, the, the new green room kind of breakout meeting space. Um, and that program includes workshops and education, a digital maker space, and then um, most interestingly, a lending library. So over time, we hope to build up a library of digital equipment that we can make available to community members. And I need to emphasize that this will be available to Coconino County residents once it's fully um, up and running. We are offering a digital change maker micro grant presently. Um, so that's open and available on our website. That's funded through the city's BBB tax revenues, um, but this is to support participation in early pilot phases of the Digital Resource and Education Center. So quick, I was told five to seven minutes, I'm at 6.50, so hopefully that's okay. Uh, and uh, I'll take questions if there are any. 
Kind of uh-huh. perfect timing. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom, any follow-up? Uh, I do not know. We could just open it up for, uh, for questions. Okay. Questions or discussion? I think Supervisor Horstman. Uh, go yeah, ahead. And I, I do have a comment. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, I can wait and then make my comment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions or comments associated with this? Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and comment real uh, quick. Oh, oh, go ahead, Supervisor Go ahead. Looks like you're bubbling up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan and Tom. Uh, you know, uh, we have come a long ways with the Flagstaff Arts uh, Center. Uh, well, now the, the Creative Flagstaff. I, I'm really impressed with all the all of the um, improvements that have been made. So, I just want to thank you, um, you and the board. Uh, the you know, at one time we were wondering what we're going to do with the building and how should we improve? And I mean, that we've gone through all kinds of discussions and just where you have um, really made these improvements and really um, have stepped up to be able to do the kinds of uh, work that you're doing. It's just really impressive and I'm really happy to see new life, um, new energy there and to really expand just the work that, that the, at one time the Arts um, Council used, was looking at to where it's at today. I'm very impressed with that and just want to just thank you for it. Um, you know, we, we've been, we're wondering, do we sell it or do we keep it? And I mean, we went all over the place with it, with the, with the, building and just, but we always really appreciated this partnership and we continue to, and it looks like it's getting stronger. So thank you, Tom, and thank you, Jonathan and your board for this vision and this work that you're doing on behalf of the, on, on behalf of the community. You know, I think it's, it's really good. So I just want to make that comment. Thank you. And I like the, just how you're, redesigning the whole place. I mean, we were just, um, even, uh, you know, we have events there and it's all, always been small, but always really nice. So thank you so much. Thank you. Really May good. I make a comment to that real quick? Yeah, please. Um, and I absolutely really appreciate the continued partnership, but I know that the facility's kind of been in question, you know, in terms of what it might happen to it. And um, and then there was that 2018 study on, on future facilities. and. And what we're in, if you ever have a chance to read our strategic plan, um, a, a local prominent community member calls it uh, a two part, two epistles. So it's quite long, according to him. Um, and, uh, but uh, it provides a lot of context. But one of the important parts of that is understanding that um, the future of facilities, and I say facilities plural, right, in our community still needs to be better understood. And um, the Coconino Center for the Arts is a really important asset. Um, as we continue to think about how we continue to evolve as a community and continue to meet the needs of, of, of our cultural sector. So we're really appreciative, appreciative of the opportunity to continue to use the facility um, as we continue to better understand the needs of the community. All right. Well, thank, you. thank you. And, you know, the arts community is, um, is stronger with a real organized uh, strategic plan that really um, embraces all of the various art, art and culture. Um, and I really appreciate that about, about this organization. So thank you. And I know Tom is always there and just trying to, and our county manager and just really embracing all of this. So thank you so much. It has a, it has a long history and I think it's a good history and it's only improving. So. That's really good. I'm really happy to see that from where we came from. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and hop in. And uh, my, you know, my comments are: it took me two years to save up money to get you guys those carpets, and you tore them out. <laughs> but it's it's had a number of spills since then. So, <laughs> yeah, that was uh, community initiative money once upon a time. But no, actually, I think you've done wonders with the facility. Not just that, uh, since you've stepped in, uh, um, you know, I think 
where the community was going through a state of flux, uh, uh, you know, trying to achieve a lot. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, you know, I think I've seen uh, uh, you, you brought in a, a level of uh, settling uh, into the conversation, a, a broader vision, a comprehensive vision. Uh, and, uh, and it shows, uh, really appreciate that. I, I do know, you know, on the, uh, uh, you know, we shifted from the three year to the five year, uh, no matter what, we have the potential for a separation clause. Uh, right now we're not in a capital facilities. Uh, we backed off of that right now, uh, uh, but that is an element that's a future discussion that could always pop up. And you were aware of that when you came in and, uh, and, and understand that, but, uh, uh, it's just a, a piece of note associated with that. Uh, thank you for all the work that you've done uh, with us. Uh, other other board members. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to jump in. Um, so uh, first off, I want to congratulate you on the renovations. It looks great in the design of what you're planning on doing. That's really awesome. And, and Tom, thank you for helping with that as well as being on the county side of helping direct all that. The piece of the presentation that really stuck out to me was the e economic impact of uh, cultural arts to, the, to our community. And so I just wanted to put in a plug for that, to, that we need to continue to support the arts and, and different cultural events and, and cultural opportunities because it is such a big economic driver for our community. And so uh, I just want to encourage you to continue to be creative and create uh, and continue to, to provide those kind of services because it's sorely needed in our community. Thank you. All right, and, and I, I apologize. I, I really do have to time certain step off. I'll turn this over to Vice Chair Fowler. I know Supervisor Horseman wants to make comments and we haven't uh, gone to Supervisor Begay either. But if, uh, Lena, if you could pick this up, uh, I really appreciate that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, Supervisor Horseman, are you done, uh, Supervisor Vasquez? Okay, Supervisor Horseman, you're on mute. You're on I, mute. I, I, I got uh, uh, Matt, Matt Ryanitis, I guess. Um, um, also, uh, Judy, if you want to make a comment, because I'm going to turn this into a motion here at the end. So uh, if you'd like to make a comment, I'll just hold off here. Okay, Supervisor Piquet. Yes, I'd like to make a small comment. I just want to thank Tom and Jonathan for doing this presentation. I have yet to see the location, so I would like to uh, take a little tour of it, see where it's at. And so mm -hmm. I, I will await that uh, invitation. And also, you know, this is something that's good for the community. Mm -hmm. I think anything that is good for the community, you know, for our, our people out there, I, I fully uh, wholeheartedly support it. So I just want to say thank you for all your hard work and, you know, all the efforts that you put into it, you know, to. Mm -hmm to sustain this program. So I just want to say thank you. Supervisor Brigade, we'll get we'll get something on the schedule here in the coming weeks to take a tour yeah. in there. Are, are there any other board members that would like to take a look at it? Do yeah, it. if you have not toured, uh, please go do, and I will probably be on that list because I want to see how it's really a great design that you're putting together. So um, any other comments, uh, Supervisor Brigade? Can do okay. Um, Supervisor Horseman, yes, thank you. And uh, Jonathan, great to see you, and thank you for coming forward here on giving a little overview on the new branding Creative Flagstaff. And uh, it, uh, uh, I really appreciate the public involvement that you got and the public input, uh, in really developing your strategic plan. I, I think it's excellent, and I think you've done a wonderful job of getting so many parts of, of our community together on this. Uh, and, you know, I've had a, a long history with the Coconut Center for the Arts, a former board member and former president back in the olden days, but even went beyond uh, and before that, which I'll talk about here at the end. And, and uh, one of the things Jonathan made very clear to me early on is the Creative Flagstaff goes way beyond that building, and it, and it sure does. Um, the uh, building obviously is, has been an important focal point, um, uh, but certainly uh, the merger of art, science, and culture 
and really looking throughout our community as as art spaces, as as cultural and uh, science uh, community spaces. Uh, you have done just a great job, and I'm just so pleased to see uh, how you've been able to uh, bring this community together. Uh, and really, with the merger of, of art, science, and culture, has been ph phenomenal. And I want to thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I also want to acknowledge, since this is a lease, uh, that that building uh, has been there since uh, the uh, 80s, early 80s, and it has truly been a focal point in the community. Uh, it was the place at, in the olden days, and thank God it's now expanded uh, as an art gallery, uh, as concerts for plays, for events, uh, for programs, uh, for many, many decades now. Uh, and I'm very proud of Coquino County's partnership uh, with um, uh, Creative Flagstaff and obviously with Coquino Center for the Art. And I'm really hoping that we can look at ways to expand that partnership uh, for the reasons that you've indicated, uh, uh, Supervisor Vasquez. It is an economic engine. Not only is it important for our community and important uh, for others and visitors coming to our community, uh, but it certainly is an economic engine, and I think we can make it even a better economic engine and be more of a partner. And so I, I look forward to opportunities as we move forward. And I think it's also important that we acknowledge Sue Brown. Uh, Sue has sat on that uh, board uh, and is an active and committed member uh, of that board. And I want to thank Sue personally for her service. Um, and I look forward uh, under Jonathan's leadership and with individuals in our community like Sue Brown, uh, really seeing an expansion of Creative Flight staff. Uh, and certainly, we do live in an unbelievably creative community and one that we value both, you know, art, science, and culture. So uh, it's just wonderful to see you here, Jonathan. And it's wonderful um, to uh, be able to extend this lease. I want to say one fun fact before we move forward on the lease. And, you know, it's always good to acknowledge uh, our predecessors here on the Board of Supervisors. And I want to acknowledge Karen English. Uh, Karen English was on the board uh, back even before Matt Ryan was on the board, if we can even think that far back. And uh, Karen is the one who, uh, with others here in the community, uh, including myself, got the federal grant with Coconino County as uh, for Coconino County uh, to uh, develop and build Coconino Center for the Arts a long time ago. And it certainly ha had its ups and its downs, and it's now in the big up position, and I'm so pleased um, about that. Uh, and with that, it is my great pleasure um, to move for the approval of the lease between Coconino County and the Flagstaff Arts Council for the Coconino Center for the Art through June 2026, uh, and as our contribution, the county's contribution to Flagstaff Arts Council with a total value of 180,000 per year. Second. We have a motion and a second, and I wanna um, recognize uh, Sue uh, did you want to add anything? I know that, you know, Sue has been our facility manager and through this whole process of working with the, with, uh, with the board and doing visioning boards and everything else with, uh, with all of our facilities. And then uh, now Tom and so, and uh, at one point the board members used to sit on the, um, uh, the council I, I served as a board member before, and then um, we decided that uh, Sue would be, as a facility manager, be serving on the, um, be part of the board. So Sue, would you like to make some comments? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to say briefly, thank you to Tom, who was ably picked up all of the requirements um, for these types of situations and done a terrific job. But I really want to say a huge thanks to Jonathan and to the board of directors. Um, they have done an extraordinary job um, in an extraordinarily difficult time for making arts and culture available to people when they needed it the most. 
And Jonathan himself in his three-year tenure has absolutely done an extraordinary job in revolutionizing uh, this group and really bringing a breath of fresh air, if you will, into the arts and culture scene in this community and across the region. So I commend him highly and I commend the board for its decision to bring Jonathan on and also for all of the amazing areas that they're going into. It's um, it's wonderful to see arts and culture stay vibrant during something like this pandemic. And with Jonathan's leadership and the board's total commitment and this board's commitment to uh, the Coconino Center for the Arts and Creative Flagstaff, uh, it's happening. So that's it. Thank you very much. And we have to point out it is in District 1. <laughs> it is. But arts and culture across the county. Are across the county. So. Yeah, the board members all through um, this whole, ever since the partnership began, board, the board has fully supported the, um, the Art Center, and we know that we have, live in a very creative county, so I just really appreciate everyone. So with that, um, we have a motion and a second, and all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Tom and Jonathan and Sue um, and County Manager Steve. And we will move on to our next item. Uh, our next item is a public hearing and we have um, Lindsay. Thank you, Vice Chair Fowler and Supervisors. We received a liquor license application from the state for VC Bar and Grill. And this is located on Highway 89A in Marble Canyon, Arizona. It's for a Series 7 beer and wine bar license and um, acquisition of control to add Kathy Marie, Marie Wolf as an owner. So we when we received the application, we sent it over to our Sheriff's Department, Risk Manager, Community Development, and Health Department for review. They do not have any concerns regarding the application. Um, the board is... Uh, the, the, the posting of the hearing has been posted at the location for 20 days and we have not received any concerns or comments from the public at this time. Um, the board is required to consider and make a rec recommendation on the application to the state. The recommendation may be to approve, disapprove, or offer a no recommendation, um, but the board does not issue the license. They provide the recommendation based on the knowledge of the area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have the um, someone present to from the? It's going to be speaking on behalf of this um, item. Um, Teresa Morris or Kathy Wolf may be here. There was a phone number um, that disappeared, but Kathy or Teresa, if you're here, if you could raise your hand, then I can see you, and move you to panelist position. And I don't see them at this time, okay. Vice Chair Miller. Okay, this is an item that is in District Five, um, so I, I have, I have not heard any negative comments or any um, reaction from there from the community. So this is a um, long-standing um, place, uh, and so it's. Uh, um, So if somebody else could make the motion. Just now, now, uh, we need to, um, so what is the process here, Lindsay? Let me back up, sorry. Sure, we just need to open it for the public hearing portion. Yes. So if there's anyone from the, the public that would like to comment. So I'd like, I, I like to open it up to the public to see if there's any comment about this particular um, liquor license application that is before us here. And if you would like to comment, there's a raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen that looks like a hand. So if you just click on that, then it'll notify me that you would like to speak. If you're on the phone and you'd like to speak, you can press star nine and that will raise your hand to notify us that you would like to speak. And at this time, there's no hands raised. Okay, and I will bring this item back to the board. Are there any questions from the board? 
Okay, there are no questions or comments from the board. And thank you, Lindsay. And we, um, I will open it up to the board. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Horseman. Madam Chair, if the public hearing portion is done and uh, having no public comment and hearing no board comment at this time and on behalf of, of District 5, um, uh, I would like to uh, recommend the approval uh, to the Arizona Department of Liquor License and Control regarding application number 174726 for a series 007 beer and wine bar acquisition of control of liquor license for Z BC bar and grill licensee is Teresa June Morse located at highway 89 a five miles north of Marble Canyon, Arizona. Second the motion. I have a motion and a second. Thank you. Um, and all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. And uh, we will now move on to our next item, which is to discuss, and that's a possible action. It's a presentation on our monthly budget update for January. Uh, Steve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if I could ask um, for staff to be brought over to panelists. Uh, series on here. So there you are. So Madam Chair, members of the board, the uh, presentation today is, is a, a budget update, um, but more importantly, it is also the kickoff discussion for our annual budget process. And, and while because of, of the opportunity to work with American Rescue Plan, it seems like last year's budget process didn't end, uh, but we are looking at the budget process that will kick off now and culminate into the adoption of the county budget for fiscal year 22-23, which will begin on July 1st of this year. Uh, as I indicated, uh, there are several steps in the process. Today's presentation is gonna be focusing in a lot on our revenues, uh, you know, just given the, the, the realities of what's been happening in the last couple of years, uh, the issue of revenues at one time, and this was before I arrived, was of dire importance to the county. Uh, you know, at the time that we were entering into COVID, uh, the impact of COVID on our economy and our financial system, particularly as, as it focused in on the county's uh, sales tax, which is the major revenue source for the county, was unknown. Uh, and so given that time, the county took drastic measures, and I will underscore drastic measures, to, to prepare the organization for what could have been, uh, again, I think, an event that probably would have exceeded the, the great recession we had uh, when I was here back in 2007, eight, and nine. And so with that, uh, the, the, the county took very drastic steps and now we find ourselves in a very different situation. Uh, and, and so when we go through the slides today, you will see uh, uh, very much where, where we, we are now. Uh, while things look optimistic, I think the big question for all of us is, is it sustainable? Uh, and so when we look at, at financial trends that we, you know, we look at years to see what those trends look like, uh, whereas the, the uh, improvements that we've seen in the last few months are just that, months. So again, the conclusion is gonna be to, to, for us to be aware, aware uh, of where we, are, where we are at financially. And this, as I said, is the groundwork or that first step in a budget process that will build on each step. So today we're laying, a lot of foundational pieces related to, to uh, forecasting. And then we will come back to you and, and go forward with the, with the building blocks that, as I said, lead to the, to the development of this year's budget. So I'm gonna, at this point, Madam Vice Chair, with your permission, I'll hand it over to Siri Malini, who will be projecting a series of slides and walking us through it. Thank you, uh, Steve. Siri? Thank you, Ms. Fowler, members of the board, and Fong is actually going to be doing our screen share for us. So um, as that is coming up. Great.
And if we can put it in the slideshow mode. Great. So this is our first uh, financial update for fiscal year 2020. Can we go to, oh. can we go to presentation mode? Um, because oh. we're seeing both slides here. Yes. Thank you, Fong. If you can uh, swap. There you go. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you. Um, so this is our first update for fiscal year 2022. We are about six months through the year. So the data you'll see on the expenditure side represents um, about six months of data. But on the revenue side, we have received um, from many of our major revenue sources about five months worth of data. So sales that have taken place through November of 2021. Um, so there's a little bit of a lag there. And um, so the timing is it's good to do. Our, we have a little more information than we might have had, um, you know, in July and August when we didn't really have any revenue numbers yet. So if we can go to the next slide, some highlights on the revenue side, and we'll definitely dig a little bit deeper into this, but we are seeing positive sales tax year to date. Um, and that is in alignment with our forecast. So you may hear indicators, especially from the state as they put out their uh, monthly reports from JLBC, that they are exceeding forecasts. For Coconino County, we did build in continued growth in sales tax. Um, and so we are a little bit more in alignment, I would say, with our budget forecasts. We're trending um, where we thought we would be or the majority of our revenue categories at this point, which that is also good news. And um, the state has a different mix of revenue buckets as well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, for example, they receive income tax, which is not something the county receives as part of our revenue mix. So there are differences. Um, but we will talk specifically about what we're seeing in Coconino County and our major revenue sources today. Um, still some caution though with that positive sales tax. So uh, retail and construction, when we look at those categories, those, that's really driving a lot of the growth that we're seeing and a lot of the positive returns we're seeing. Whereas those that we're calling tourism, but they're really, um, they're not solely true tourism driven, but they are more reliant. So things like restaurant and bars and transient lodging, those types of things are still falling a little behind where we were before the pandemic. And we'll go into some details on that. Um, and you know, so some of the why of what we're seeing. So we know that inflation is um, really high <laughs> right now. And so of course, as things cost more, then that tax base is higher. Um, so that's one of the things that's impacting our revenues. Still again, stimulus funds in the economy, um, more money going around, driving some of that construction. Um, and then low interest rates, although we do expect the interest rates um, from what we're hearing, there will be, you know, a few increases, at least in the upcoming year to the interest rates that will change that. The highway user revenue, so um, kind of commonly known as the gas tax, if you will, um, that's the primary source of that revenue. Uh, the recovery there has still been a little less robust. And again, we can we can tie a little bit of that to the tourism economy. Vehicle license taxes are down and we'll go, we'll go into more detail on the whys behind that because there's a lot um, that we've seen in vehicle license tax that's been off trend compared to our history. And then Jay will come in and talk a lot about our strong building permit volume and what he's seeing on his side. Then as we go to the next slide, we have a summary of our expenses that we'll also dig into, but really the main takeaways. So we're trending below 50% of budget in kind of our macro categories. So salary and benefits, operating travel. Um, and that's typical for this time of year, even though we are technically halfway through our fiscal year, the seasonality of our spending um, tends to be a little bit heavier on the second half of the fiscal year. So we don't expect any kind of major variances um, kind of at that, again, that high level by fund from where we are right now. One thing you'll notice is that we're trending pretty significantly below our salary and benefit budget um, compared to how many pay periods we've had year to date, but we did have a $1 per hour increase to our full-time staff that went into effect in January. So that will bridge the gap as time goes on um, and bring us closer to budget. So um, what we're seeing now may not be the typical trend for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, and then when we look specifically at um, individual expenditures, there is one that is coming off budget or trending off budget. And that is our restoration to competency. Uh, as you may recall, during the pandemic, we had to switch providers. Uh, we are, the Yavapai system was not taking our patients. And so we had to send our patients down to the Arizona State Hospital, which has a significantly higher daily rate uh, that is being charged to Coconino County for these services. 
We were hoping, we were optimistic that we would be able to return to Yavapai during this fiscal year, uh, but unfortunately many of our patients are still down at the state system. And so um, while we had budgeted a little more in alignment with our historical figures, as you can see fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20, uh, we are still trending um, more in line with what we saw in fiscal year 21. And that again is, is due to the system that we're using for the services. So, Moving into our revenues, as we go to the next, we can actually go uh, two slides ahead. So the first one we'll look at on the next slide is the county sales tax. And again, just to orient you to this chart, because there's a lot going on here. Um, we have that black sort of dashed line that is fiscal year 19. And we're still including fiscal year 19 because it's really the only year that gives us a, a an appropriate perspective, if you will, on seasonality of our sales tax for Coconino County. Um, you know, we, we tend to have natural months that are higher and some that are lower. If we look at February, that tends to be our lower month, for example. So that's a, that's a typical year, what a typical year might look like. And then as we look at that solid red line, we can see again that we were trending pretty close in terms of seasonality to what a typical year might look like until we hit um, the pandemic and the shutdown period. And that is where we see that V-shaped, um, you know, the dip from the lockdown and then, you know, sort of a, a gradual recovery back to normal or baseline, if you will. Um, but typically, you know, one year to the next, we would see something similar to what we're seeing earlier on from 19 to 20, where the next year's line is, is trending slightly above the prior year um, in a typical sort of non-recessionary, nothing else, uh, major happening um, type of year, we see some growth. So then when we look at that, that short blue dashed line, so those are the, the smaller dashes, that's our fiscal year 21. So the story is a little different. We were recovering again to FY19 levels, then we were able to, um, you know, experience revenues that were more um, on a typical trend where we're up slightly above what we saw in fiscal year 20. Um, so around those November, December, January, you can see we sort of trend back with our typical seasonality and then things really take off. Um, so that gap becomes pretty significant um, between 19 and 21 as we go through the fiscal year. So that's where we started to see all that sort of pent up spending people had from, from being home, from saving money, traveling was starting to pick up at, again, other spending was taking off and, and we had um, a pretty big gap there. We, we had some really positive sales tax returns during that time. And then, so then the final set of data you're seeing is our current fiscal year. So we have five months of data. So again, sales through the month of November, the month on the bottom does represent the month the sale actually took place. And again, pretty high numbers there. Um, but as you can see off to the right, we have a budget of 18.95 million, um, a forecast of, of 19.5 million. So we're, um, we're trending close to where we thought we would be, but we are a little bit higher. We do think that October number is a bit of an anomaly um, and we are forecasting out more similar to what we're seeing kind of more November, September compared to history. Um, so that, that's positive, a little bit higher than we originally forecasted in sales tax. And also just to note that this is uh, the county sales tax, which is the general fund, but it also shows the same trend that we would see for our jail district and also our road maintenance sales tax. Those are set aside in different funds, um, but we would see a similar trend, although the road maintenance sales tax is, is not the same um, rate that is charged, but it does have a similar base. So it would look the same for those funding sources. So that was county sales tax. I'll move on to the next slide. So um, one other thing that we wanted to dive into was kind of the specifics of the county sales tax and do a comparison. So what you're seeing, again, FY19 being kind of our last normal year that we can use for comparison, we just are providing, um, you know, to help with more information on how we might be a little bit different from other entities around the state. Uh, we have Coconino County there in the first column, and then we have the state of Arizona just in total. Um, and what I want to point out is if you look at, so the second one down, restaurants and bars, compared to the state of Arizona, we have a much higher base in a typical year of sales tax revenue that's based on restaurant and bars. That's one of the things we're calling kind of a tourism driven revenue source. The next one is amusements and the same thing. So while it's only 1% of the state total sales, it represents 4.1% for Coconino County. Again, if we just snapshot one typical year. Um, and then the and then the second to the last one, transient lodging. And again, so this is a huge gap, right, between what the state um, receives in sales tax revenue for transient lodging versus Coconino County. So all of that is to say that 
typically or normally we are more heavily dependent on um, things that are tied to tourism than the rest of the state. And um, as that recovery has has lagged a little bit compared to spending after the pandemic, um, we we are not trending exactly the same as the rest of the state in terms of our revenue um, and the positivity. We still we just still are um, you know having definitely positive indicators in our sales tax, but it, it just looks a little different for Coconino County. Um, also in, in FY19, we did not have online sales or uh, medical recreational marijuana. So in total, uh, we're very similar to the state there where it added about five and a half percent between those new categories to our base. So why this is important, if we go to the next slide, we can see um, what it looks like. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to orient the chart first before we talk about it. So what you're looking at is each quarter, starting again, fiscal year 19 as our baseline, and we've got retail sales, that's that blue bar to the left, and then the bar right, uh, hugging it to the right is, is those tourism, so the uh, restaurants and bars, uh, transient lodging and amusements all lumped together. Then what you see is kind of a line or a, a differentiator starting in quarter three of fiscal year 20, which is um, started the pandemic period. Um, quarter three is January through March, the pandemic period sort of started in March. So it's kind of a before and after look that you're seeing. And then that solid red bar going to the right with the arrow is kind of where we were uh, in quarter one of fiscal year 20 compared to where we are now quarter one fiscal year 22. So what we typically see is some, some quarterly seasonality in these numbers where in total, um, our retail and our tourism are closely related in quarter one um, when we total them all up. They have very similar amounts of sales tax that we're receiving from those sources, but seasonality for tourism drops off um, in our kind of our winter uh, months, so October through December, quarter two, January through March, um, compared to retail, which remains a little stronger. So there's a gap there in a typical uh, year for quarter two and for quarter three, and then resuming again to very similar levels in quarter four. So that's a typical seasonality for each of those. In fiscal year 20, we can see the same thing. So if you look at quarter one of 19 and quarter one of 20, we're going to see very similar. They were, they were um, you know, pretty much equal almost in amounts um, as we're looking at those bars, but then moving into a more typical seasonality for quarter two and quarter three, then really seeing some drop-offs um, more particularly in tourism in, in relation to what we had seen in quarter three of fiscal year 19 in terms of the relationship between the bars. Quarter four, retail actually remained relatively strong, uh, whereas those that we were seeing the declines in our revenue driven by those, those tourism impacted sources. So over time, as we've gone through, um, you know, kind of not necessarily post pandemic, but post lockdown period, um, we can see how the relationship of those bars has changed um, to where we are today. So looking at fiscal year 21, quarter four, we can see that you know, retail remains unusually strong compared to our history for that bar. Um, we, are, we are above and beyond what would be normal growth if we just applied um, a typical growth percentage to that our retail is stronger than that currently. Um, and as we look at tourism, you can see that because those had typically um, during quarters four and quarters one, historically pre-pandemic been very similar to one another, you can see that there's currently a gap. So in, in trying to you know, figure out where are we compared to where we might have been had there not been a pandemic or where are we in terms of a recovery, um, that's where that red line really is helpful because we can draw a straight line to if we were just even to fiscal year 20 pre-pandemic for tourism, we would be at the end of where that arrow is. Again, we typically see a little bit of growth and so we would expect it to maybe be a little bit higher than that, but that's, that's showing us that those haven't fully recovered, again, compared to retail. So, so definitely some positives, especially as we're looking at retail, but um, it's, it's not a complete picture to just talk about um, the numbers, I guess, a blended number to understand that as tourism, again, comes back, that can also you know, help us with, with greater recovery there. Okay, so then our next slide, we're going to move on to state shared sales tax. And state shared sales tax also goes into the general fund. 
and it is based on um, sales throughout the state is the source, and then it's distributed back a portion of it as a share to counties and, and cities and things um, based on a formula that is point of sale as one piece of it. Um, so our own sales, again, impact our distribution from the state, um, but also there is uh, an assessed valuation component for Coconino County. So our relative share of assessed valuation compared to the other counties. So that's how that formula of distribution is determined. And so again, very similar. We have 19 for reference as our normal year, that black dashed line, the red solid line, fiscal year 20, the blue smaller dashes, FY21, and then where we are right now are those um, orange bubbles. And really the main takeaway here is if we look at the fiscal year 22 budget, we budgeted $30 million of state share sales tax and our current forecast is $30 million. So um, while it's positive, we can see it's positive as we look at the bubbles, um, it's also aligning with the expectations that we had come up with during, um, during budgeting. All right. So next, our, um, on our next slide, we have our highway user revenues and we have very similar um, format in terms of the data that you're seeing. So you can see some trend history. Um, this is one area though that um, has had a little bit less of a robust um, recovery in, co in comparison to some of our sales tax based. There's, it's a blended formula. So there's a portion that is the, the gas tax and that's the part that's really still been lagging. Um, but there's also a portion of vehicle license taxes that go into this distribution. And so when we saw at the end of 21, where we were really strong, we will see that tie to what we saw, in, what we're going to see in our next chart for vehicle license taxes. Um, one thing to point out here is that, that that dot that represents November is definitely an anomaly that's not going to continue. There is a special annual distribution impacting that November number for the Smart and Safe Act, um, which is really the taxation on the recreational and medical marijuana, um, where 25.4% of the revenue collected is distributed back to transportation programs. Um, and that distribution is done annually. So the impact of that is about $150,000 to 175. Somewhere in that range is what we figure uh, the impact is there. And so as we look at December, we would expect again that that number that we're seeing for November to go back down more in alignment with the other kind of orange circles we've seen this fiscal year. So again, to summarize kind of what does this mean, as we look at the 22 budget, we had a budget of 11 point, well, just shy of 11.3 million. And we're um, now forecasting, again, if, if kind of our, our current trend holds closer to 12.2 million and obviously helped with that one-time distribution that we, just, that we just received. All right, so then our last one that we're going to dig into on major revenues before we turn it over to community development is the vehicle license tax collections. And what we're seeing, we, this is one that we definitely saw off trend um, post pandemic. So we saw back in April, again, that red kind of V point, a low point, um, very similar to what we saw in our other revenue sources. But then this, this is an area that really took off. So purchases of vehicles um, were really strong after um, the lockdown period. So as we look at that blue dash on top, July FY21, August FY21, um, there was stimulus programs specifically targeting uh, vehicles, if you recall at the time, that was helpful to um, the revenue that we're receiving for vehicle license taxes. Um, and you can see that we, we didn't tend to um, come back to as typical of a seasonality when comparing to fiscal year 19, the numbers moved a little differently than we had seen in the past and, and definitely higher. Um, if we look at March 2021, fiscal year 21, um, that's another area where we can see something that, that wouldn't follow a typical trend. Um, so what we were expecting this year is that that was not going to continue. They were really strong um, and there were factors going on that made us think this is not sustainable. One, um, a portion of this is from um, a share of, of like rental vehicles, which had not fully recovered. Another is uh, new vehicle sales, which one had already sort of, we, we've seen some pent up demand and, and some of that take place, but two, with the chip shortage, um, that we, you know, we just didn't think that it was going to be sustainable. And as we see with the orange circles, that, that turned out to be true. So we've fallen, um, you know, closer to the FY19 line and even below it at some points. So our original forecast or our original budget was 7.3 million. Um, we are now ex expecting about 7 million. 
And the distribution of these revenues is approximately 63.5% to the general fund, um, and then the remainder to the um, transportation fund and is uh, restricted for transportation purposes. So I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions on, on that information or those slides and then um, ask Jay to take our next slide after that. Thank you, Siri. Uh, and uh, Steve, do you have anything to add before we open it up to the board? No, Madam Chair, this was, again, this is on the revenue side. And so looking at, but at revenue drivers or those things that we're looking taking into consideration when we put the budget together for this year, but at this time uh, we're prepared to answer questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve and, and Siri. And I'd like to um, move it over to the board to see if there's any questions. We, um, it's interesting how um, through the pandemic, uh, those lines were back to um, almost recovery with the, uh, even when we don't have the international borders completely open. Um, and we're, our trends and sales, sales tax and the, um, even with the tourism side, it's, uh, I guess it's the people that are traveling domestically coming to our region. And Mr. Madam Chair, if I could add also, when we look at, our experience in Coconino County, of course, we're, we're, a, we're a part of a larger, obviously, state economy, as well as a national economy and an international economy. And so I have, uh, I have discussed, uh, in fact, uh, while I was in Phoenix yesterday, I did meet with Mr. Alan McGuire, if you remember Alan, he's provided uh, economic forecasting for us for many years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he did, uh, he does, uh, I welcomed him to come back and provide a, a more of a broader uh, state, uh, national and international uh, forecast. And he is actually working on that. And I've not even had a chance to connect with Siri on that, but uh, he's happy to, to, to come to the board and provide, again, a broader perspective and show to show how our experience is, is compared to uh, to those other uh, geographic areas that I've mentioned. So we'll be looking to schedule that in the, in the near future. That would, be, that would be great. Thank you, Steve. Um, are there any questions um, from the board comments? So Supervisor Horseman. J just uh, real briefly, thank you, Siri, for the uh, update. It's good to um, uh, keep track of where we are. So far, so good, fingers crossed. And. You know, and I think with regards to um, the loss of the international travel, we are seeing so many people within the state traveling more and, um, you know, coming up here to Flagstaff and Northern Arizona and Coconino County uh, and really enjoying all that Coconino County has um, uh, to offer. And uh, obviously the, the numbers are starting to show that. So, um, but it's good. Thank you for keeping us, um, you know, up to speed on where we are. So thanks. Okay, thank uh, Supervisor Vasquez. Sure, thank you. Um, thank you, Siri, for the presentation and thank you to your team for tracking all this. And, uh, you know, it's a lot to digest. I, was, I think I'm still processing it, but uh, the thing that, that looks encouraging is that the forecast looks like we'll be on a positive trend rather than a negative trend compared to previous years. So that's, that's good to see. And so uh, just encouraged and uh, look forward to seeing how things play out uh, the rest of FY22. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Begay. Yes, um, I would also would like to reiterate that, you know, um, everything that was presented to us is um, something that is very positive. And I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're good to go. And that, you know, I just feel confident that, you know, things will continue to be um, on the upper side as far as our, our funds are, 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 are um, as they are right now. So. I just want to thank Siri here, staff, you know, and Steve for your leadership, you know, for um, giving us these uh, detailed information like this. It, it does uh, paint the picture for us. So I thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Siri, I'm just wondering if um, maybe it's it, uh, when I look at the use highway user revenue, the gas prices are up and yet this is, um, the trend is um, lower than the 21. Maybe people are driving less than they, is that the reason why you think? 
Um, thank you, Supervisor Fowler. That's actually a really great question and a great point to make on that. Our, um, the highway user revenue and the gas tax portion of that is on a per gallon basis versus a percentage basis. So the, as price changes happen, um, actually it, it tends to be a counter trend because if gas becomes more expensive, typically uh, driving drops off a little bit um, or discretionary driving, which means we actually receive lower revenues because the per gallon um, revenue contribution to the, to the fund is lower um, as fewer gallons are purchased. So that's a great point um, in that, uh, you know, we've definitely seen more driving since people were, were solely working from home and not traveling. Um, but with gas prices trending upwards, it also um, can have that impact on the discretionary driving and um, result in fewer revenues coming in. Yeah, and then um, on the uh, vehicles license uh, tax also, you know, we've been hearing stories that the vehicles, even used vehicles, are very expensive, more expensive than before. So maybe that's what we're seeing here, the result of that. Yes, that's a great point. So, all right. Well, thank you. And uh, we will move on to our next presentation with Jay. Good morning, Madam Chair and Supervisors. And thank you, Siri. Very interesting. Um, good morning. As you know, uh, there's been tremendous development pressure in our region. It's all very obvious. Uh, so I'll just go over the next two or three slides to kind of share where we're at with uh, permit activity and revenues. So you can see the, the yellow bar there is a very steady trend in, in activity over the last few years. Um, as a matter of fact, last year, you can see the huge jump um, prior to the year before. And we are currently this year, and this data is a few weeks old, but we are currently on track to, uh, uh, we're over 50% of where we were this time last year. Not only that, but if the, uh, this is just for revenues, but the um, wow. uh, renewable energy projects that are going to be coming on board and our fee increases that the board adopted uh, last year didn't go into effect right away. They didn't go into effect until September. So we're anticipating seeing over $3 million in revenue this year. Um, the department's operating budget hovers around $2.1 or $2.2 million. So we're well, well ahead of ourselves in, in, how, we, uh, in how we fund the department. Um, next slide, please, Siri. Thank you. So here's our, our, our annual permit volume. Um, again, you can still see that uh, obviously it correlates with the increase in, in uh, funds and revenue. But again, um, we are well over halfway above where we were this time last year. Again, this data is a few weeks old um, when we put the slides together. And we ran some interesting reports back in the late fall to kind of judge, okay, what, what do we think we might have coming still? So last year, I, I think it was in November, we ran a report of how many permits are sort of hanging out there where they're either, they're either ready to issue, they just haven't been paid for, or they've been paid for, but they had, the work hasn't started yet. And there were almost 400 new home permits that were in some level of flux that weren't that either weren't issued but were paid for or ready to be issued or they were paid for the work had just hadn't started so we called a number of those folks we just we just did a kind of a, a random search and we called some of those permit applicants some of them were owner builders and some of them were uh, contractors and we just wanted to try to ascertain what are you waiting for so the answers that we received for the most part was people were, were waiting for uh, material prices to come down which they have in some circumstances over the last few months which we suspect is why the last three or so months have been extraordinarily busy uh, in the department as a matter of fact this past uh, excuse me january of last year Issued and submitted new home permits were 23. This month already, we're not quite finished with the month, we're over 60 issued and uh, submitted. And, and that is just the new home permits. That, that doesn't include all the miscellaneous permits or the conditional use permits or the temporary use permits or the water heater replacements. The standard, the metric by which we see growth is obviously the new homes. And it, it's uh, almost triple this January where we were last January. It's, it's, 
It's alarming to say the least. Trying to keep up with the volume has been difficult. So again, I can't thank the board enough for approving our term limited environmental quality specialist position. He started yesterday, so thank you. Um, uh, next, next slide, please, Siri. And here's just a graph sort of looking at uh, our backlog. So here's another interesting, which reinforces what I was just discussing. Um, the orange bar issued permits, the blue bar are those submitted permits that have either not yet been issued or they, they're complete, but they haven't been paid for. Um, so you can see what kind of a backlog we're looking at. So there is a tremendous out of, amount of work that is, that is still out there at some level of um, readiness. So uh, we, we, we keep looking at, at this backlog number. We, we didn't really start looking at that information until the fall because we wanted to be able to see, all right, what is the next year going to look like? We have permit activity for two or three years of work if they stopped coming in today. So it's, uh, it, it's a very interesting dynamic. And I think that's all the slides that we have and I'm happy to answer any questions. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Steve. You know, one of the big takeaways, of course, from Jay's slides are the back is the backlog. Uh, and so if, if I could ask uh, Jay, with your permission, Madam Vice Chair, uh, Jay, when we look at the backlog, are, are, and you know, everything has, you know, obviously solutions to it. Are we looking at, at staffing up to deal with the backlog? And if so, are we are we running into recruiting for those professionals to 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 fill those positions? Because you know it seems to count. It seems logical that for those functions of county that result in revenue uh, through permits, that we would want to be addressing those those gaps. So not only to serve the public, which is of course our number one goal, is to serve the public. Uh, and, and those seeking the permits, but also it is a source of revenue for the county. So if you could speak to recruiting and positions and some of the challenges that we, we and opportunities that we have when we do recruit for certain professional positions. Uh, Madam Chair and County Manager Peru, thank you for that. I am happy to speak to that because that is something that Lucinda and I have been discussing considerably as we look into the budget request. Um, so we did come mid, we did come a um, couple of months ago to the board to ask for funding for the EQ Environmental Quality Specialist One. So that was extremely helpful. Um, we actually uh, increased our contract allowances for third party review for environmental quality um, recruitment has been challenging, but recruitment in the private sector, that challenge has reflected our third party contracts for assistance. So we had three contracts for third party engineering assistance, predominantly for our environmental quality. And I, I mentioned environmental quality staff because there's only three of them that do the work of say six or seven building staff members. So it's a, it's a, it's a lopsided dynamic, which we will be trying to address during this budget cycle. But two of our third party contracts, their engineers that did the third party review for us left. So they didn't have qualified people. We only had one. Um, SWI most recently just hired another engineer that's capable of, capable of doing the third party uh, engineering review. But so it, it isn't even just our own recruitment challenges. We're seeing recruitment challenges in the private sector affecting our work and, and our ability to uh, to try to keep up with permit processing. Um, I, I can let you know a, a little sneak peek here. We will be asking for some uh, funding for term limited positions this coming year in addition to more money for third party contracts. Um, Lucinda gave me the go ahead the other day to uh, start inquiring with yet another third party um, uh, engineering firm. They're called uh, Bureau Veritas. Uh, they're down in the Valley and they're, they're essentially a private de uh, community development department that's capable of, of assisting us in all of our efforts with plan review and inspection if necessary. So I'm waiting for a quote from them to see if we can uh, even come back to the board sooner than the budget and get uh, some additional funds approved. So we are very conscientious of, of the backlog and the delays that it's causing. Um, on a side note, uh, I think you're all aware that COVID wiped out our building there for about three weeks and all three of the, the environmental quality staff were out. So we that did not help our backlog one bit. We slipped a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Meister. 
Thank you, Steve. Um, so, so I'm just wondering, is that do are we seeing a trend in professionals leaving our county since there is a need even in the private sector? Is that what we're is that what you're seeing? Um, Madam Chair, from a from a a, whole, a global county perspective, I'm sure that's true to some extent. As you know, I lost Jess McNeely, our, our assistant director. There's been some delays in recruitment there, um, but Joanne poached him. So I don't know if it's a, <laughs> that was unfair, but that aside, um, we haven't had a tremendous amount of turnover in the department in this past year. Uh, the, the positions we did have turnover, uh, people moved away. We did lose uh, a, an employee to another department, um, but those were mostly administrative staff. Um, in your in your uh, bar here presentation, there's still blue lines from May. Are those just being carried to the to date, or are those still outstanding in those months, or have they been resolved? But this is just for um, information purpose. It's really just for information. Um, again, this data is about a month old. As you can see, you can see January. I think it was the very first week of January where the bars are so low because that's when we ran the data. So some some of these that that were issued, uh, some of them have been su submitted, but it's really just a reference to show that we're failing to keep up. Frankly, that that backlog is continuing to grow, and it's predominantly with our environmental quality division. Um, for the reasons I mentioned before. I hope that answers your question, Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. And um, I, I wonder if, um, so yeah, let me just open it up to the board first. Um, are there any questions from the board on the presentation on permits? Any comments, uh, Supervisor Horseman? I see, let me just go through everyone. Yeah, just, uh, you know, the, you know, I think you're actually addressing the comment, um, um, uh, Vice Chair Fowler, and, um, you know, backlog seems to be the, the word for 2022, so. Mm -hmm. I, I see, Lucinda, would you like to make a few comments? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add one that, you know, I really, we're, Jay and I are working really closely to try to identify what are the resources and opportunities to try to address the backlog. I think one other, as Jay mentioned, you know, a contributing factor is the cost of construction right now. So some people are delaying, they aren't paying for that permit or moving forward with their projects. Um, I'll say thankfully maybe, um, and we may see that dynamic change a bit um, or continue, I guess I should say, with the tightening of, of the financial markets um, if interest rates go up to try to curb inflation. So, you know, uh, that impact as well. But, but, but you're also looking at the number just come in, that has just come in in January. Costs have come down some, right, Jay, but not significantly. And the rates and people are, are still moving ahead. And I think we'll see a bump up right now before interest rates change. So I think between now and the next six months to a year to two years, we're going to see this backlog throw through, flow through the system. So, um, you know, there'll be a lot more discussion about this, you know, in, in uh, Jay's budget presentation, but uh, to really document what's happening and the needs that they have, but um, it's a very dynamic market. And certainly your question about, is it affecting our professionals in the organization? Yes, we are seeing people move uh, back into private industry and construction because there's a lot of money to be made. Um, and um, that's certainly affecting public works. And I think some of the other sectors of the county, but but primarily those that would interact with construction um, directly. So thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Lucinda. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, Supervisor uh, Fespas? Oh, there you are. No, I'm good. Thank you. I appreciate the, the conversation and learning about 
the building boom that's happening as as uh, people are getting out, you know, things are starting to move again uh, since COVID kind of hit and slowed things down. So uh, great job, team. Thank you for the presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Begay. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I have one small question. Um, so the backlog, are you, um, for the backlog that you're showing for um, the August, and it seems to be um, uh, a, a, a huge backlog here. And um, I was wondering how you're gonna close the gap on this, or is it just gonna be something like May, or, or, or the ones back in May, some of those included in the drafts in March and April uh, and August? Yep, Madam Chair and Supervisor Begay, thank you. That's a good question. So some some of the some of that backlog is uh, subsequent, so it's growing on top of each other. Um, you can kind of see the trend has continued to increase um, through August. So some of the backlog, it is growing on top of existing backlog. I hope that answers the question. I, that's I, what I heard you ask, and yes, it is continuing to grow. Well, very, very interesting, Jay. Um, do you have any follow-up questions, uh, Supervisor Begay? You're good, okay. Um, and this is just so interesting with the supplies um, that is still costly, but still people are moving forward. There is discussion on the national level about possibly increasing the interest rate. So I guess that's on people's minds as well. So um, uh, thank you. If there are no other comments, um, uh, Lucinda, I, have, I see you. Do, you. do you have any more to add? <laughs> yes, just one more point that, um, and Jay can give the details, but there's a lot of construction going on in the outlying areas. And so the impact to staff having to travel, if, for example, as you're aware, fair amount of development going in in Greenhaven, you know, west of Page. And so staff needing to drive up there and do inspections or out to Forest Lakes or other areas outside of uh, the immediate, let's say Flagstaff areas is significant impact as well, right, Jay? Yeah, Lucinda, thanks for bringing that up. It's a really good point. Um, and it also will translate into our budget discussion because we've got a lot of contractors that are asking us for daily inspections and we're only able to perform daily inspections right around Flagstaff, uh, Belmont, you know, Dony Park area. The other areas are one or two days a week. Uh, sometimes we're able to get to the southeast portion of the county and Supervisor Begay's district um, three times a week. But that area of the county is growing tremendously. If, if you remember from the permit, um, the permit fee discussion that we had a while back, um, during COVID and now sustained, we're seeing that southeast portion of the county growing at an exponential rate. And you know, it's not just minor improvements anymore. It's it's new homes. It's it's accessory dwelling units. Um, and the reason for that is because COVID forced people to be working from home, so they went to their second homes. You know, and if you live in the East Valley to get to Forest Lakes or Starlight Pines or a number of those other communities, it's not much over an hour drive. So um, we suspect that, uh, that that's what drove a tremendous amount of the growth that we're still seeing in that region of the county. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's interesting how our communities are changing and uh, um, we may have more permanent residents rather than second homes here soon. <laughs> And, you know, as we improve the broadband and other infrastructures that are coming through. So thank you so much, Jay. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, and then the interesting about the energy portion also, the uh, energy that the projects that are going to be, um, that, may, that are being proposed and may be coming through. Yep, uh, Madam Vice Chair, the Chevalon Canyon Wind Farm, uh, we've been meeting with them on a near weekly basis. They're going to be applying for their uh, grading permit for their laydown yard at the end of February, very beginning of March, with towers um, supposedly uh, being installed as soon as November. So that's gonna be, a, that's gonna be quite the project. Yes, thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, Lucinda. Um, and Siri, we're going to move back to you and Steve. 
Thank you, Chair Fowler. So um, now that we've wrapped up our revenues, we're gonna move on to our major fund expenses. We have a series of snapshots to show you. Um, they all look very similar. Um, as we noted in the expenditure highlight section, really the one uh, major anomaly in our budget to actuals so far is that restoration of competency figure. Um, but as we look at these, really um, they, they look similar and they look uh, very consistent and that's generally a good thing um, that we're moving through our budget. Um, it, on trend with what we would expect. So our first one that we will show you is on um, the next slide, our general fund. And this excludes our contingency, contingency budget. Um, so, so far to date, we are at 49% of our salary and benefits budget as of the time we ran this. Um, again, I will note though, uh, the gap between that blue and that orange. So the, the blue being our actuals year to date, the orange being um, a, a mathematical formula. If we took our budget and we divided it by the number of pay periods that we have in a year times the number of pay periods we've had, um, we would get that orange bar. So that's our budget to date. And there is a gap there. It will start to close because we have now budgeted for the dollar increase to salaries that is hitting the second half of the fiscal year. Um, so that's our salary and benefits. Um, but again, this chart uh, looks very much the same for all of the layout in terms of we have the top bar, the gray bar showing our full budget for the whole year. Uh, then we have, again, just a formula. So budget to date, uh, the orange line should be half of the gray line if we did the math correctly, since we're six months through the year. And then uh, the blue one is our actuals. And, and so this is very much on trend. Uh, we're at 40% of our operating budget in the general fund. Um, but again, our spending pattern tends to be a little more heavily skewed towards the end of the fiscal year uh, as departments have a better sense of what the unknowns might be or have a little more comfort of um, you know, where we are in terms of the revenue side of our budget. So that's very typical. Um, also, you know, just as we, we encumber things for contracts and then we actually have the outflow of paying for those services later on in the year. Um, travel, though, that's one that um, in general is a little bit still lagging because of um, so many things continuing to be held virtually versus, um, you know, conference travel to in person. Although I, at, at least anecdotally from from conferences and training, some things that I've seen for finance professionals, they do seem to be um, they seem to have moved more to the in-person um, and are, are phasing out that online option. So we will expect this to, again, uh, pick up and become closer to budget throughout the year um, if, if departments do choose to take advantage of the trading opportunities and they are more offered in person versus online. Um, so capital, we have not expended any of our capital budget in the general fund yet. Um, and again, that, that tends to be typical. Um, with this part of the year. So nothing, nothing standing out too much as we look at our general fund. And then as we move to our next one, we see something very similar for our transportation funds. So this is our uh, road maintenance and our um, so road maintenance sales tax and our highway user and our vehicle license that is restricted for transportation and highways and streets. Um, so similar to the general fund, um, we are at 39% of our salary and benefits budget. So that, that gap is higher. There has been higher turnover in the transportation fund than we've seen um, countywide, uh, higher vacancy rate um, operating in capital. So um, as Lucinda had noted when we were going through this presentation earlier, there's more of a spring construction season. So this is typical, again, being uh, below our operating capital budget this time of year because those activities tend to ramp up more towards the end um, when we get into the construction season. We also show on the next slide, the public health district fund. Um, so 42% of salary and benefits, some of the salary and benefits in the district have been offset uh, by some of the federal funding sources we've received for COVID response. Um, so trending a little bit below our year to date budget for salary and benefits in the health district, operating also a little bit lower, um, but some of that is, is again, typical timing of when some of our payments are made for mandates or um, for our operating costs and then travel really, um, you know, not hitting anywhere near our year to date budget for travel. And that could pick up again, the second half of the year. And finally, the last one we show is our jail district. Um, this jail district has also had a higher than uh, typical vacancy rate compared to the rest of the county. So 41% of budget for salary and benefits. 
um, 36% of operating budget. Um, travel, the travel budget is very small for the jail district. So we're at 42% of budget. Um, it's a very small amount. <laughs> um, and then capital, uh, those projects are underway. So 41% of budget, exactly what we would expect to see. So really, you know, nothing major to report as we look at our major fund expenditures. Um, pretty much on, on trend with, um, you know, what we expect to see or, or, you know, explainable variances when we do have those variances. So the last part we wanted to cover today. So first of all, if we can um, end the screen share, I, we are moving into one of the things we wanted to do is um, a budget book overview. But first we have actually had some new, new faces join our team since our last round of budgeting. So, and of course some familiar faces as well. I see John up on the screen. Um, Fong and Brandon, if you Hello, can put your John. cameras on for a second. Um, so I, I was hoping to introduce our new um, team members and then we can also transition into, John will be going over our budget book with you. Um, but first of all, we have Fong Martin. You'll see Fong over to, well, she's on the right of my screen. I don't know where she is on your screen, I guess. <laughs> Fong is our new budget manager. She joined us in November, I believe, and has uh, hit the ground running. We're so excited to have Fong um, leading the budget team. And we also have Brandon who joined us in July. So right after we wrapped up the budget, did we wrap up the budget? I think so. So right after we ended the budget process. Um, so we have Brandon also who has joined us as a budget analyst. And of course you all know uh, John Comer who is our senior budget analyst, but I just wanna point out that you're looking at um, an award-winning team. <laughs> they recently did receive uh, the GFOA Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Excellence in Budgeting for the budget document. And so I did want to turn it over to John so he can um, familiarize you with that resource and sort of walk you through what's available to you um, now that you have your, your printed published uh, budget documents. Well, thank you for uh, joining our county uh, and with our budget department and welcome. It's really great to meet you and um, very happy that you have chosen to um, join our county. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, John. Great, thanks. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair Fowler, members of the board. Um, a series introduced us uh, well enough, so I won't bother going through that. Uh, I would want, want to give one special thanks to Nicole Harris, uh, our financial analyst up here in finance. Uh, she helped immensely with this, uh, with this last round of the budget book, so thanks to her. Um, I guess I'd say, the annual budget book for us really serves two purposes. Uh, you know, first we submit it to GFOA, uh, Government Finance Officers Association, um, for their award program, which, as Siri mentioned, we we just received, and I'd like to add that, that is our uh, 22nd consecutive uh, award that we've received. So uh, we're really proud of that. Um, but I'd say the other the other purpose of the document really is as a reference tool. Um, as a reference for county management, uh, for you, the Board of Supervisors, um, and, and for the public as well. Uh, you know, this document is on our public website, um, as well as the hard copies that you received. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through a couple areas that might be of interest to you. Um, I guess I'll start off with, uh, this is the electronic file that the public would see uh, on our site. And it does have um, a couple of features in it for better navigation. Uh, you can use bookmarks if you are looking for a specific area of the book. Um, and in the table of contents also, um, everything here is hyperlinked. So in case we do want to see who the county officials are, we can do that. We can go to the mission statement. Uh, and so uh, the table of contents will just take us directly there. Uh, probably the first uh, area that we should probably talk about is the letter to the citizens. Um, this is essentially, I think we try to keep it around five or six pages. And it is a very high level overview of the FY22 budget process, um, challenges we encountered, anything specific about this, this year. And uh, you know, we work with uh, the board chair uh, to create this. So uh, thank you, Chair Ryan, for helping us this year. Um, but it is, it, it has some very um, high level uh, uh, data in it. Uh, but it's mostly pros and mostly talking about um, really how the budget process uh, occurred this year. Um, so then the next section is probably the largest section of the book, and it's called the budget summary. And it is where we start digging deeper into countywide financials. Um, it starts um, innocuous enough with talking about the history of the county, um, goes into 
Let's see here, population profile, et cetera, um, employment and economy. Uh, and then it moves into uh, fiscal policies that we adhere to as we are going through the budget process and, and, and how we use the budget year round. Um, and then we really get into uh, the real data. Uh, we get uh, down here in summary of financials. Uh, you can see we have uh, financial data for this. This one is for all funds, but we also break it out uh, by general fund and by all the major funds. So uh, this is where a lot of the a lot of the data and a lot of the anal analysis takes place. Um, you can see a little farther up. Here. Analysis of revenues. Um, so we do an, an analysis of every major revenue type. Uh, so that is located here, and we do the same thing with expenditures. Uh, so that is all located uh, within the uh, budget summary. Then there's also uh, within the budget summary there is. Let's see if I can find it real quick. There is uh, the general fund ten-year plan, uh, broken between two pages. Uh, so that is obviously included in the budget book. Um, also in the budget summary is um, personnel for the last three years by department um, for, for reference. And then of course we uh, do talk about uh, county debt. We have a certain area for that within the budget summary as well. Um, let's see, the next area is strategic planning. Now this is usually kind of a um, focusing on longer trends, uh, focusing on our 10 year planning process, uh, et cetera, and kind of how, we, how we've um, developed those over the years. Uh, this current year, uh, a little bit larger, uh, does talk specifically about uh, how COVID-19, as well as the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, affected the FY22 budget. So um, this uh, strategic plan does change a bit year to year but usually it's talking more about our, our 10 year plans. Um, and then as we go farther into it, there are um, sections for each department and, and these will probably look very familiar to you. These, this is essentially the same data that you receive during uh, the board of supervisors meeting, uh, budget meetings with departments. Uh, so a lot of this is gonna look very similar. Okay, a little bigger. Uh, I'll take recorder for an example. Uh, they will describe each of their programs that they perform, uh, a brief description, and they, and they also talk briefly about uh, service delivery as to where they perform those, uh, those programs. Uh, they go into their goals and objectives for the next year. Uh, they talk about their achievements for the current year. They talk about, uh, briefly talk about their strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results. Uh, and then we add a brief financial summary uh, with a few charts regarding types of revenue and types of expenditures. And then, of course, the uh, department-wide financial statement, which I'm sure you've seen dozens of times, uh, just the, the nuts and bolts numbers. And then we also break that out by, by each department's program. Uh, we also include performance measures for each department, and we ask them to break them out uh, by each of their programs. And, and we'll usually give uh, four, four years worth of those performance measures. And of course, staffing uh, for the last three years for each department. Okay, so we have one of those sections for each, uh, for each department. And then down towards the end of the document, we get into uh, a small area on special tax, taxing districts, which um, also includes uh, the um, adopted property tax rates for uh, each uh, entity that uh, we work with. Uh, and then we have a section on the capital budget, which goes into detail, uh, goes into detail about uh, capital projects that were approved during the year. Um, and, and their effect on the operating budget, uh, as well as any um, capital improvement plans that departments submitted to us. Uh, here's facilities. And here's Public Works' um, capital improvement plan. So they're all included in the capital budget uh, section. And then lastly, we have uh, a glossary. Um, obviously, there's a lot of terms that 
uh, the public might not be that familiar with. So we tried to um, define them all in glossary. And uh, our growing list of acronyms also sometimes need to be um, described as well. Um, and then of course there is a um, very detailed index uh, to help uh, everyone find what they want, to, what they're looking for in this document. Um, that's really all I have to show here. I, I guess I, I would say that uh, the budget team is always interested in uh, making this document more informative, uh, more accessible, more transparent. Uh, so that uh, so if there's any suggestions that the board has during the FY23 budget process, um, yeah, please let us know because we'd, we'd be happy to incorporate them. And with that, I would just uh, take any questions you have. What a document. It is so detailed and so well laid out. Thank you, John. Uh, every year, and congratulations on the award again. Um, the Coconino County is known for its budget because of the team that you have. So thank you so much. Um, let me see, let me move to the board, see if there's any questions, comments, uh, and then I'm gonna just go. go go through and uh, supervisor Horseman. Well, that's gonna keep us busy for a while. Thank you, John and staff. That's a pretty impressive. And uh, I look forward to spending some time with it. So um, well done. Thank you. Uh, supervisor Vesquez. Uh, yes, thank you for the overview. Well done in terms of the report, very thorough, very in depth. And it's gonna take a little while to digest it and marinate it some before I can actually uh, ask some questions on it. But thank you for the report, I appreciate it. Yeah, marinate it, that's great. Um, Supervisor Begay. I just wanna thank everyone for the presentation. Thank you so much. We're going to have to highlight this in, the, in our um, county newsletters and also um, just wondering if there will be a, 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 a news release that might be done to let the to inform the public as to where to find it to um, that way it is um, it is available to tell inform them it's available for them to review uh, you know the public is very interested in, uh, in the budget. Uh, we will have our jail district tax um, uh, be out there again and part of our budget presentation with that, we're gonna have to be very familiar with this document and, and direct people to this website for them to learn more. I think it's uh, very timely that you have this out and um, I think this will bring confidence from the, um, from the public with the county uh, budget and be able to explain it a little bit, a little bit better. I know uh, as supervisors, we get, we get quite a few questions about our budget once we go through, you know, the, we start the process. So this is really good. Thank you so much, John. Uh, Wanted to see if there's any other comments from maybe our county manager uh, and our deputy managers and any one, um, let me see, I don't, I can't try Thank to you, see. Madam. Oh, there you thank, are, okay. Yeah, so thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, yes, yeah, certainly credit to the, to the staff for putting the document together. You know, while, it, while the budget is also an official legal document from the county, it's also a statement of values. It reflects the values, the aspirations, you know, the, the needs of a community. And so uh, it also tells a story. And I always tell folks, it's a pretty good book. Uh, yes, it has a lot of financial information, but it also tells the story. It also is, is created and presented in such a way that, that we want the public to be able to see it and understand it. And I think oftentimes, you know, government is criticized that, you know, I don't understand the, the alphabet soup. We have, we have, we have acronyms. I don't understand the terminology. We have a glossary. Uh, you know, we have explanation of programs that speak to individuals that can understand what the program is. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good book to read. It's also for us and for the board members, uh, this is gonna be what we will be cre recreating again. 
uh, in the coming months. And so the steps that we go through the process. And as we're going through the process for this year, for you all to look at last year's book and bookmark it and ask questions uh, and, and you know, tell us what you need to understand more and better as we, as we create the, the budget process for this coming year. Uh, a couple of items, Madam Vice Chair and the board, you know, for takeaways, for, uh, looking at, at, the, at the building uh, community development information that Jay presented uh, and address, to address some of the backlog issues. And, and, and I do think we're gonna need to advance uh, some of those solutions sooner than later. Uh, because it is the public, you know, we're serving the public, you know, contractors and residents uh, and businesses alike. Uh, so uh, our, our backlog is concerning. And so we will be looking at some of those items that we can do sooner than later. Uh, also looking at uh, re restoration of competency. Restoration of competency is, is, is a substantial expense driver. It is, of course, providing services to individuals in need. And, and the cases uh, from that program, uh, those are, those are case-driven. Uh, and so, you know, we can allocate a certain amount, but the, the, the needs of those individuals who are served in that program are driven by cases referred. And so, so uh, I would like to, to work with uh, court administration, the, the communal justice partners, uh, our mental health uh, individuals within the county, HHS, uh, to come back to the board with a presentation on RTC, Restoration to Competency. Uh, it's a substantial uh, program uh, that, that, that entails substantial investments. And so uh, it's important to, to look at that. Uh, we are working on some, some, some ways to, to look at that program, some solutions. We, are, we rely on Yavapai County. We rely on Arizona State Hospital uh, and, and those have uh, you know, co uh, costs to those individual and to see what can we replicate uh, here within Coconino County. Uh, again, to see uh, not only from a cost standpoint, but also from the ability to have the program be um, possibly more successful if we have a program that's more local than, 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 than other locations in the state. Uh, and then also uh, the last follow-up is to work with, with Alan McGuire and have him come in and provide a presentation on, on trends he sees see statewide, nationally, and international. Uh, when I talked to him last night, uh, you know, the, 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 the discussion on, will we have another recession? And so, well, you know, what does the crystal ball say? Because, you know, when we look at recession cycles and that's what we've always built our, our 10 year plan on, uh, we, we always program in the reality of a, of a recession. And so some of the things that we're seeing just in terms of national inflation happening are, are concerning to see, are those a precursor to an economic uh, cycle uh, that, that may occur in the next few years. So again, uh, these are just follow-ups that I took at, uh, uh, well, during the presentation. Uh, and so with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Oh. Okay, thank you, Steve. And you know, restoration of competency is um, is yeah. We had a discussion through um, numerous discussion on that, and um, it's good that uh, we're really looking at doing our own here. Um, those are fluctuating funds that we just cannot control. Um, so that's I'm really happy to hear that. Um, uh, Siri, is there um, uh, any, we, do we have, we, I think we have some more that we were going through presentation. Uh, no, thank you, Chair Fowler. That completes our presentation for today. Thank you, thank you uh, John, and thank you to your staff, uh, Siri. Uh, we always have a good, um, very uh, good um, budget department. So thank you so much. Uh, are there any other comments from the board? No, I see. I, there, I see nodding. Um, Steve, is there anything else on this presentation? Um, no, Madam Vice Chair. What I can do very quickly. So we will uh, break for a lunch break uh, okay. at one fifteen. We are scheduled to come back to receive a presentation from the Flood Control District, and then another presentation on road district policies from from Public Works. I do want to note that uh, the final item is an executive session discussing the American Rescue Plan 
and the county's implementation process. Um, I, I, I want to just let folks know for those individuals and the public, we will not be returning back with an action related to the American Rescue Plan. Today's discussion is an executive session with the board uh, for legal advice on how we, uh, how our, our process for implementing the American Rescue Plan. But again, I just want to reiterate, Madam Vice Chair, we are not coming back to the to, to public session and take any public action related to that topic. Uh, we will, however, come back to finish up the agenda uh, from this morning. So the roundtable uh, presentations or updates from districts three, four, and five, and then the, the uh, county manager update and the planning calendar are the three remaining items. So as time permits, uh, we, we probably will come back to finish those items. But again, I just, one more reiteration, we're not coming back to take an action item on the American Rescue Plan. So uh, that's just a preview of this afternoon, Madam. Okay, thank you, Steve. And with that, and I, I wanna just emphasize how important a budget is. I really encourage the public to go to the website and um, because these documents are the ones that really guide uh, and uh, based on the budget, this is what we as a county perform uh, our, our service to the to all the constituents that live in Coquimina County. So thank you so much. And we have a great team that puts it all together. And um, we, it, it's a yearly budget. We are constantly talking about the budget. Um, um, it's not just it happens and then it's over. It, then it picks up again. So thank you so much. And thank you, Steve. And we're going to um, take a break until 1.15. And at that time, our chair should be back. And But if not, I'll continue the meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, Steve, our chair, looks like our chair is not back yet. And uh, uh, we can proceed. Let me just make sure we've got all of our board. Let me see if our board members are here. He should be on momentarily. Ah, that's great. Okay. Thank you, Lucinda. And Miss Patrice, Geronimo, and Judy. Okay, let's see if Supervisor Begay is here. I see Greg. Madam Vice Chair, we are working on getting supervisors Begay set up. We'll be with you in just a second. Okay, great. Thank you. There's our board chair. And there you are. I, I have. I'm just trying to get on. <laughs> I'll okay. the box again. <laughs> well, Mr. Chair. We have, uh, we're waiting for Supervisor Begay to reconnect right now. So oh, cool. as soon as she does, you can, you can start the meet. There she is. And I turned the meeting back to our board chair, Mr. Matt Bryan. Thank you. All right. Thank you there, Lena. Hey, Lena, uh, where, where did you guys get We are now on item, the flood control district presentation. That's what we're going to start with. Okay, and then and we, we have not gone back to our board. Um, we completed all the items. We have to return to board um, updates on the roundtable. We have not completed that. Uh, we have um, completed all the presentation, the budget, and we took all the money from District Three and put it into District Five. It was a vote. <laughs> <Sorry, laughs> <Yeah. And, laughs> You, you blew that because you should have angled for the four others, but you just lost out on that. <laughs> or the three yeah, others. Uh, so yeah. now we're on the flood district presentation, Mr. Chair. And it looks like all the board members are here and I hand the meeting back to you. All right, fantastic. So it's, uh, you know, starting up again. How are you doing, Steve? Do you have everybody you need? There? Yes, sir. Our team is here and ready to present. Okay, and we have all supervisors on board here as well. So this is item number 26. Um, it is a presentation discussion and update on the flood control district's current projects and district financial status. In order to consider that, we need to resolve as the flood district board of directors. I need a motion to do so. So move. Motion by Vice Chair Fowler. Oh, could you put your uh, voice on there, Geronimo? A second. Sorry. All right. Yeah, and it's more for uh, the record uh, for these guys at you know our clerk's office. Uh, really appreciate that. So a second by uh, Supervisor Vasquez. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Now we're in uh, acting in the capacity as the Flood Control District Board of Directors, and uh, mm -hmm. Lucinda Andriani uh, is wouldn't carry this conversation, but I'll check in with the our manager, Steve Peru. Did you have anything to kick off here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, we have uh, various members of, of uh, team here. We have Lucinda, uh, we have uh, Greg Nelson, Chris Tressler, Jay Smith, uh, Sean. We got everybody here today. So I'm gonna uh, turn this over to who's leading the presentation? Lucinda, Jay? I am kicking it off. Yeah, but hold on. Did you say Greg Nelson? I thought I thought he worked for me. Oh, well, that, <laughs> Greg, I thought, Greg, Greg, you, yes, Greg, you're supposed to yes. tell. <laughs> Hi, <you>. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right. I'll go ahead. We'll catch you up on that when we do the update on the board. Uh, so, Lucinda, uh, 
The floor All is right. yours. Thank you, Chair and Board of Directors. And, and uh, Gregory, if you can bring up the presentation, that would be wonderful. And we are very, very appreciative to uh, have Greg on the Public Works team. He is doing a phenomenal job and he did a fantastic job covering a number of seats over the last couple of months. So really applaud him for that, so. Thank you, Lucinda. Can you see the presentation? Yes, I can. Thank you, Greg. So good afternoon. Um, we're here today to provide an update on the flood control district. And uh, really today's discussion, one, it, it will kind of highlight the challenges of the district over this last year. And uh, which, which everyone knows to a large extent focused on, on the museum fire, post wildfire flooding and um, going through that process. And, um, you know, I, I think in some ways for, for all of us, it was you know, the analysis that the flood impact analysis was done back in 2019, you know, predicted what actually happened this summer. And to some extent, there was a sense of validation of that, but uh, much that that sense was certainly overwhelmed by the impact to to our communities, uh, both within the county and within the city of Flagstaff. And so we quickly turned our attention to then trying to address um, the longer term, what we know will be longer term impacts. And we'll talk about that today. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly talk about what those impacts were. And, um, but really today is focused on giving you an update, kind of where are we right now? And, and specifically, once we walk through those pieces, we'll come back and Jeremy will take a little bit of time to talk about where are we financially with the district at this point for, for fiscal year 22, for this fiscal year. Because I know you've seen, you know, there are a lot of items coming through the agenda and a lot of uh, approvals for various uh, grants and so forth. And uh, going into the budget process, we wanted you to have this this update. Um, as importantly, or frankly, probably more importantly, we will come back on February 1st and Jay Smith, who will do a brief update on restoration activity for this, this year, uh, will uh, give the going forward strategic plan for forest restoration. And I think as everyone's very aware, we have a, a unique, probably once in a lifetime opportunity to have an impact with the level of federal funding that's coming forward now and the Forest Service identifying the top priority as those acres that will have partnerships involved with them, funding partnerships, we are ideally positioned to be able to get a significant amount of work done. And he will talk about that in depth on February 1st. And at the end of that presentation, we will look at the longer range financial plan for, for the flood control district and uh, how do we go about taking, leveraging uh, those significant federal dollars. So, and, and our proposal and Jay's proposal for that. So, but again, today we'll focus on uh, fiscal year 22. Uh, some photographs here, I think most people were aware of the flooding and Certainly, supervisors um, Vasquez and Horseman were front and center in that entire response process this last summer, as well as all the efforts that have gone into securing the grants that we have secured. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christopher. Go ahead, uh, Greg, to the next slide. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christopher that's going to talk a little bit about the impacts, and then I'll come back and talk about uh, what are, what's the going forward project. So, uh, Christopher. Uh, thanks, Lucinda. And uh, Brian and members of the Flood Con District uh, Board of Directors, I'm gonna give a little bit of review of the events that we had in our calendar year 21, or maybe even part of uh, 22 as uh, things happen and things keep moving for us. but. Uh, this photograph here on the screen is uh, taken up at Mount Eldon Estates, and it shows a channel and a roadway after a couple of the events. And Lucinda mentioned that uh, since the, the museum fire, we've done a fair amount of science. 
and to to understand and predict the the nature of uh, the the impacts that fire will have. And it was very clear that flooding was imminent, and it was likely not a question of if, but when. And we certainly saw that this year. Um, definitely due to some of the county's efforts, and we can go to the next slide, Greg. Uh, due to some of the county's efforts, uh, the impact, some of the impact, especially in the Mount Eldon Estates neighborhoods, was uh, somewhat minimized. But uh, they still, uh, have, we saw a lot of flooding through the area, a lot of deposition of sediment, uh, roads damaged, some homes damaged. We had a total of five uh, significant flood impacts or flood events that impacted. Uh, the museum flood hazard area. And you can see on the slide, the number of homes and the, and the number of businesses that were impacted. I think it's also of note that uh, while these events, these, these rainfall events were impacting the museum flood hazard area, they were also impacting other parts of the county as well. We had to spend some resources in the Mountain Dell uh, area. Um, our operators assisted uh, with the BIA roads on the, uh, in the nation, uh, some of, as the BI-8 crews rebuilt the roads, uh, our team was out there resurfacing and uh, trying to make them open as well. The, uh, we can go to the next slide, Greg. So, uh, you know, these, these flood impacts are definitely countywide. And while um, the bulk in the, of the serious flooding that, uh, that we've seen uh, greatly impacting uh, people within the city of Flagstaff and the uh, Mount Eldon Estates and Lockett Ranches neighborhoods, it's also impacting people throughout uh, the county. And we just want to be mindful that uh, the flood control district uh, is, is really um, struggles and, and works to have equitable and, uh, and, um, and consistent support for all natural disasters and all emergencies that are relative to the flood control district as we uh, respond to um, you know, more recently flooding events that happen uh, in Coconino County. And it, it's a very stressful time and there's still, um, the threat is still real and, uh, and we're proposing more work to, that will take place. But uh, um, we saw in previous years and other flood events that uh, it's very traumatic, uh, it taxes people's mental health, and, uh, and it's not just specific to one part of the county. So we can go to the next slide, Greg. So a quick overview of the financials for the museum. Since 2019, I'm kind of starting at the bottom of the slide and working my way up, but since 2019, the flood control district has expended about $4.7 million. There's a lot of details uh, that aren't uh, pulled apart in this, uh, in this slide and in these numbers, but some of the significant ones are the NRCS projects that we undertook ahead of the museum um, flooding events that happened this last monsoon season. And then uh, some of the uh, projects that we undertook uh, during the, uh, the flooding events. Our emergency response has uh, been a coordination effort with the city of Flagstaff and uh, a lot of these costs are shared. Um, we've just this last summer, uh, we expended about $2.6 million in our museum flood area response and mitigation efforts. And with that, I'm gonna pass it. Uh, oh, no, yeah, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna pass it along. But uh, do we wanna ask for questions now or do we wanna get through the whole presentation first? Let's go ahead and get through this set and then we can, uh... Before we turn it over to Jay, we can see if there's any questions on kind of the museum related pieces. So, okay. so I, I think you're well aware with the, the items that have come forward in the last uh, several weeks in terms of approvals for the major agreement, major agreement with the Forest Service, as well as with the uh, NRCS for contributing significant funds toward uh, sediment reduction. And again, want to highlight that sediment reduction is a prerequisite to any flood mitigation um, within the city of Flagstaff or, or beyond, frankly. It's, uh, if we don't reduce the amount of sediment, then nothing that they do within the city will be effective at 
improving um, the situation for, for those that live within the city. And this is outlines here. I think you've seen most of these figures before in terms of the, the details. Um, those funds from NRCS also include uh, funding for um, uh, technical assistance uh, that will cover the cost of the engineering and some of the pre-construction work. I'm also really pleased to report uh, West Easton has continued to work very closely with DFFM at the state level. As you'll recall, the, the state uh, passed uh, special legislation uh, during the fires that were taking place this last summer and created a funding source for to cover some of these related costs and for the fire as well as for post wildfire flooding. And uh, today he received word that that 784,000 uh, that DFFM will reimburse us for our match. So, um, and with the Forest Service project, we don't have a match. They're paying for the, the entire amount up to that amount. If it goes over, we will pay the difference. But I mean, this is significant that we are now able to uh, employ just uh, a tremendous amount of work into this area for sediment reduction at, at very little cost to the, to the district. And given what we've expended to date, that's great news. So really wanna thank Wes for the relationship. And I saw uh, the FFM director, uh, David Tenney last week at the, at the USDA event that took place in Phoenix and uh, I thanked him greatly for his continuing support of our efforts here. So I really ask the board if, if, if you see him as well, or uh, I know many of you know David uh, well, he served as a supervisor prior and uh, uh, certainly thank him on our behalf. He's been tremendously supportful, supportive of our efforts. Next slide, Greg. So we've covered a great deal of this. And again, this is, these are sediment reduction measures were in effect restoring those alluvial fans as well as stabilizing the channels. So we're, we're reducing down the production of sediment and then also increasing the amount of sediment that's retained on the fans. So that less sediment ends up in the, uh, in the developed areas. Next slide, Greg. And this is a, 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 a graphic of the areas that will be treated uh, that are on forest. Uh, those areas are, are largely the, the, the kind of uh, tan colored area at the top of this slide is the actual burn area. So we do have a couple areas that are on the edge of the burn, burn area. Most of those channels above there are way too steep to employ any kind of strategies to reduce sediment production. That's why these areas below the burn scar are so imperative to, to impact. And you can see the areas that we're proposing projects, working with the Forest Service now, of course, to, to prepare the, the NEPA process. Um, they have, uh, in fact, uh, placed that, gone public with that NEPA process. They're now in the comment period. That'll extend for 30 days. And then um, uh, the hope is that we'll have approval by early May and begin to construction in early to mid-May. So next slide, Greg. And likewise with the NRCS, very similar types of measures, uh, both within Mount Eldon Estates, just north of Mount Eldon Estates on a 40 acre parcel, undeveloped parcel there as well as um, the Lockett Ranches area. And then in the next uh, slide here shows the, uh, those locations. Um, that location that's within the city, that's a city owned parcel. Uh, the one where the, the graphic is showing there. And that is um, a planned set of sediment basins. Uh, that project has a great deal of complexities to it. It has the historic Beale Wagon Road, as I mentioned before, as, as well as um, their additional land rights that have to be secured by the city. Um, so um, that that's element of this project, um, 
we can't move forward with any of this project, the construction, until we have secured uh, the sign off by um, all the parties involved to a memorandum of understanding with the State Historical Preservation Office. Uh, that process too is moving forward and we hope to have that culminated in, in mid to late March um, so that we could begin construction hopefully as early as April on, on these areas. So, uh, but it will be held up. Although I will say that I think it's unlikely that construction on that city parcel will take place prior to monsoon season, uh, given the level of complexities there with uh, between the SHPO as well as um, the, uh, the land rights um, and other uh, technical challenges that we have there. So, next slide, Greg. And this is a little more detail, as I just mentioned, relative to that, that this is called the Park Sediment Basins Project within the NCS overall project. And again, we're working very closely with the city, the SHPO, and in our students, of course, to address the complexities associated with this project. So next slide. We also, um, in fact, I believe today you approved a, a uh, application for what's called a Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant through FEMA. And, you know, it indicates there at the bottom that we likely will be declining this grant um, we, we really applied for this grant. The application date originally was back in, I think, mid early to mid-September. We applied for this grant as a backup plan, frankly, in case we were unable to secure approval for, for a grant from NRCS. At least we knew we would have a backup plan. And this was specifically for that parks park uh, sediment basins element of the NRCS project. It was for about a million, it's for about a million dollars. Um, and it would be about half of the project that we would have been, we, we are able to now construct with the NRCS funds. The major issue with this grant is the timeline. That's extremely slow. It'll probably take at least three years to get to construction. And Obviously, with our timeline, um, that's not, not, not uh, again, it probably is, is not acceptable um, for a timeline. But again, this was a backup plan. So as things progress here, it's likely that we will decline the grant and, and frankly, try to work with FEMA and FEMA uh, to, to potentially get that grant transferred over to the city. The city also applied for this grant or some other projects um, within the city. So next slide. So now we're gonna turn it over to, to Jeremy, but before we do, if anybody has any questions or comments relative to the information that was just shared about these, uh, some of the museum activities and what was experienced this last year, we can open it up for questions. I also wanna note that um, Andy Bertelson, the Water Services Director for the City of Flagstaff, as well as Scott Overton, uh, their Public Works Director, uh, are, are also uh, on today. And so if you have, through this, if you have questions of the city, I'm sure they would be happy to take a crack at answering those questions. So we're, we're kind of double teaming today. We're also participating in a council update relative to the museum later today, and, and they're, uh, they're on, on standby to answer any questions here today as well. So, so Chair, if anyone has any questions uh, to what's been presented, and then we'll launch into some of the financials and Jay's update. Sure, I got a question. Hello. Yeah, hey. go ahead. I appreciate the presentation and, and being brought up to see speed and, and the detail of this PowerPoint and was just wondering if this PowerPoint is going to be available for the public to see, or is this something that's uh, that's not going to be available? Oh, no, it's available, and it's okay. we will put it on the website um, and the museum website as well. And um, wh whenever we have present any information, we also do an email out to our museum email list, which is pretty extensive. And we let we share that that link with them, so they'll be aware that we've made this presentation and and um, the update information. So, 
No, great. Yeah. Thank you. That was that was my question. Just how was it going to get out to the community? Because I think these are the kind of details that the community needs to uh, to see to understand where we're at with stuff. Absolutely. And then in addition, um, we did send a letter specifically to kind of the immediate paradise area surrounding that park uh, sediment basins project because we're doing some pre-engineering um, investigative work there right now, some geotech work doing some soil sampling um, so that the engineers have that now because now we're moving forward that we have the approvals we're moving forward with the engineering. And we knew people would see people out there and go, what's going on? Why are, what are they doing out there? And uh, uh, so we did send a letter. We also held a meeting with Mount Eldon Estates area, virtual meeting, just to let update them on what's happening, both with Forest Service and in RCS, because we do need to secure um, cooperator agreements for the NRCS project, additional measures that we'll be doing in that area on private property. So we wanted them to be aware of the next steps forward. So as we move forward, as we um, move forward with these pieces, we'll continue to communicate with, with the respective areas. So. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. So yeah, now, uh, that the city has brought on a, a marketing public relations firm and they now have stood up their are standing up their own webpage relative to museum that will contain all their project information, uh, similar to what ours will now that we're in projects like this, all the updates will go into the, that website as well. And they're, we're, we're working together on other opportunities for communication as well. Right, and then the other piece of the information is right. We have it as this presentation, which is also documented and recorded uh, uh, through the clerk of the board. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, looks like uh, Supervisor Horseman, Patrice. Well, I actually, um, Lucinda uh, jumped on and, and indicated that, but yes, um, the Mount Eldon Estates Homeowners Association, for example, we had a meeting last uh, Wednesday, and uh, with promises that as uh, the uh, county moves forward with the engineering and develops more specifically some of the uh, sediment uh, reduction and um, mitigation efforts that there'll be periodic meetings. And, and I really appreciate that. I think it's really important to get out into the neighborhoods uh, to explain what is in fact going on, because you're right, they see the work and they all want to know what's happening. So, uh, and I appreciate that. And Appreciate uh, you and your staffs um, getting right on top of it and getting the word out as quickly as you've got information. So thanks. Uh, just a, a question, real quick. Uh, and it's great. I'm glad the city's doing that. Uh, and you said you have Andy and I forget who else you have on with the city, which is good. I'm glad they're doing it. Uh, you know, throughout the emergency, we've had that joint information uh, command piece, the JIC, uh, that's been functioning. And, and so this is going further into development of projects, starting to splinter out, uh, which makes sense. You know, where are we applying it? How are we coordinating all that kind of thing? Uh, it do, does just beg the question of, uh, there will be different messages uh, sometimes between the county and the city, uh, but uh, are we still coordinating uh, in that capacity? Yes, we are. We're, we're very much coordinating on the communication and, you know, acknowledging exactly what you said, Chair, which is that, um, you know, they're relative to their projects, you know, they, they're going to need to drive the communications on their projects mm -hmm. because we're not controlling or managing those projects. We're, we're, we're continuing with our technical team. We have a technical group, a technical advisory group that, that's meeting weekly. Um, and certainly, uh, I sit in on some of those, you know, some of the meetings as well as Christopher sits in on all of them. So we're, we're all sharing, you know, the ideas and concepts and discussions and everything with each other. But when the messaging, when it's time to move forward, you know, it will be important for them to discuss their specific projects and for us to discuss our specific projects. The park sediment basins is in effect a mutual project. We're, we're taking the lead on the engineering and construction of that, 
but they also have to secure the land right. So we're having to work very closely, particularly on that project, that element of the NRCS project. So, um, and there's been a good meeting with their, um, their uh, land rights and property acquisition and people and, and uh, we're working, uh, we're setting up a meeting between the various, uh, both the city and county attorney to, to talk about the legal processes between the two institutions. So there's a lot of process there behind the scenes that, that uh, is going on to effectuate uh, that particular project, so. All right, well, and you know, just, uh, just to say it, I know uh, uh, y'all understand it, but you know, the sensitivity to communication is, is key associated with it, uh, uh, respectful of each, uh, each other and, and how we're doing it, but for the sake of the community, the distinctions uh, periodically need to be spelled out uh, on that. Um, so uh, let me just check with uh, uh, any other the board members, uh, Vice Chair or Judy. Uh, okay, I'm not seeing you guys bubble up. Oh, there's Lena. Okay, go ahead, Lena. Yes, thank you. I just want to. Um, this is you make it you make it sound seamless, but I know that it is very complex uh, working with the Forest Service, with the state, with the local communities, private land ownership, and with the city. It is. Um, it is multi. It's every every piece is moving, and yet you're able to bring this together. So, I just want to thank you and Andy. Hi, Andy, out there, and thanks so much. Always part of the county, and always working on our um, behalf of our county, and I just really appreciate it. I just think that the teamwork that is put into this uh, is so very important, and. Um, for the safety of, uh, of our community and really happy that you're talking about communication and more communication, maybe, uh, and I'm sure this is in the books at some point, maybe um, there may be a town hall um, meeting with the two supervisors and the team to really um, try to provide that out there. It sounds like that's needed. Um, it's really good for the rest of the board members like myself, who's not, whose district is not part of this, um, um, this work, but it's important for me to know so that I can convey the information out to, um, out into, um, out into our county when uh, people are wondering how family members are doing, because uh, even though um, uh, you know, they, our families that live in this area are from all over the place. So I just really appreciate learning and seeing how, how um, what, what work is being accomplished and, and, and I have to just reassure them and it's good for me to know. Uh, and then I just was wondering too, you know, the Schultz fire um, where it happened, we did the, um, you all did the, the fin mitigation there. It might be good at some point to show what it, what that looked like before. And then when those uh, logs were put in place and then what it looks like now to give a perspective as to what we're talking about in this area. Um, because that healed up really well out there. And I don't know if that's necessary, but I'm just thinking that if I didn't know what um, a fan what fan you're talking about, you know, I, I would not know um, how to visualize it. So I'm just thinking that maybe that might be something that for educational purposes, but um, we know what we're talking about. It's like, you know, using abbreviations and all our, you know, um, the way we talk, but, but at the same time though, for the public, it might be good just to show those photos. So um, thank you again. Just really appreciate it and appreciate the work of the, um, uh, my colleagues, Supervisor um, Hieronimo uh, and also Patrice. Oh, I guess I should be using formal here, but <laughs> I 
but really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, Andy writes that he uh, uh, is very appreciative of flood control district value the relationship with the district, but he also uh, can speak to it. He needs to be let in. So he has an opportunity to speak to this. And while you're letting know, I'm in since I started with Greg, I, doesn't he work for me? Andy, <laughs> didn't he work for me once upon a time? <laughs> Do we really want to let him back in? <laughs> I, I grow him up, you know. <laughs> uh, I understand you need to utilize your discretion in terms of who you allow to speak at these meetings, but um, appreciate the opportunity. And um, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, it's good to see everyone again. And uh, just as I had said in the chat, we really value our relationship um, with the flood control district staff. And really in thinking about natural disasters, um, this museum fire and flood event is probably the biggest uh, the city has faced in quite some time, at least in my time here. And um, utilizing, as you had mentioned, Vice Chair Fowler, as you had mentioned, utilizing those Schultz experiences to learn and, and, and then apply to these events, which we have done. And I know Lucinda, Christopher and others have um, unfortunately had to do that with events throughout greater Coconino County. And now we as city staff are learning how to do that as well. And we appreciate the patience uh, that you as a board have uh, with us, the city and with our staff as we go through that learning process. Um, it's been difficult at times and Chair Ryan, you had mentioned the communication effort. And I think Lucinda and Christopher and, and probably in working with Steve have said, no, that's a city issue. And the city really needs to address that. And really putting us, we as a city in a place where we need to address uh, our, our, our own issues, so to speak. And, and that's been a healthy process. And, and I know Sarah Langley, our acting communications director, has been uh, working with the communication folks um, at the flood control district and at the county. And again, everyone's learning from it. Uh, it's definitely a situation we don't all want to be in, um, but um, it's one we are in and it's accepting that reality. And I'll tell you, the residents um, want to hear from experts that aren't us and um, not saying we're coming in to say we're the experts. Uh, you need to listen to us. But through those Schultz events and other events, we have learned quite a lot and we are attempting to apply those same principles uh, to this event. Uh, that's often hard for the residents to hear and understand. And so we really have to have a lot of patience with that. And sometimes our patients um, uh, do run a bit thin. It's very difficult um, knowing um, some of the principles like the forest restoration, the log rundowns, that you had, as you had mentioned, Vice Chair Fowler, and how well they've worked. And um, uh, uh, there, there aren't as many believers yet, um, but we know with uh, the forest restoration work um, that uh, all of that will be helpful. And, and we have some hurdles and you're right, Vice Chair Fowler, Lucinda does make it seem seamless and we know that it's not at all. And it's very difficult and we're working through all of those difficulties. So thank you for your support and patience. And, and so we're, we, we at the city, Scott uh, Overton, our public works director is on as well. And we're just viewing it as an opportunity to build uh, closer relationships with county staff because we're, we're all in this together. And if, if not, then then um, we'll separate and we'll have our own individual trouble. So um, thank you for all of your support. We appreciate it. Well, it's everybody working together. So uh, yeah, well said, Andy. I really appreciate the relationship as well. Uh, okay, any others from the board in terms of questions? We're still going through the presentation here. Okay, go ahead, Lucinda. Well, and I just want to acknowledge, thank you, Vice Chair. I, I really appreciate what you shared. And um, we are, we in fact, we talked with the Mount Eldon States area about conducting some tours as soon as they reopen the gate there at Campbell to get people out to see what a restored fan looks like. And, and we have shown pictures but there's nothing like going out there. So that's a great suggestion as, as well as some of your other suggestions. And it is affecting people across the county. And that was that one slide that um, we, we get calls from people who are on the nation or 
out in the Hopi tribal area saying, I have family there. What's going on? Are they safe? Or, you know, is it safe for me to come in or not? And um, so it's affecting people across all of our communities. So thank you for acknowledging that. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeremy and he'll cover uh, kind of the current budget status. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Lucinda. Um, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the board, thank you for having me. I'm Jeremy Floyd. I am the Administrative Services Division Manager of Public Works. And I'm going to present to you the current status of the Flood Control District FY22 budget. And we're gonna begin with the FCD revenues by type. Uh, I kind of struggle with how to present this in a way uh, that's really comprehensible. Uh, Greg suggested that we did a stacked bar graph where we could compare the FY22 base budget, our original base budget, versus our post-disaster uh, base budget. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. And I'll start with the FY22 base. We had budgeted a uh, revenue of 37,305, and that's just a combination of interest, uh, plan review fees and grading fees. In addition to that, we budgeted $50,000 for a final reimbursement for the Schultz flooding uh, final payment. Uh, and then we had 4.7 million budgeted in recurring revenues uh, as a result of the levy from the rate, which we listed at the top right there. The current rate is two, uh, 0 0.2620 per hundred dollars in valuation. Moving into the uh, post-disaster based budget, you can see here uh, the true impact to our revenues. Uh, we're expecting to receive uh, federal grants in the amount of 7.2 million. And this fiscal year as well, we should be, re be receiving uh, some disaster reimbursements of 1.3 million. So those are the additional revenues on top of what we had already budgeted. And Greg, next slide. And this slide is the same, we take the same approach, but we're showing the expenditures this time. Uh, on this slide, and I'm having trouble seeing the bottom of the slide right now, but uh, on the left is the FY22 base, uh, and on the right, you can see we're bringing in, uh, or we're actually spending $10 million uh, on sediment reduction projects associated with those grant revenues. Uh, and then we have our standard forest restoration, our pre-flood prep, and our general operations are all basically staying the same. But we're taking the FY22 base budget and the expenditures from 4.4 million all the way up to 14.4 million. That gives us a difference of about $10 million in expenditures. Greg, next slide. And to break out so that we can really truly see what that, what that 10 million equates to, these are the different projects that we have lined out for that $10 million. And I can go through each one or Lucinda, you think it's best just to leave it up here for a second? So as you can see, uh, I have it budgeted at 1.3 million, 1.35 million for the museum flood response. 611,000 is the NRCS exigency project that we already completed. Then we have the NRCS uh, EWP project at 4 million. We have museum fire sediment reduction at 3.5 million. We have the Paradise Channel widening project at 126,000. And then we have 70,000 budgeted for the Upper Rio uh, to flag watershed study. In addition to that, we have the 105,000 for uh, the additional pre-flood prep projects that we have planned to get ready for uh, any, any pre-flood prep that we might need to do. Uh, and then 281,000 for museum sediment condition studies. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea, a picture, a snapshot of what that 10 million is made up of. Greg, and that oh. Museum fire sediment is the Forest Service project. The one in yellow is the 3.5 million from the Forest Service. And so we wanted to touch on a couple of key assumptions here. Uh, these are the assumptions associated with the revenue. Uh, now I am assuming that we're going to get 1.36 uh, million for FY19 and FY22 museum flood mitigation reimbursements. That's both from DEMA and DFFM. In this number, I do have included $450,000 in anticipated reimbursements from DEMA. These are associated with the FY19 museum flood. And we keep going back and forth with DEMA, trying to establish an understanding and, and see if we can get this reimbursed. 
in addition to that, we have the DFFM reimbursement for 861,000, where they're actually going to reimburse us for some expenditures associated with the current or the, the summer flooding. And that's gonna be an FY22 reimbursement as well. And this slide, I wanted to present to you what we're currently seeing or currently calling the funding gap. Uh, prior to the FY22 museum flood event, we did have an ending fund balance budgeted of a positive 653,000. When we figure in all of the additional expenditures that we pay for response and mitigation, uh, we're actually projecting a negative fund balance for fiscal year 22 in the amount of 740,000. And in that 740,000, I do have a revenue of 450,000 associated with that FY19 museum flood mitigation reimbursement from DEMA. So if that does not come through in fiscal year 22, then I expect that that funding gap is going to increase by that amount, uh, 1.1 million. Uh, it'll take the funding gap to 1.1 million. And we're going to address a lot of this uh, during our proposed FY23 budget discussions. So I would add to Jeremy, the word that we got today that will get reimbursed for the 784,000, that was not included in the budget at this time, right? That it was not, we just- I, We just literally got, got that, got that text, yeah. Right. Which yeah. is great, then, so. Right, yeah. so, so this again, this is kind of a snapshot in time of where we are within this fiscal year. Um, but I, you know, I think once, you know, and again, we're going to, go back and, and really make another effort to work with DEMA on getting the reimbursements, not only for the 19, 2019 investment that we made, but also uh, the expenditures from 21 and see if they can move those processes. As we know, those processes are all very slow. Um, so I think my sense is that with the reimbursement from DFFM, um, we'll still have some funding gap, uh, but it won't be as significant, certainly, as we had anticipated. So, all right, uh, next slide. So, um, so any, I guess let's go ahead. I think we don't have too many more slides. I think we only have a handful more slides. And then we, at the end, if there's questions about the financials, we can come back to those slides if we need to. So, uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Jay, and he's again going to just do a brief update today on forest restoration, really focusing on work over the last six months or so. And then on the first, he'll come back with a much more extensive presentation. So, Jay. All right. Thank you, Lucinda. Uh, thank you, Chair Ryan, members of the board. Um, so, just a quick background, I guess, uh, Matt, you and Lena can take a little break here. I'm going to recap the stuff you've heard probably a hundred times. You know, in 2018, the board, in response to a study that was done in the previous year from FEMA, as we looked at post-fire flooding, debris flows in the county, we identified Bill Williams Mountain as a high priority uh, to treat with forest restoration to prevent those fires and post-fire flooding. We also did a regional impact study uh, for economic impact that came out to 379 to 694 million dollar regional economic impact so as we focused on bill williams mountain we have been able to complete several projects uh, the steep slope one project that was 300 acres steep slope two that was 176 acres and we're just now working on steep slope three that will be 285 acres so we are, we are making progress. You can see the difference between the photo on the left and the photo on the right, um, as far as what it looks like pre-harvest and post-harvest. So today, as of today, the Flood Control District's funded $4.8 million on Bill Williams Mountain, and our partners, the Kaibab National Forest, the National Forest Foundation, Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management, they have all uh, contributed $4.94 million to date. With this funding that we have done, as Lucinda noted earlier, what we've done is set ourselves up now with this IIJA funding that's coming in, the infrastructure bill funding, that the Forest Service has, uh, the Kaibab has been able to leverage out of their own money, another $6.24 million for FY22, 
and they are asking for 6.24 million for the next four years to finish the project. So we would be done funding uh, after this this FY22, uh, or we'll, we're going to do two million dollars in FY22 that was built in our budget. You'll see on the next slide, and then um, we have one more year of two million dollar funding. And we will have met the 20% match that they require. And we will be done funding. It's going to save the flood control district about $4 million overall from what we thought we were going to have to spend. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So here's a breakdown for FY22 funding. We spent a million dollars uh, July, early July, right when we turned into the new fiscal year because of last year's needing to borrow some money out of my budget to cover some of the museum flood response and mitigation work. We, we split my budget and, and added a million dollars to the previous Bill Williams project. This year we have budgeted $2 million for what we're gonna call Steep Slope 3, which is the 285 acre project that will begin this, uh, this late summer fall. And then we have $290,000 that was slated for uh, reintroducing the REPI grant in the Lake Mary watershed. It looks like we're going to run maybe 250 to 290. We don't know exactly yet. And what's good about, uh, about the, the REPI grant is by redoing that, the Forest Service has put in their budget some separate funds for REPI. And the REPI is the Department of Defense grant that we applied for a couple of years ago were not successful. We reapplied this year, made it through the first round. So now we have, we're gonna be submitting our final proposal in March of this year. If we're successful, we're gonna leverage $6.75 million from the Forest Service and $6.5 million from the Depart Department of Defense to treat 5,363 acres in that Lake Mary watershed, which is in Supervisor uh, or Director Begay's district um, and protect that watershed, protect part of Mormon Mountain, and then that NPOI or you know, NPOI uh, telescope on Anderson Mesa. So that's where we're going to be at as far as the work that we're doing this year. We also completed the Oak Creek watershed study uh, that J.E. Fuller done. They are completing that now. I should be reviewing that next month. Um, and then we'll get the final data out to everyone. So we're, we're going to be getting that done. And then uh, the last thing that, that the board may be interested in is our air curtain burner. Uh, we will be utilizing our air curtain burner this year on some of the uh, museum watershed restoration work, getting rid of the biomass. So uh, the district ranger has asked us to utilize our, our air curtain burner there uh, to help with that. And we also have it slated to work on a grant that uh, we are doing through emergency management on work in Munns Park, Chena Village, and Forest Highlands on some uh, fuels reduction projects and getting rid of the biomass that way. So we are going to be utilizing the air curtain burner this year. And that's it for me. Great. Thank you, Jay. And Jay's just done a tremendous job working with the Forest Service and and other partners, DFFM and um, other entities, SRP, uh, to put together what I know you'll find is gonna be a, a really robust plan and um, one that's really gonna continue to maximize um, our ability to leverage funds, which is really exciting. So um, just uh, lastly here, this is the last slide, just a future kind of outlook here Obviously, big focus right now is bringing forward uh, through engineering and construction the museum watershed restoration projects. And then again, Jay will be back on the first with more detail and discussion on the forest restoration strategic plan. And really, you know, a lot of the, the, the points made here on this slide are um, we've got a unique opportunity and uh, to, to really um, be proactive and to invest in restoration. So we don't continue to invest funds in uh, re all this response and mitigation efforts. And, and that's really key because someday we want to return to being a more 
I guess, traditional flood control district and one that can focus, continue to focus, I think, on the long term on forest restoration because all those acres will need to be maintained as well. But certainly the cost of that will be much less than the than the restoration costs and and allow us to to invest in 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 a flood mitigation or FEMA floodplains and and potentially other areas in our county as well. So so with that, uh, Chair, thank you for your attention today, uh, directors, and uh, be happy to entertain any comments or questions. Okay, let's swing into comments or questions. And I just want to, one additional comment here before we leap in. You know, uh, Vice Chair recognized that the efforts that have gone on, and we just have an amazing team. Um, you know, Jeremy's done a phenomenal job tracking all these different funding uh, sources and the reimbursements. I mean, I don't know if anybody has any idea about the complexity of these processes and and the bureaucracy and nuances to them. And he's just done a phenomenal job managing all that, he and his team, um, as well as, of course, Christopher and all the technical efforts and, uh, you know, managing a lot of the communication with the residents that have been most heavily impacted um, and, and just dealing with the myriad of the issues that, that come up during these kinds of emergencies. And, and Jay and and you know people also need to know that Jay serves as a flood flood director during you know the flood season as well. Like he stepped in, he didn't say, "My job's forest restoration. You all figure out that flood stuff." He's jumped right in and always supported from day one. Didn't ask, showed up, did whatever he could to support the EOC, support the effort. So we just have a phenomenal team, and I, I appreciate you recognizing that. Um, thank you very much. And we appreciate the relationship, you know, with the city and really appreciate Scott and Andy being on today. We, you know, um, they have a Herculean effort ahead of them within the city and we all do uh, to address this situation. So thank you for, for joining us today. All right. Well, an opportunity for uh, uh, supervisors comments. I see, uh, uh, let's see, Supervisor Horseman. And, and if I if I don't see you guys, it's because uh, I can't see the whole panel. So give me a heads up if you're reaching out. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Chair. And, and I have a question. Then I have a comment. But my my question is that you know Chief Moore, when uh, he was here, and of course made his announcement in the commitment to the 54 million dollars of funding as a part of the Four Fry uh, initiative, and um, and one of, of course, the area of priorities, one of the very first area of priorities is the Bill Williams Mountain. So when you were going through the, the numbers, um, it, does this include the commitment that they've made? Or are we still waiting for their commitment and how much? So the only, uh, thank you for that question. Um, the only thing we have committed from them is this FY22 6.24 million that they, uh, that they will be bringing in and that will help us start the 285 acres of this last, the steep slope three. And it will also give some seed money to the, the next, the final 812 acres that we have to treat on the north side of that those steep slope. So once we give our $2 million next year for FY23, which is what I'll talk about next week, then they have asked for, through, through our commitment and us bringing in 20% cost share, because the total bill is going to be close to, $25 million once we get done with all of it. We'll net our 20%. They are then asking for 6.24 million in FY23, 24, and the big 25 to get them to get that the final number done. So so in other words, there's hopefully more down the line for us to complete some of these projects. Yeah, so what what this means is that if they live up to what they want to do, what the Kyra is asking, they will have they will complete the project. We won't have to put any more money for the project after next year, and it will be paid for and, and completed probably by FY26, all the work. Yeah. Yep. So I don't have to stay up at night worrying about Bill Williams Mountain anymore. I got to worry about the San Francisco Peaks. Yeah, the west side of San Francisco Peaks is next. Okay, okay. good. So, and, and, you and know, we'll I address the upper Rio next week as well. Yeah. 
So yeah, that's then the flood watershed protection project, and and uh, yeah. So my my, my comment is that um, we have Coconino County has uh, been extremely fortunate in that we have been able to bring in a substantial amount of federal funds, uh, both uh, from um, uh, the Four Fry initiative as announced, but also in the um, uh, monies from the Department of Agriculture and NRCS, uh, both emergency as well as ongoing for the sediment reduction. And, uh, you know, it's it's amazing that, that we truly have been able to leverage a tremendous amount of money to accomplish uh, quite a bit of forest restoration and flood mitigation work here for our community. And, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that and acknowledge the work that has been done uh, by our county staff uh, and the expertise shown probably because of, of the learning experience of Schultz uh, to be able to get it done. Uh, and you know, this is something I think it is important to let our community know. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, just between the four fry and the other, uh, you know, uh, well over um, what, uh, 12, 12, 13, 14 million dollars that have been brought into the community to assist us in, in our project. So uh, that's fa uh, fabulous. Um, and, you know, a, a huge congratulations to our county team and to our partner at the city. And, you know, certainly it has been a combined effort, especially dealing with the flood mitigation efforts uh, and will continue to be uh, dealing with the flood mitigation efforts. So. Uh, you know, thanks, Andy, if you're still on and your your great team over there at the city. And, and I also want to assure the chair that uh, there have been for the last, well, almost the last year, it seems, um, there have been ongoing outreach uh, uh, with the public uh, in these neighborhoods and especially in the flood affected areas that both um, uh, Supervisor Vasquez and, and myself with the city and the county staff. Uh, and there just have been numerous public meetings and will continue to be. And it has been very much a joint communication effort. And you're right, Chair, sometimes it's also an education effort saying, this is the role of the county and this is the role of the city. And, and I know that's when people are in need, they don't care what entity it is, they just want it done. So sometimes that's frustrating, uh, but it has been a joint effort and a, a joint uh, communication uh, process with the city and some of our city elected officials uh, and city council and the mayor, uh, and, as well as uh, with the county. So um, uh, rest assured um, that message has gotten out there and will continue to get out there. So thank you. Yeah, and, and just quickly on that, uh, yeah, I was looking uh, as they develop the new website, that coordination, and, and just as like you said, you know, it's so critical that the communication has happened so far. It'll get more sophisticated depending upon who's doing which project uh, of what happens. Uh, the one piece on the Bill Williams piece that uh, uh, a big difference is um, we were basically begging the Forest Service to bring money in before. Uh, and we're pretty much carrying the, the burden on it. Uh, this is good information as it relates to that, uh, which will if we can make those savings, it's it's other areas that that money can be moved over to, which would be really good too. Okay, uh, let me let me go ahead and keep uh, rolling on with other super, uh, supervisor Vasquez, Veronica. Yeah, uh, thank you. I really appreciate this presentation on forest restoration. Um, thank you, uh, Jay, and your team, and and all the work that that all the team at, at Public Works and in the Flood Control District have done. Uh, I really see the, the uh, forest restoration as part of the prevent to avoid any future flooding problems, you know, and those steep slope areas that, that you're hitting are those critical spots that'll, that'll prevent uh, catastrophic flooding as we've seen from the museum fire. And so uh, I just really commend you in, in your efforts. And, and I, I had the opportunity to go out in November to see the helicopter remove some of the trees off the steep slopes of, of Bill Williams Mountain. And it's quite an operation and it's difficult. And so it's encouraging to hear that we're gonna have the funding and the resources to be able to move forward and get that, get that uh, restoration as needed. And uh, hopefully I'm really looking forward to seeing what uh, the, 
Paseo de Flag and, and the western slope of, of the peaks looks like in terms of the timeline, because that is a major concern. And, and, and so uh, really want to please uh, ask if you could please keep us in the loop and, and kind of give us those kind of uh, timelines to what to expect moving forward. Thank you. Sorry, and you're not looking for the response on the timelines you're suggesting. No, because I think Jay's presenting on that next week. So, but okay. I just want to kind of give the idea that uh, as we're moving forward, looking at the project, it'd be helpful for us to know uh, what, in, in terms of timelines, what to expect in FY 22, 23, 24. So there's not uh, those kind of those expectations, so that so that people can be educated about the process to get there. So we can be doing the rest of the peaks as we're doing Mount uh, Bill Williams Mountain now. Thank you. And then Supervisor Begay. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of good work going being done and a lot of um, team effort, uh, county, city, and the staff are knowledgeable. And wow, I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, you know, I wish we could help um, um, the Navajo Nation in certain aspects of our work from the county, you know, just in, 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 in something like this. And but unfortunately, we can't, you know, and it, it really it, it bothers me. And it, it bothers me because um, I have fam I have people that vote in the county that you know really need woods out there, and you know and what are we doing with these woods? You know, is there uh, schedules or is there is there ways that the people that need woods and within the county come and get woods? Um, or, you know, how can we deliver some or, you know, because right now with all the uh, pandemic issues that are going on, I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, you know, it, even the twig, it seems so much, you know, they appreciate those things out there because we have no no forest lands, no nothing. And, you know, we the, the closest that people get woods is probably uh, Grand Canyon. And from coal mine to Grand Canyon, I, pro I probably would say it's about a good two hour drive and so I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, you know, that's how fortunate, you know, and um, and 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 I think, you know, um, it, it, I don't know, I, I, but I just want to say thank you. But you know, that's what was I was thinking to uh, do this uh, presentation. But um, I just want to say again, you know, thank you to everyone. And oh, the other question I had was. There was a um, FCD funding gap that was presented to us, and and the fund balance was six hundred fifty three thousand for FY twenty two, and um, there and for um, to uh, I think it was seven hundred forty thousand. It would be in the red at one point in time, and then if this work is not reimbursed, you know, then we're going to have a one point one um, million type of a um, uh, being in the red. So. I was just wondering how that offset was going to um, be taken care of if you know we don't get reimbursed right away. You know, with the with this funding, that was one question. But I just want to say, you know, it's it's good, and um, and I'm I'm just glad that you know uh, we're 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 helping you know uh, part of the county, and that you know it's it's something that you know it's it's something that's good because everybody's in there all together, you know, trying to work together and. Get things done even for the communities um, that that that's being served. So I just want to say thank you to all everyone, the center, your staff. Um, you, you have knowledgeable staff, the city, the um, others. You know, people that have been giving us money. You know, um, approving funds for us. You know, I'm very thankful for that. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a couple things. I'll let Jay speak to the, the wood because there's a great partnership going on there. Um, but uh, relative to the to the funding gap, you know, we'll come back during the budget process and discuss that. But um, and this may or may not be what you want to hear. But when we went through a similar disaster with Schultz, we actually ran a, a deficit in the flood control district for, I think, seven or eight years. And, um, you know, Siri and I and Jeremy have had a lot of discussion about this. I'll have Siri comment on it, but um, I, I actually think we're going to be in pretty good shape coming out of this year, um, given the money that we have secured. So 
Um, but these reimbursements are part of what's at play and there will be cash flow dynamics because we go expend the funds, then we get reimbursed by NRCS and the US Forest Service. So there's that dynamic as well, the cash flow dynamic. But Siri, do you want to comment? Uh, sure. Thank you, Lucinda. Um, thank you, Chair and members of the board. So yes, the, the timing and the delay of the reimbursements is impactful, especially to cash flow, as Lucinda had mentioned. Um, but because we see them coming in eventually and we see that turning around to a positive, um, we didn't have concerns uh, as we reviewed this, Lucinda and Jeremy and I, going into today's uh, discussion. What happens in effect when we do have a gap between how we end the year in terms of cash in the flood control district and receivables that are coming in from those delayed reimbursements is that in effect, we do cover it with county general funds as sort of a temporary cash flow loan, um, not an official loan, um, but we, we cover the shortfall, if you will, in the cash flow because it is recognized as a receivable. So the fund balance on paper is still flush because it's money coming in as a receivable, um, but we do cover the cash then with general funds. Thank you, Siri. And I think it's important to note too that we haven't touched the county general fund emergency reserve. So that's also a good thing to date. We haven't had to touch that. We thought we were going to have to when this started, but so far we have not had to. So Jay, do you want to speak to the, the firewood? Sure, thank you. Um, so Vice Chair Fowler had also brought this, this question up to me and I've been reaching out to the Forest Service to try to get some quick answers from them. Uh, as well as National Forest Foundation, they, they created that Woods for Life program that delivered, I don't, I, I don't have the number of how many tons of, of firewood that they delivered out to Cameron and Tuba City and other areas across Navajo Nation and, and Hopi Tribe uh, this last fall. But they are getting, the National Forest Foundation is getting ready to start a pro project probably as early as next month uh, over by Mormon Lake and they're going to have firewood that's going to be available free for pickup uh, there at Mormon Lake area. Um, and I'll get you more information on that. But I also have reached out to the, the lady that's in charge of the Forest Service on these programs, these firewood programs, to see if we can get more um, or other areas that, that, that people can go to to get firewood. So we're working on that to try to, try to fill that gap. I wanted to let you know that. And I know the Forest Service is very committed to these partnerships and developing more of these partnerships. And so I expect to see more opportunity for that. All right, uh, let's see, Vice Chair Fowler, Lena. Thank you. Uh, it's just amazing to see before and after photos from the uh, Bill Williams. Uh, you know, these, these are, these are such important projects that if you don't see it, then you only see the disaster. So um, it's been a county mission to uh, really address the issues before the issue really starts. <laughs> and it is an issue, even though you don't really see it as an issue, it's just beautiful force out there. But if it's too thick, it's too thick. Um, and we can see what happens in, in our, um, just right uh, in the city of Flagstaff right now when, when the forest and then flood comes through. Um, this is a huge issue that is facing the Western states right now. Um, and I guess with the more of the climate change that is, that's gonna really impact more uh, with the drought that's happening, even the, with the drought, it's impact uh, our own lake pile that is in, in our county um, and just having a huge economic impact. So these, these natural disasters are um, really have an impact on personal lives and also the, it's an economic impact um, so it's really good that we are addressing it. Um, Lake Mary has been on the um, calendar for some time in various ways. So I'm really happy that that one is, is come up as well as Anderson Mesa um, and being addressed as, uh, and uh, that one 
those two have been waiting. And then the western side of the, of the mountain, um, there was going to be a helicopter project that was going to take place. Has that taken place? Or is that part of another project that already happened? Was, I'm trying to um, stay attuned from the distance. And there's so many moving parts I, um, that I kind of lose track of where, where you all are at. And you guys are so in tune with what you're doing. Um, I'm sure that you kind of have a hard time getting your nose out of the book, so to speak, so, you know. I've been reading a lot lately, so I have to use that book thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to hire you as my next uh, campaign manager for, for Forest Inspiration, Chair Feller, Vice Chair Feller. But uh, so the helicopter uh, that was left that was in the Dry Lake Hills area around surrounding the, the museum fire star, uh, we did a study and showed that there really wasn't enough impact of so few acres. So they, the Forest Service has decided not to do that. Um, because it wouldn't make enough of an impact on that watershed. Uh, but the FWPP project is still continuing to sell uh, timber, uh, some sales, thinning areas in the Schultz Pass area to, to do work this year. So there will be work being done in the Bucca Rio watershed this year. Uh, I think it's close to 800 acres that FWPP will be doing in funding. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll kind of all gang up on it starting in FY23 that I'll tell you about next week. Yeah, and certainly, you know, Jay, maybe we should pull together a, a report work with Neil over at the city to pull together a map that shows what FWPP's accomplished and then what remains to be accomplished under FWPP as well as showing and what's remaining in the upper Rio, because I think my memory, Jay, correct me if I'm wrong, it's like another 18,000, like there's 18,000 total acres. Yeah, there's, um, there's 18,000 acres that are non-steep slope that are planned to be treated over the next several years within the upper Rio watershed. So getting off the steep slopes in that western slope of the mountain and getting uh, on either side of Highway 180 and some other areas, so they, they have 18,000 acres on the books ready to, to start planting timber sales. So he can share that next week and give you a little bit more detail. And, and then the acres that we're focused on, of course, are the steep slope, which are the ones that contribute the most to the post wildfire flooding. And unfortunately, of course, are also the most costly to thin, but and remove the dead and down, which is really critical in these areas. There's just massive amounts of dead and down. So, yeah. And um, the, I'm I'm happy that you'll be using the burner again because uh, you know that was. I'm hoping that there is still a partnership with the Forest Service and others that may be able to, I don't know, use and have a partnership in that sense because. I think that was um, that was the idea when when we approved that to to purchase that. So, but I just want to thank you again just for your work. I just think that just is just amazing, just the um, amount of work and the detail, the engineering. I mean, this is just um, a lot of numbers that are flowing, and we don't you don't report on all those numbers, but I know they're all numbers, and this is the reason why. We need our students and education to really get involved in the STEM, STEM and um, trying to see, you know, it might be some way, I don't know how, at some point to uh, do a presentation in the school system to say, you know, I'm an engineer and this is what it means to be an engineer. This is what I'm doing to save your community. Um, it might be something, an educational opportunity or else maybe do a video where Christopher is standing there. And, <laughs> and uh, it's just, I just think that it's a, a great, we talk about a community, but we were, we're in need of professionals. Um, maybe do a video for, or meet with the NAU or something. I know they have great programs and CCC and partner with them as an educational opportunity. 
Um, we're talking about how it's hard. We have heart to fill positions that we never thought they'd be hard to fill positions. And how do we attract um, people back back to our region to be able to, you know, groom the next generation coming up? And how do you do that? I mean, the introduction of such these very interesting, very complex um, issues, I think, is a really great way to do that. And it, uh, it, even with our health department and all the other departments, we, we as a county, we do so much for our communities. And yet, um, sometimes I think they don't really see it all because it is such a vast organization that is doing such complex work with great partnerships. There's no, you know, when you're in public service, you don't just work at your desk and that's it. But you're fanned out into the community and other expertise. Um, so I just find it just uh, uh, fascinating to see this, this, the systemic work and systems thinking is where this comes in. You know, I mean, talk about the, the systems thinking theory and just really applying that, that methodology that is there and just the various methodologies that is at work that you hear about when you're um, a grad graduate student or something, you know, you start talking about systems and you know the, all the vast systems that are applied. You don't see that until you're really at work, and that's what you're all doing. And I just think it's part of a great educational opportunity, which we get to see and we get to um, you know learn about and actually watch it and play. And I just find it fascinating. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, County Manager, Steve, Lucinda, and the whole team. What a great team. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, just noting, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be quick with mine, but just noting uh, Scott Overton wrote, uh, uh, thank you for kind words. It's essential we work together. Scott's from the city of Flagstaff. And the system is seen as one. Uh, it's been solid and we have made excellent progress together. This mitigation will result in a safer community and more reasonable response by our public works teams. Uh, thank you for leading the way from Scott Overton. And uh, yeah, best working together with you, Scott. You don't want to come back? <laughs> uh, just teasing. But um, a couple of quick uh, uh, notes. Uh, cash flow, I was going to ask that question. Thanks for uh, answering that. Um, uh, just a note. Uh, you know, you know, I know the answer, but uh, while we haven't touched the emergency reserve of the general fund uh, uh, for the county, we we have uh, we have consumed the uh, emergency sir, uh, reserve for the flood control district, have we not? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, we were fortuitous last year in suggesting that uh, we beef it up. Uh, and yet you, you see the type of reserve that we really need for these type of emergencies. It's, it's not uh, enough uh, associated with it. So it's one that you know, we wanna keep considering for the future uh, associated with that. Um, uh, just a note on the uh, same, you know, I, I, I think I'll hop on to the uh, uh, air current burners uh, also uh, with the forest resiliency, the idea of, uh, uh, trying to use those uh, when we have an opportunity within uh, communities so that we don't have a California or a Colorado happening. Uh, you know, absolutely. I hope we continue to move in that way where it seems practical uh, to go ahead and do that. And then, you know, the thing that I, I feel as though we're seeing with the uh, uh, these efforts is uh, while there's, you know, when work was happening on the forest, uh, you know, they're, they're, yes, they were working on the wildland urban interface, the WUI, um, but uh, these high uh, cost uh, timber, you know, low value uh, wood, uh, the threats when they burn that can flood communities uh, hadn't been happening until these efforts had been taking place. So, uh, you know, many compliments on uh, everybody working together and where we've got you know, associated with this. And, uh, you know, that's all I have, but, uh, uh, any wrap up on this, uh, Lucinda? I just want to thank everyone again and thank the board for their support. I mean, your support has been 
crucial to this entire effort and the communications that you've had with with our congressional delegation that has been extremely supportive. Um, they've just, everyone has stepped up to take their roles and influence the outcome to achieve what we've achieved to date. And we have a lot more to achieve, um, uh, particularly in the forest restoration arena, but I think we're really well positioned um, to, to take that forward. And as you mentioned, uh, chair, the, there's also funding in the infrastructure bill for the community wildfire reduction. And, um, you know, we're working now to start positioning our communities to be able to take advantage of that too. We'll be holding a meeting with um, the fire, the fire district chiefs to talk about that, bringing in um, uh, Nick Matea and from Senator Kelly's office who actually wrote that piece of the legislation and uh, to, to really get their attention and have them start budgeting and planning uh, to be able to work with that funding to get more thinning done within the communities themselves and utilize our air curtain burner to support those projects. And, and uh, we will be launching a, a project um, in Mountain Dallas, or excuse me, Mountain Air as, or I don't know, Munns Park, uh, and Kachina Village, and you'll hear more about that later. We hope to, you know, to move forward that we've got the funding now from DEMA. So, so we're excited to take that forward as well, working with um, emergency management. So, thank you. Okay. With that, uh, we'll go ahead. And, uh, that should wrap us up. We're a little, little over time, but very important topic. Uh, uh, and to be continued, as noted, we'll have a presentation next week associated with this. Um, so um, uh, next piece uh, that we have is associated with uh, uh, road districts. So we need to resolve is the uh, Board of Supervisors. I need an action to do so. A motion. I move that we resolve as the Road district. That. No, it's the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> the Board of Supervisors. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said that district. <laughs> okay, I have a motion by uh, uh, Vice Chair Fowler, a second by uh, uh, Director uh, Vasquez. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Okay. Aye. And that puts us into acting in the capacity of the Board of Supervisors. Um, how are we doing? Do we need uh, uh, five minutes or you want to go into this right away here? Is that a nod on? No, we can go, let's go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to roll. Okay. Uh, and after this next presentation, we'll take five for everybody. Uh, okay. So, Steve, do you want to kick this off or are we going right to loosen on this? Uh, we'll go um, just quickly. The uh, road districts is a topic that we've, we have not visited in a while. Um, of course, that's based on activity from our communities uh, in organizing uh, these types of community-focused uh, solutions. And so today we are going over some of the adjustments that we're proposing on policies that will, uh, will again, kind of keep up to, to times in terms of what's happening. But again, uh, Lucinda is going to be presenting uh, the district presentation. Um, is some, some districts, some of the board districts, uh, you know, may not see a road district activity as often as others. And in fact, some may not see it at all. But again, it's one of those community-based solutions and it is truly a community-based solution that provides for the opportunity for, for uh, needs to be discussed and, and escalated at the community level to us. So Lucinda, to you. Okay, uh, before we hop on, you know, I'm, I'm here to request for a bio break uh, uh, on it. Well, we, we can go on, everybody's, uh, I, you know, we, we have people in the background that need support also. So if we take five minutes and then come back uh, at 2.50 uh, for this, that would be really good. Thank you. We're right back.
Yeah, people can pop up on the screen just so we know you're out there when you get back. That's just it. There's a tree sat there. I see me out there. Let's see. Nurse Steve. And then we have uh, Geronimo and Judy that we're waiting. There's Geronimo. Maybe another minute for Judy. And get rolling. Okay, and there's Judy. Okay, we have the full board here, and Steve's in here. Uh, we're back to recording. And so the uh, uh, next item on the agenda, as uh, uh, noted, would be uh, a presentation discussion, possible direction regarding the road district policy changes. And we have our deputy county manager, uh, Lucinda Andriani, uh, presenting on this. Lucinda. Oh, great. Thank you, Chair and, and uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, I think Sean is going to go ahead and pull up the presentation here, but some background first. Um, you know, the, um, go ahead, Sean, go to the next slide. Uh, we'll kind of cover a number of topics today, do some background because as, as, as the chair noted, we haven't had much conversation about this yet with, with this board. Um, so we'll talk about the background on road districts. We'll cover uh, what is the current landscape relative to road districts. And then uh, proposed uh, staff is proposing some revisions to our county road district policies uh, that have really come out of our experience. And then um, making sure that, that these policies are in alignment with the subdivision ordinance as well as our um, uh, Prop 403 uh, funding goals and so forth. So, and then we'll talk about what the next steps are going to be. Go ahead, Sean, to the next slide here. So, as I mentioned, I think the, the real goal here is to, is to try to get this alignment in place with the engineering standards as well as the subdivision ordinance and really to develop an overall cost-effective road maintenance strategy over the long term for the county and, and meet the expectations that were created through Prop 403 in terms of uh, taxpayer and road users' expectations um, for a level of maintenance that can be performed on the roads and um, 
And uh, another aspect of that in terms particularly related to the subdivision ordinance and, and allowing for roads within a subdivision to be um, uh, created and maintained through a, through a district um, and or a road association or a homeowner association, which would uh, then contribute to uh, lower cost housing options. So, um, you know, there's kind of a number of motivations why, why that this is coming forward. And it's been something that um, is, has been in the making for quite some time going back. I'll have to ask Jake Grissman how many years it goes back that we started the discussion with the prior board about the subdivision ordinance revisions and updating the engineering design standards, but at least five to six years probably. So uh, next slide, Sean. So what are road districts? So we typically think about county districts, you know, we think about the flood control districts that we just had the conversation about. We think about the jail district, we think about the public health services district. And they're districts formed where, where the board sits as the board of directors and, and they're put into place really to be in existence um, for, per, in per, you know, I would say in perpetuity, although the taxing mechanisms have to be renewed relative to those, um, not for public health, but the other two. And so, but to think about these, think about they are special taxing districts. And some actually, it's interesting, they call them special taxing districts because some like road districts actually can't tax, they assess. And there is an actual statutory difference between a tax and assessment. Um, and then some special districts like water districts, we you know, went through a process with Blue Ridge where they formed a new domestic water improvement district. They can actually tax, they can assess and tax, they can levy fees. So they all are different, but there's this fundamental notion um, here, and this is across the country, this isn't only in Arizona, although I think Arizona has been more focused on districts providing typical um, uh, government type services more so than many other states where these special districts do provide specific services. Um, and there, it's important to understand that, that in terms of roads, it's a way that an area, either an area where um, they currently have private roads that they want to improve the condition of that road and or improve the maintenance of that road, um, that, that those people can join together. This is all a citizen-driven process where those citizens can come together and decide that they want to improve their roadway um, or improve the level of service that they're being provided on that roadway. It also can be applied, a district can overlay a current county maintained road as well, where if, if the level of service that we can't, that we're providing now, and this is particularly true in a lot of outlying areas where we have primitive roads that we do a, a very basic level of maintenance where people may want to join together to fund additional improvements and, a, and, a, and or additional level of maintenance. So um, it, it can apply in kind of both situations, both where the roads are owned privately or where the roads are maintained by the county but they want a higher level of service. And when you form a district like this, a special taxing district, and the formation is a decision by the Board of Supervisors, as it was with the DWIT, it's the same with the road districts, it is a decision by the Board of Supervisors. It is a separate government under the state of Arizona. So it, it, it follows the same state rules. Uh, they do have their own set of statutes that identify what their authorities are. Um, and in the case of, of road districts, there's two different types that we'll talk about. Um, but with most of the special districts, they have their own board of directors. The board, of, the board of supervisors do not sit as the board of directors. They have their own board of directors and they make all their own fiduciary financial decisions um, taxing decisions and so forth, because they are a separate entity. So any time that the board is either acting 
you know, as you understand, when you're the flood control district, you're acting under a separate set of authorities and statutes. So it's very, very much the same as a road when you serve as a road district board of directors as well. So next slide, Sean. So there are two types of road districts um, that are that are allowed under the statutes. One type is called a road improvement district or a county improvement district for the purpose of roads. And that type of district, um, again, it's a citizen driven process, but that citizen driven process basically brings a set of petitions to the board, board of supervisors and petitions the board to form a district. And with this type of district, the intent of that citizen group is to uh, build a roadway to the county engineering standards. And then what if in fact it is constructed to those standards, then typically that road then would be conveyed to the county for future maintenance. So, so um, you know, a group of citizens that would get together, they would decide that they want to invest in the improvements. They, for, they identify what's the area of the district, they set the boundaries of the district, and they set what, you know, what they're going to do to achieve meeting the county engineering standards with the ultimate goal of that roadway improvement, that area of road being conveyed to the county and entering the county road maintenance system. And when these statutes were, were put into place, uh, gee, back in, I think it was probably back in the 80s and 90s, um, the county experienced a set of areas where citizens did move forward uh, with pursuing county, what were called county improvement districts or county road improvement districts. And um, we had a number of those come forward. I was between 10 and about probably about 15 in total came forward, areas came forward. Um, and certainly the chair can speak to this was the case um, in, in both Kachina and Mountaineer. In those areas, um, we were maintaining the roads, uh, they, but they were all dirt and people wanted the roads to be paved. And so they went through a process and basically what it's doing is it's, it's saying to the board of supervisors, we want to create these improvements. We're going to pay for them ourselves. Um, and we want you to form a district and the district really is formed in effect to finance that investment so that it can be paid off. Not all have to be paid in one lump sum. Everybody writes a check, but it can be paid off over a, a term. And um, so there were a number of districts that went forward at that time, and um, um, and some were constructed to sound, county standards and were were done as maintenance districts, which I'll cover next. And some were done as at meeting the county standards. Quite a few were done to meet the county standards, and most of these, of course, the almost every single one was done in areas that are more heavily developed, like Kachina. Um, there were se several out in the Timberline area, um, Mountaineer, that, that was really the areas. Uh, there was one out in the Doni, two out in the Doni Park area um, that did this. And in the case of a, a road improvement district, it's, it's time dated, meaning the Board of Supervisors actually does sit as the Board of Directors for that district. And it's time dated because basically you sit as the district Board of Directors for the term that it takes to engineer the project, construct the project, and then collect the assessments to then pay off the district. And you might remember I'm trying to remember if it was earlier this year. Siri would probably remember whether it was earlier this year or last year. Um, it may be prior to your some of your, your newer terms, but certainly supervisors um, Ryan and Fowler will remember that we've dissolved almost all those districts now are dissolved, meaning they've paid off their debts. And um, once that occurs, then they are dissolved. They no longer exist as a governmental entity because, again, those roads came into the county road system. 
the legislature, and this was actually prompted by, uh, by a lot of work by this county and primarily um, Supervisor Tom Chapin at the time, advocated that there also be the opportunity for citizens to come together and form what's called road maintenance districts. So if there were more rural areas that did not want to have to meet the county standard, they wanted to construct a road, make improvements to a road that they, these citizens were using, but do it to a lesser standard, that there was that opportunity to do that. And what that means though, is that road district, it is there then managed and directed by a local independent board from that district. Those, those board members must be live within that district and be an elector within that district. And, um, and then that, that district manages the maintenance in perpetuity as well. So it allows them an opportunity to invest less money, both in the maintenance and the improvements um, so because they aren't meeting the county standards. So again, their, their districts, the formation process is really the same. They petition the board. The board of supervisors still has to decide, is it is it in the public benefit? And when you say public benefit, it isn't just to the benefit of those residing in that area proposed for the district. It's you have to, your job as a board of supervisors is to look at the entire county and say, is this in the interest of the entire county to form this district or not? And that, that's the decision ultimately that you're making. Is it, is it in the benefit, not only of those people that are in the proposed district, um, but those that um, that reside outside of the district, because we, you know, there is a road system in this county, and will it effectuate improvement overall? Does it benefit the others? And so we'll get more into that a little bit later, um, because there are impacts to maintenance to current roadways that we maintain in terms of how we invest in, in districts. So next slide, Sean. But again, big difference, the, probably the primary difference, again, in road maintenance versus a road improvement district is, where is who maintains that road in the, in, in the long term? And then who sits as the board of directors? So today we're gonna focus a lot on, on road maintenance districts. And um, the reason for that is that even before uh, we, you know, had the discussions, had Prop 14, 403 and had the discussions and, and made modifications to the subdivision ordinance and the engineering standards, um, for many, many years, there had been very limited interest in county improvement districts for, road, for the purpose of roads, road, road improvement districts. Um, we've, and, and frankly, since 2010, we haven't had anybody even approach us about doing a county improvement district. Um, there have been very limited interest. We, we have had some, again, limited interest as well for county road maintenance districts. And we do have one that's moving forward. There's a, a, a group of residents out in the Fernwood area, which is near Timberline, who have brought forward petitions and submitted those to the clerk. And Lindsay's now moving through a process and, and assuming all those boxes get checked off to meet the statutory requirements, that will be coming to you for a, a decision to establish a road maintenance district. But this is the first one that's even gotten close. We had the last one was formed, I believe it was 2008, right before the Great Recession. And it was out in this same similar area, not this area, but a similar area is the one that's now being proposed. And they came back to the board in 2010 or 2011 and asked to have the district suspended in effect. And um, they reimbursed the county for any of the upfront costs that had been, it had been actually engineered, um, but they made a decision based on what had happened with their property values in the Great Recession. Session and, and frankly, the, uh, the post flooding from Schultz made a decision they did not want to move forward. And that district, I think, was dissolved either this year or last year. Um, so we've had very little activity on this arena, but we do 
we will occasionally get inquiries and we, we meet with them and walk through what's involved. It's a fairly involved process to form a district because it's very, it's all statute driven. Um, and we likely will see developers moving this direction in the future, new developments, because this is an option for a new developer as well. And, and many of the areas um, and other, other counties, uh, this is how develop roads within developments are routinely established and maintained is through road maintenance district. So, um, so the minimum on a road maintenance district is the state fire code, which basically is an all weather service surface. It's not pavement. It, it can be like an ABC or just an all weather surface. And, and it, the road width and so forth is all determined by traffic volume and turnarounds for fire service. So um, these roads are much more typical of what you would see in a very more rural area or areas again, where you, you have unpaved service, surfaces now. And um, next slide, Sean. So the road maintenance district formation process, um, again, it's a property owner or citizen driven process. They're required to secure a, a certain number of signatures on petitions. They have to have 51% of, of those living within the district, and it can be by property or it can be by number of parcels. It's all prescribed in the statute that have to submit. Now, historically, we've always encouraged anyone coming forward with a district to secure at least up to 70% of petitions from those that are identified within the property boundaries. And those property boundaries of this road maintenance district um, are prescribed by that set of citizens. They define the boundaries. And typically, it should represent those who get a benefit from the district, so those utilizing that roadway. Important to understand that relative to that, that the district has to secure all the easements that underlie that road. So if currently, um, it's a private road, and um, even if the roads are dedicated to the public, they are not dedicated to the district and or to the county, that they have to then establish that easements. So easements have to be transferred. And uh, for road maintenance districts, for example, this one coming forward, Annika Lane, we've worked out a process with the county attorney whereby people can, can commit their easements and that there's a documentation that goes into, they work with a title company and the title company then secures those, um, those documents in an escrow account. And then once the districts inform those form, those will all be transferred over to the district. So important thing to understand is that the district has to have legal access to the entire roadway being maintained. So unlike a water, dist a water improvement district where you can have discontinuous connection, you know, where you might have a parcel and have two parcels that aren't in the district and then six parcels that are in and three parcels that are out. Yeah, um, you have to have contigu a contiguous area in effect. At least you have to have a contiguous set of easements uh, both to, to connect to that road to be maintained by, by the governmental entity and and to main and to up to be able to maintain that and make improvements to that, you've got to have that legal access to that property. The district has to have that legal access, and and these are these points are all true for a county improvement district as well. But with a road maintenance district, again, those citizens determine what level of improvement do they want. They might just want something very simple improved with their district. Um, you know, they may just want some additional road base put down and uh, additional drainage facilities, for example. They also dictate the level of future maintenance that they want. Um, and they also uh, will determine the assessment methodology, which means that, so let's say you have 20 parcels within this road maintenance district. How you assess those parcels, you, you can take different approaches. You can do it by footage along the road. If it's a, you know, a single set of homes along a roadway, 
You can do it by parcel. You can split it and do it both by parcel and length. Um, you can do it by size of parcel. I mean, there's, and we, frankly, we've done it a lot of different ways in terms of how, what is the amount of money that any given par, par, property owner pays um, through this process? And that's negotiated and navigated, you know, by that board of directors assessment methodology. Um, and, and then each individual property owner decides whether or not they want to finance those improvements or whether they want to pay up front. And if, if there are property owners within the district that want to finance or district members that want to finance, um, then there's a whole set of rules and process that goes on. And uh, a bond council has to be hired as well as a financial advisor. And there's a whole process that goes on there. So that, that in terms of the formation, that comes later in the process. Um, and, and so they gather up the information, they gather up the petitions, they have to prepare a map that's sealed by an engineer that shows what are the extent of the boundaries of the district. And they have to submit a bond um, that will cover the cost for the clerk to conduct the public notice as, as well as um, notification to the district, potential district members have to be, there has to be a certified letter that goes to them as well. So all of that process then comes to the board and then ultimately the board will make this decision and it's all based on establishing is, is there a public benefit to establishing this district and a necessity for, for doing so. So, um, you know, and one of the reasons that these typically, do, the, the major reason these typically don't go forward is twofold. One, either people don't want to pay more for, you know, maintaining their roads, whatever, you know, whatever mechanism by which they're, they're maintaining those private roads today, they don't want to change that mechanism. Uh, but the other is, is there leadership within the community to actually move this process forward? There's got to be a set of people that feel strongly enough that they go out and collect the petitions and they raise enough money to, to go get the, you know, uh, hire an engineer to do a cost estimate, all the pieces that have to come together to take this forward. So, it's a it's a fairly you know complicated process and and um, you know in Annika Lane they've had a set of leadership there that has moved this forward in a very professional uh, way. They raised the money and um, um, you know they've they've managed it very well and have come forward with a with a good package. So next slide. So history, I mentioned this before, um, that we've had plus or minus about 15 road districts over the last, I say 20 years, it was really probably about a, a 15 to 20 year span that ended in 2010. Um, uh, and so during that, that wave, um, there were all these districts came forward and we haven't had any come forward since then until now. And then a lot of lessons learned out of that process. And certainly Chair Ryan can talk to you about the most of these districts took anywhere from five to seven or eight years to form just to go through the formation process. A lot of dynamics within communities. And frankly, it's in some cases, pretty sad dynamics because there was people had very strong feelings about forming or not forming a district, let me tell you. Um, and uh, navigated a lot of those um, with Supervisor um, Archuleta in her past, you know, role. Um, so I had some really uh, a lot of tough tough meetings were held. And uh, one thing we learned initially was that in this check, so changed. We didn't necessarily formally change this because we didn't have any districts coming forward, frankly, but. It, it, securing the easements and having a mechanism to secure the commitment to an easement before we went to the formation process was really problematic because you'd form the district and then you'd have to go get the easements and it was just really challenging because obviously if anybody didn't want to move forward, they just withheld their easement. And we literally had individuals buying, paying for other people's assessments to get them to sign the easement. I mean, it was a lot, a lot of drama. So. Um, so that's in terms of these recommended policy changes, you'll, you'll see that 
process relative to easements in it. And I think so far it's gonna, appears to be that it's gonna play out particularly well with, with Annika Lane if you choose to go forward and form that district. So, um, you know, a lot of other issues. Um, we are required in this case to do a low bid procurement, which that's something I will revisit with Scott if that's still required and with the county attorney, but that created a lot of problems. We had a, uh, we had a very disastrous effort with a contractor in Kachina Village. Um, he defaulted in the midst of the project, and um, we ended up spending an ex an ex well we ended up spending about two million dollars on litigation alone, and the entire road project was five point four million. So it was that was really problematic. Uh, so we've learned a lot of lessons over the years about this process and the the some of the recommendations. You know, we've certainly put processes in place to hopefully mitigate some of those, but the policies coming forward today are really being driven by making those improvements. Financial resources, um, historically, any support costs that came from the county, either match that we, that some, some financial match that we made for some of these districts, as well as um, upfront costs uh, came out of forest fees, the Secure Rural Schools forest fees, of which you know has been um, kind of on and off the table over the last several years. Um, so, and I say this is when I put this presentation together, uh, the Annika Lane had not come forward with their petition and it really, it wasn't a real pressing issue, but now as we move into potentially having a new district, I think it's, it is important that we have this discussion about the policies. So next slide, Sean. So the current landscape, I mentioned this in the beginning that, uh, you know, as we worked with the board to place Proposition 403 on the, on the ballot in 2014, there was a two and a half year process to bring that forward. And in that discussion, um, you know, there was a recognition by the board um, that, and I think this came up the other day, or it's come up in various discussions that, um, the, the citizen committee that came back, as well as the, um, you know, if you looked at what we actually needed to maintain the road system that was in, ex in existence at that time, um, we were estimating substantially more funding. And the recommendation that actually came back from the citizen committee recommended a half cent, half cent tax toward the road maintenance sales tax. The board ultimately decided to go with three tenths of a cent. Didn't want to exhaust that that uh, revenue um, solely on road maintenance and um, and cap road maintenance capital projects and so forth. So, I mean, there was a recognition at that point that that there was not going to be sufficient funds to cover the long term maintenance needs of the system, and so that's part of what prompted the changes to the subdivision ordinance as well as the engineering standards so that we're, we're managing um, uh, the, the really trying to limit the number of miles of road that come into the county maintenance system because we just don't have the money to maintain what we even have now. So, and secure rural schools was diminishing. Um, in years where we've had SRS, years we haven't had the SR, SRS, it's fluctuating in terms of the amount of funding. The gas tax has stagnated since 1992. We had no money, no mechanism to account for cost increases. This was pointed out earlier today by Siri. Um, there's no escalator in that. It doesn't go up when your gas price goes up. So to a large extent, we were looking at you know, having these limited resources and and by implementing 403, the actual, you know, le legislation, the actual initiative said that, that those funds can only be used for the existing roadways. And, and that was really important to people who were out there today that lived on county roads to be, and 
And, you know, those, you know, all over that we maintain, there was Navajo Nation Forest Service roads that we maintain that if they voted for this tax, they wanted it to go toward the road that we were maintaining today, not roads that would come in through development or other mechanisms. So um, that was really the goal and why we, why we, um, that was emphasized in that, both that, that educational effort as well as in the ballot language itself. So next slide. So again, we've had infrequent requests. We do have one potential and that is coming forward. As I mentioned, next slide. Most of the requests that, you know, conversations, and I would say more of their conversations that come forward um, are with are a result of areas where they want some type of dust control, uh, which is a very expensive and, and highly labor intensive process, um, as well as in some areas, um, you know, where they've just seen a lot of increased traffic particularly with the recreation and so forth. So uh, as I mentioned in the uh, subdivision ordinance update, um, we, uh, we had historically uh, really subsidized a fair amount of new development um, uh, by in effect allowing developers to, to build to a lower standard and um, so in revisiting our, the subdivision ordinance as well as the engineering design standards, which kind of go hand in hand, we established a, basically a set of options that developers would have. Either they could meet the county standard, which we did increase to 40 years because that's really what we need, particularly for, for major roadways um, that serve developments and, and other areas. Um, and um, and it reflects the true cost of what it's what to maintain a road. It's three to four times more expensive to maintain a paved road than it is a dirt road. And um, so everybody we you know would love us to pave you know the 600 miles of dirt road that we have out there, but it would be you know hundreds of millions of dollars to do that, right? So, but we wanted developers to be able to, to use a number of mechanisms to ultimately maintain roads. And um, so they could, they have the option to establish a road, road maintenance district. They have the option of uh, establishing a homeowners association or road associations to maintain, maintain roads after they make the improvements because they would be responsible for the improvements. So, and again, that can have the benefit of effectuating lower cost development, lower cost housing, because they aren't investing as much in the roadways. So next slide. So I think I've covered most of this that, you know, the cost of building a road should reflect that. And, you know, the engineering standards should reflect the real true long-term cost of maintaining that road. And, and really, you know, the, any subsidies that the county provides, um, I think our, the, 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 our philosophy, the staff philosophy, and also the philosophy that came forward out of 403 was that, that let's, let's really incent to do road maintenance districts where that area then takes responsibility um, to maintain the roads within that area versus the financial impact to the rest of the taxpayers um, and to the rest of the, the road maintenance operations, right? Because every time we take in a new road and then we have to maintain that, we are then taking resources away from, and you can say, well, aren't those people paying taxes? Well, they do pay sale tax. They do pay um, um, uh, yeah, they buy gas, but again, we don't collect enough money to cover all the cost of maintaining the roads we even have in the system today. So when you add a road, you have to understand where are you going to take service away from somewhere else? Because that's what you're doing. Um, and, um, and so to really reduce that impact, is to incent road maintenance districts where they then will perform the future maintenance. 
And they get to decide. That area gets to decide if they want a low level of maintenance, they want high level of maintenance, they get to decide. So, and then we can hopefully preserve our resources for maintaining the existing thousand, thousand miles that we maintain today. And, and hopefully, you know, over time can grow our revenues to do, do a little bit more with those roads as well, right? Get grants, things like that. Next slide. So the proposed um, policy changes. So again, it, it would allow for, you know, in, uh, in effect creating um, um, the opportunity, these, these district policies that we're proposing will uh, provide the opportunity for people to increase their level of, of service either on a road or on a county road, if that's something they want to, to pursue. Um, and then we have the easement deeds are held in trust, as I mentioned, I'll, we'll talk about that. That's a practice that I think we've developed that will be very important to the process overall, um, where we don't get into battles between neighbors over who gives an easement and who doesn't. Um, and then last, we want to talk about the, the county's financial contribution um, to to uh, to road district. So next slide, Sean. So right now, the current policy, um, the statute requires basically 50% plus one in terms of the number of petitions from within a proposed district are submitted to the board. But historically, for a, a road maintenance district, we have required that we had a 70% threshold. We increased the threshold above the statutory requirement because they were going to be required to also do maintenance. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, we've always encouraged districts to try to collect as many petitions as they can because over time you have people move out, you have people move in, I mean, you have changes. The, the longer it takes to get the formation culminated, the more changes in ownership you're going to experience. And particularly, people want to change their minds, right? So, um, but we think it would be important to try to set a threshold, a goal uh, of 70% for both types of districts, both the county improvement districts for the roads, as well as the road maintenance districts to, to target this 70% threshold. Um, and again, Rose could weigh in. Probably we can't require that because I think within the statute, I think it, it's, it specifies the 50 plus one, but the board as a policy and practice can say, well, if we don't see 70%, then that, that tells us there's, there's a fair amount of opposition to the district in this area. And so, um, you know, we'd like to see a higher threshold. So frankly, we don't have the level of division within the community as well, right? Um, and the consequences of that. So, so that's one policy change that all types of districts, we strongly encourage them to target the 70% as a threshold for petitions. Next slide, Sean. The next, as I've mentioned, it was always really controversial. It, once the district had been formed and then going out and trying to get the easements um, where it was private roads, there was no county, or even in county maintained roads right now, there are places we don't have continuous, uh, contiguous easement, frankly. So um, this could well apply to other areas as well, but certainly it'll apply to any area coming in that's a private road where we had this issue gets formed and then you spend years, five, six, seven, eight years trying to secure the easements to move forward. And um, so, and we again, work with the county attorney They came up with a great solution, which was working with a title company to, to form an escrow account, whereby these documents that do are signed, it's basically you're committing through your, your deed that you will ultimately sign an, uh, an easement to the district. And um, that allows the district organizers to go forward with the process, bring forward the petitions to the board, 
and the board can know that um, the, the people have committed to uh, transferring that easement to the district upon formation. So we really articulated this and this was actually, um, I think we put this requirement in place for Anasazi Trails, for example, the one that then dissolved, but um, we've never kind of put this down in writing that this was the formal policy, but I think this is of a benefit to everyone. And I know this area coming forward, they really appreciated having this opportunity to, to use this mechanism. So that's a recommended policy. Next slide. The level of county financial support for districts. So historically, um, we the county contributed funds to the districts. The level of com commitment or match to the project was a percentage, and it was uh, based on the construction cost, estimated construction cost, and it was uh, based on um, the size and type of the road. Um, so for the vast majority of the road districts that we did, it was it was a 10% match because they were smaller roads. Um, there was a, a handful, a couple that we matched up to 25%. Um, and um, so um, what, what is being proposed now is that given the dynamics with our public works funding for roads, and then also given the dynamics with secure rural schools is that, and one figure that didn't get in here is that we just across the board say it's a 10% contribution by the county to, to as a match, again, against the construction with a maximum of $250,000, knowing that we don't know if we're gonna have secure rural schools going forward. You know, we, they've kind of, and limping along, and we don't know if that mechanism for funding is even going to come forward in the future. So um, we we tried to come up with something, but this is something that could be up for discussion in terms of well, how much match? Because again, any money that comes out of that transportation fund to this effort then um, takes away from another capital project and from our maintenance operations. So. We will have to divert funds from somewhere else to fund this effort, right? To fund this district. So, and, and the improvements within that district. So, um, and then we're also proposing that there be no county contribution to road improvement districts because the county will then inherit the maintenance responsibility for an improvement district and potentially have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions that will be contributed to that roadway over the next, you know, 50, 100 years of its life, right? Again, when you look at the cost of, of maintaining a paved road being three to four times, um, we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to maintain even low volume roads going into the future. So, so again, to incent more of the road maintenance districts versus the setting county improvement districts or road improvement districts um, that we not contribute a contribution to, to those types of districts. Now, I'll say that Chair Ryan and I had a conversation earlier about this provision and we do have areas where people elected not to participate in districts like in Kachina Village where there are Basically, their their cul-de-sacs are called OVs. There, there were some some limited areas where they elected not to participate in the district that went forward back in two thousand and five or three three to five that time frame. And um, you know, we may want to look at areas like that that are I, I would call those kind of outliers where perhaps having a continue to continue contiguous improvement in that area might be beneficial for, for both the county and for, you know, for the, the property owners. But I think in general, um, beyond those kinds of areas, I think it would be important that we not, because we are going to contribute to that area by maintaining that road in, in perpetuity. So 
And one of the, the things that we, we historically, we have tracked the cost, but you know, recover the upfront cost from a road improvement district formation and, and from road maintenance districts, I mean, I think we are recovering and intend to recover most of those upfront costs, but um, the, the idea is that, again, we would be at 10% could help with the upfront costs uh, before they go out for a, a bonding effort and so forth. So initiating the, the engineering and those types of things could be covered by that 10% contribution by the county. Um, so next slide. And again, the, the district opportunity to create district, a district also does, can apply to an existing county road. And, and Supervisor Babbitt and I worked with um, some community members out in this um, Fort Valley area. They had wanted to move forward with a district there for many years. There was a uh, a proponent there who had worked on it for quite a number of years, and it was a county maintained road, but they wanted to try to move forward with paving that road. And we had come up with a process there that um, whereby the county would continue to provide the current existing level of services. So like cleaning the ditches and maintaining the culverts and um, shouldering, you know, but in terms of the pavement, if they went ahead and did form a district and, and paved that road, that the district would be responsible for the maintenance of the pavement itself. So potholing, chip sealing, future, you know, overlays, replacement of that pavement down, you know, 20 years out, whatever. And um, so the district would pay for the improvements and then, you know, anything that was related to that improvement. So, so that we kind of came up with that kind of approach to this, um, which was appreciated by that area. And I think is a good application across the county where, if, again, if people want to go down this road maintenance district effort on an existing maintained county road that we, because we do, we have planned for and should be providing that basic level of service that we have been providing in that area. But if they want a higher level, then they have to pay for that additional level of services. Unfortunately, in that case, they had been committed to receive a certain level of the millings off the, the 180 project, that the, the repaving project out there. And um, Snowball ended up with all of those millings and elected not to provide those to this area. So it never went forward, didn't have anything to do with our process, had to do with the process with the, they wanted to use millings to, to help reduce the cost of pavement. So, so anyway, but we want this to be able to be applied to, to county existing county roads where again, people come together and petition the board. So next slide. And again, private roads, you know, we would encourage if they, they want to move forward to go down the road maintenance district path and um, again, for private roads within developments as well, encourage those road maintenance districts again. Um, so we're taking that financial pressure off of maintaining um, the um, maintaining our current existing road road system. So, so next slide. So the next steps, um, what I would foresee, you know. Um, we continue to work with the county attorney's office on um, revising these policies uh, and, and certainly get your input today and, and any other conversations that you want to have about this and, um, and then move forward with preparing them and bringing back to the board for adoption. So today is really a direction we're not expecting, I should have said this up front, any action on these proposed policies, but um, but again, really focusing on how do we secure the easements, the level of contribution the county's going to make to these districts, um, and the implications of that contribution um, in terms of incenting road maintenance districts, and then, um, you know, uh, 
uh, looking at the, again, the threshold for petition. So it's really those three areas are really the, the policy areas. So that we're looking at. Um, and certainly in terms of um, the Annika Lane that's coming forward, they did use this process for the easement. So we're employing that now. Um, and it was a great solution for everybody involved because they understood the, the issues that would complicate the process if in fact the district was formed without easements and how challenging that would be. Um, but obviously they'd also like to know, is the county willing to contribute to whatever improvements they decide to make? And they've come forward you know, with their petitions again and a set of people from within the of within that proposed district that would serve as the board of directors. So ultimately that's the board of directors uh, decision as to what level improvement, but they obviously are interested in knowing is the county gonna contribute anything to their district or not. So, and again, we're proposing a 10% contribution. So um, up to a maximum of $250,000. So. So with that, I know it's a lot of information. A lot of this is new information because we haven't had to bring anything forward historically with districts for many, many years. Um, uh, so I'm happy to entertain questions and, and I can also meet with you one-on-one -on -one at, at a later date too, you know, uh, to, to get into more detail if you want more detail. So thank you. <laughs> Just a quickie in uh, an hour or so. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of information. Well, and, and you know, just to talk about it, uh, if anything that uh, you're going to get over and over again throughout uh, many of your districts, most of the districts is, uh, hey, can you guys come in and uh, fix my road? Can you pave my road? Uh, you know, and it is a discussion associated with the, one, it's driven by ARS statutes, how it's done, what happens associated with it. Um, you know, basically we've been, uh, we don't build roads. Uh, either you form, uh, you form a road improvement district and tax yourself or the developer uh, brings in the improvement uh, to build the road. Now, Prop, Prop 4 of 3 uh, provided additional uh, construction components, but it, they were related to our system that currently exists Correct. And, and, and how it relates to uh, maintenance. Uh, because uh, again, funding for roads comes through uh, gasoline taxes, uh, through a formula the state has out there. And um, uh, the state did not uh, provide a multiplier effect to adjust for uh, uh, the uh, uh, inflation, basically, uh, over time for product, uh, for cost of doing roads. Uh, uh, and so with that, that not being built in, there's less and less money every year for maintenance for our currently existing system. And when we, we moved forward with Prop 4 or 3, it was understanding that it, it was starting to bankrupt uh, us in a, in a sense on what we could do with maintenance and how do we bring money in in our proposal that will help us improve maintenance throughout our system. Uh, and it's not bringing our roads fully up to, uh, you know, uh, full recommended standards. Uh, uh, it's, it, but it, it slowed down that process uh, of decay associated with road system and cost associated with it and what we had the capability of doing. So, you know, there were big, so, you know, uh, to go through a road maintenance district process, uh, you know, we, we definitely put it on, you know, the burdens on you as a community to drive the petition process. By the same token, we're the administrative arm uh, of when it happens. And, and the real trick uh, associated with this is uh, you have no idea what it's going to cost until you form the district. And in order to do that, you need to hire an engineer. And so there's going to be a cost associated with that. And actually, it's the engineer that makes the final determination of the allocation. The district, we try and encourage communities to come up with a mechanism where you all agree with each other. And usually the engineer follows that recommendation. Uh, mm -hmm. But sometimes they, you know, they might come in and make a different recommendation. So 
uh, you know, there are additional complications uh, that uh, come with it. You know, I have, I have a couple of pieces to talk to the policy elements, but this is, you know, it's uh, really, there's, there's a lot to road improvement districts. Uh, uh, the pieces that were being asked, uh, you know, there, there's broader background associated with it. Uh, lessons learned that we've gone through and what to do, uh, you know, uh, development agreements up ahead of time, bonding associated with it, that we want to continue to make sure that we have the appropriate measures in there that I'll probably have questions on. It looks like Vice Chair Dollar, you're up with uh, ready to comment or ask questions or talk about this. Go ahead, Queen. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks, Lucinda, for the presentation. And it's a, it's a lot. Uh, and the thing, and that's what we have to. Um, we've gone through this um, road districts, and yes, we dissolve all of them. And now, um, I guess this is this is the part where we uh, we can make policy changes. And I understand the reason for these changes, uh, just because of some of the projects that we've already gone through. So um, I would just support those, those policy changes that you are proposing. And um, just with the understanding that future um, groups, neighborhoods, they need to be educated on that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really um, state statute that we have to really um, look at. And this is the way that uh, it's, it's processed in, in the counties. So it's not just us, it's all the counties throughout the state. So mm -hmm. that's just the way business is done in Arizona. So I just wanted to just make a comment about that. And, um, and then, you know, it takes years for a district to go through its process uh, and accomplish its goals. And there's a lot of rough roads through that process. And then when they're done, they are very happy that they've completed that project. So yeah, it's, and then you're right there, Lucinda, you're the one that is doing all these special districts and really very knowledgeable and very good at educating the uh, community about it. So thank you, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. And we have others queuing up. Actually, I, I did want to speak to a couple of the uh, recommendations that are uh, uh, on it. Um, the 70% for an improvement district, uh, to get an improvement district is, if you get the 50 plus one, you're lucky. Uh, so it, you know, if we raise the bar all the way up there, it's not going to happen. We already have put standards set in place uh, for improvement districts uh, that basically we're looking at such an improvement to a road that it's, uh, it's almost cost prohibitive for a uh, regular community to come up and uh, be able to do it. We did it because the state doesn't have a funding mechanism to help us continue with our maintenance associated with it. So if we do get a road through a road improvement district, let's build to basically a 50 year standard or 40 year standard, I forget what exactly it is. 40. It's a 40 year standard, you know, which is like extraordinary um, improvements uh, for it. Um, by locking in these bonds, uh, you know, it's, it's almost as though we're, we, and, and we are, uh, let's, let's, we're pushing towards maintenance districts. It's a way of sustaining ourselves from an economic standpoint. Uh, reality associated with community is uh, uh, improvement districts basically won't happen uh, for them. For those that have roads that want to do improvements and get paid roads, uh, uh, it's, it's a barrier. Uh, for them. Um, the, the piece that, you know, I, I see the title piece and I'm trying to process how that'll work. Uh, the one piece that I was, you know, I've always recommended is uh, if uh, in the formation process that we required them, uh, the improvement districts for everybody to pay for the easement, similar idea, then those that don't want to pay for the easement uh, are brought into that process. Uh, associated with it. You need a unanimous, you're going to pay for the easements. 
uh, associated with it. Uh, I see where you're going with the title piece, though. It keeps us from, uh, okay, they still hold out associated with it. So that, that was one of those ones I wanted to ask you about and just see, you know, uh, had you considered that? Is this the only choice uh, associated with it? Um, and, and Mr. Chair and Lucinda, I was thinking that uh, that the whole, I mean, it's very cost, costly for um, just to even do a district and probably costs more now. So how do you bring in um, communities that want to do this that, um, and then people that really don't wanna do it, they still get, um, they're part of a district even though they didn't sign the petition. And how do, how do you um, educate them on bringing them in? So, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, and, I and, yeah, and to that point, I mean, I think that's, by having a goal of the threshold, I, again, I don't think we can legally hold that, you know, having a goal of the threshold, though, does put, um, I guess, a greater expectation on those organizers to communicate with everybody within the area, right? Because if they, if they have an expectation that they have to, have to, they should be trying to secure more petitions, then they will talk to more people. They won't just talk to the people who are in favor of it, right? But once you form a district, whether someone's opposed or not, they are in the district and their title is, their, their deed is encumbered by that district and they are required to pay the assessments. And so, and, and in a road maintenance district, there are basically two assessments. There's one for the improvements and one for the ongoing maintenance. Of course, they, they have the opportunity to finance the improvement it can finance up to 25 years. I think the longest we ever financed was 12 years um, because it, you know, there's diminishing returns with your interest right at the higher levels. Um, and so, um, but um, you know, the, the, there, there isn't, I mean, there's cost of doing a district, but the, you know, the 95% of the cost is in the actual construction and engineering piece of it, and largely the construction, right? Because out of that amount, you know, you're usually when you think about construction, about 10% of a, a construction cost is the engineering. That's that's a there's a range there to paint on how complex the road is and everything, of course. But um, so you know, the lion's share of the cost of forming a district and moving ahead with this district is the actual construction and the improvement. So, and to me, that's the beauty of having the road maintenance district is allows people to select something other than the county center. And, and I'll tell you with the cost that's happened with oil over the last 10 to 15 years, that's what drove districts to not take place is because the cost of oil and asphalt now, irrespective of the standard, frankly, was pretty, even when that we, we only changed the standard, what, two years ago, a year ago, two years ago, that the standard didn't matter. It was the cost of pavement was so expensive that people weren't wanting to, couldn't afford to go forward with paving. So they were, you know, looking at other things that they could do to try to update, you know, improve the quality of their road without paving, right? And that's why most districts haven't gone to county improvement is because they didn't, they couldn't afford paving no matter what, what standard it was. So, and now it's higher, chair is correct. We, we created a higher cost so that we, when we inherit that road, you know, we, we inherit a road that will be at least less costly to maintain than one of a lower standard and therefore less impact on the rest of the maintenance system. So. Okay, let me, uh, I saw Geronimo pop up and then uh, Patrice, so let's go there. Go ahead, Geronimo. So I just, because it's a lot of information, first time we've been exposed to it, so I'm just trying to digest it. So if I, I'm understanding right, because of the costs, the, the improvement districts really aren't happening anymore. There haven't really been any until this most recent one. And that's because- Yeah, and that's a maintenance district that's come forward, not an improvement district. Ah, okay. Thank you for making that clarification. I'm still getting those, uh, sorting those out. Um, 
Okay, so so um so yeah, that was that was really my my just I was looking for that confirmation that I understood it correctly that uh, we aren't seeing these improvement districts come up anymore because of the fact that it's just so expensive. And do you anticipate that trend to continue? Yes, I think it will continue because right now, you know, oil is going up. So I think that between the standard and the oil, but, but even before we changed the standard, there was very limited interest because it's just really expensive to pave. I mean, look at our projects and how much it costs us to do, you know, even chip seals and, you know, we're up to, I think we're pretty close to 30,000 dollars a mile just for chip seal now. I mean, it's not cheap. And I imagine this year it could go up. It's going to go up significantly because oil's gone up significantly in the last, since the last time, you know, we went out. So I have just one last question. Generally, like how, how long of a road are we talking about? Are we talking about a couple of football fields lengths? Are we talking about a couple miles? Like generally, when they come with these uh, with these road districts or whatnot, how long are these roads? They vary quite a bit. Most of them have been small. I would say, um, you know, they've been anywhere from twenty to maybe thirty to forty parcels um, of anywhere from an acre to two and a half acre. And then we had two, two larger ones. Well, the Kachina was the largest ever. That was what Matt, 740 properties, as I recall, in that ballpark was in the district. Um, and then Mountain Air, they actually formed four districts. And if you ever want to hear the whole history of that, <laughs> sure the chair would be happy to share. I got a lot of stories, yeah. <laughs> um, they and they're contentious. Yeah. Because they, they, yeah, it just for them, you know, getting along and everything, it made sense for them to to go that direction. And they formed four districts and went forward with four districts, but that encompassed pretty much the entire area of, of Mount a mountain air. Uh, then we had a big district and a pretty good sized district out off of Stardust Antelope Lane, which was um, my memory now is there was in the I want to say it was. 60 to 80 parcels was in that district. Um, that was a pretty big district. We literally had four assessment areas. They broke out the cost in four different assessment areas within that district so that they ratcheted the cost based upon the level of benefit that a parcel got. I mean, it was very complicated. So, um, but a lot of them in the Timberline area were single roads like Rodeo, Linda, um, um, Lupine, um, um, you know, then we had out in, Bay, out in Fort Valley, we had Red Tank, Hash Knife, those were kind of single roads, you know, that were a much smaller number of parcels, more like what I talked about before, the 15, 20, up to 30. Great, thank you. I just need a little more visualization because we're talking roads, but I have no clue how long of a road we're talking about. So thank you. Yeah, and there's a lot more. They decide, the citizens decide who's in the district. So, and but typically we say, well, you should consider everyone who would get a benefit from the improvement because if you're getting a benefit, then you should be contributing, right, is the concept. A lot of times they try and equalize it, but you can't. The example of antelope. That's where the engineer actually made the decision on that one. Um, well, and brought it, it to us. A lot of negotiating. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of negotiations yeah. with the neighborhood. So, Patrice, you're, you are up, and then I have Judy after you. Hope you're muted, Patrice. Well, it's happening. Uh, I, I said I got Matt Ryanitis, so I, I, this is twice now today. I'm really, I, it's contagious. It's so. a virus. It is a virus. So, um, yeah, thank you. And uh, Chair and, and also Lucindy for your very thorough report. And of course, this is a new area for some of us new to the board, but it's not an area that hasn't already come up for some of us. Um, and, and so I really appreciate this information. Um, 
I think I agree exactly with what the chair said. Uh, the road uh, improvement districts, the cost is really prohibitive. And I, I don't see that we're going to be seeing a whole lot of road improvement districts coming forward to the county. So county probably isn't going to have to go forward and maintain all of these uh, additional roads. But, but what has come up is road maintenance districts. In fact, we've even talked uh, as recently as Meldon Estates uh, and during that flooding and, and mm -hmm. their very primitive road uh, to service their community. Uh, uh, you know, I know that the county has talked to them about uh, considering a road maintenance district. And so, uh, I, and, I, and I see good value in doing that uh, for our communities, quite frankly. But I think that even the cost for the road maintenance district can, can get absolutely astronomical. And so I, I agree with the um, recommendations to incentivize road maintenance districts. Uh, you've got some good ideas uh, and thoughts going forward on this. Um, and I see no reason not to um, take your recommendation to incentivize the whole idea of the road maintenance district as set forth. Uh, I'm sure there's probably other things we can take a look at uh, to encourage road maintenance district, um, at both through financial and technical supports. Uh, and, you know, I, other than your recommendations at this point, I'm not prepared to give you a whole lot more, but I, I think you're bringing very good recommendations forward. Uh, for road maintenance districts. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, caught it again. Judy? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lucinda, and your staff for um, putting this presentation together. Uh, just like uh, my colleague said, you know, some of these things are new to us. We're still learning um, a lot of. Uh, uh, things are coming, you know, like the road maintenance and all these policy changes that were, were what, what that's being recommended at this point in time. And and I I, I support, you know, the the staff's um, uh, policy changes that they're recommending. And uh, while reading through all of it, you know, it seems like even with the four hundred one a four hundred three dollars that came up, that's even anything that's coming down. Um, it's being, it's being taken into consideration. So it's probably not just going to be a one-time thing that we're going to be um, reviewing and also um, uh, make, making changes to. So so all funds, uh, any kind of funds, you know, they have certain criteria to meet and stuff like that. Like the passage of the 403 back in 2014, um, you know, things like that. Um, those funds are for maintaining only existing county roads, maintain roads and cost for herb and stuff like that. So I'm really glad that those are being taken into consideration. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the detail, a comprehensive report that you and your staff put together and with the PowerPoint. And certainly I learned a lot today, you know, in this area. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. You know, one thing I should have added and stated right up front is that I think another big contributor to the fact that we haven't had districts come forward has been because of Prop 403. I mean, we are investing more in in-road maintenance, um, particularly our dirt roads. I mean, we, um, with the support of bo the board, we secured uh, three additional pits uh, from the Forest Service uh, so that we could resurface our, our gravel roads more regularly and at a, at a much reduced cost. Um, not that there isn't still a significant cost to it, but hauling from Sheep Hill uh, at, at that point, you know, uh, was extremely expensive to many of these outlying areas, uh, particularly like the Blue Ridge area, for example. And so, I think you know over time we we have been able to resurface those roads and now really focusing on being able to also help bring in contractors to help do some of this work as well so that we can get a much more routine resurfacing plan for all of our gravel roads. Now some of our roads service very low volume of traffic and they are very rural in nature and there's you know, frankly, there's only so much we can spend on those kinds of roads, but 
I think particularly for those larger volume roads and some of the developments that we have in the outlying areas where we can continue to improve the resurfacing. And you're gonna see this in the public works budget is what we wanna to do to invest more in that because I think that's driven down the desire because when we resurface more frequently, we create, like, there, there's less dust, less you know um, issues with the road, potholing um, and other issues that, that are, you know, that, that people don't care for with their roads, of course. So, so I think, you know, that's really a tribute to the public works workforce and the investment made by the taxpayers that that's having that impact. And I think we're looking at doing that more and that'll, that's been a big, you know, drive. a lot of times people call in and say, what can I do? I want to have better level of service. And we go out and resurface the road and then we don't hear anything for years, you know, because it really does make a huge difference. So, and that's why like on nation resurfacing the roads up there, surfacing, they've never had any surfacing. To surface the roads up there is so important and, and getting more of that kind of work done up there. So. Let me see. Judy, did you uh, have me finished on this? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I was muted, now you're muted. <laughs> see, it just got you. <laughs> yes, you are. Okay. Uh, you know, one thing I, I want to ask the question, though, uh, on this, uh, you know, and it's, you know, I understand if I'm the only one on it, uh, so be it. Uh, the idea of raising the bar to 70% for an improvement district is, I mean, it really is just, putting the final obstacle, you're not going to do it type idea. And part of the idea of improvement districts is you get a community to tax itself. Uh, and in state statute, it's 50 plus 1% uh, that occurs associated with it. There are a couple other formula components, you know, uh, uh, you know, ownership uh, plays into it, uh, electric, some, uh, I don't know if electric's in road improvement district, but basically, um, no, it isn't, okay. Um, the, uh, you know, my suggestion is that we don't modify the threshold for improvement districts. It's all almost cost prohibitive but anyway, uh, for if they get to that level, I'll tell you, Kachina Village, uh, what happened was uh, you look at the density of that subdivision, what was happening, the dust that just, it was everywhere. And the same thing for Mountain Air. Uh, they were two different types of districts, but it, it was a health issue that came up. And the community labored for a couple of years, uh, you know, a couple of different ways to go about getting the improvement district. And actually, that one had five amendments once the district was approved. That the roads that, you know, they, they tried to do the whole area, they couldn't get it to go. And that's why they went into a couple of years. Okay, let's go back at it. They went for the whole district, but they also carried around petitions that excluded the roads that they had lower than 50% on them. And then once they got that approved, that's where the roads that were close to 50% actually, uh, you know, we, we paused long enough to say, you know, will we allow this to happen? And we had amendments to the improvement district to those roads had a second chance to come in and go and do it. So to try and do it and get those improvements, it gets rid of that dust factor that is a health issue. The mountain air, they, it would just linger in the air. You know, the mm -hmm. people didn't have, they didn't open their windows uh, because it was just bad. Uh, you know, I would tease the community. Now you have to talk to your neighbor. You have your windows open, that kind of thing. But uh, there are benefits to having improvement districts. It's hard to do, but, you know, I would suggest that we don't put the burden up to 70% for an improvement district. Uh, they already have our higher standards that we build in associated with it. But, you know, just check in with the board. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm fine with that, Jay. You know, I think we've always encouraged people to bring in more petitions because of the change in ownership. Because the longer it takes to get there, the more change then you're going to have too, right? So, um, and, and just for... Um, the, I'll say both the political acceptability of the district and then the community being able to continue to work together to effectuate whatever they want to do in that community. So, so but can, I'm fine <laughs> we, eliminating that. I don't, you know, I think we always would encourage them to bring in more than the 50 plus one, mm -hmm. you know. 
So, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Louis. Uh, the reason I support it is because haven't we in the past had people come up and say, I didn't know this was being formed and they're caught by surprise because they tried to get all the people that are supporting that in and then somebody else is in PAC and they're not aware of it. So, you know, it's just um, getting, making sure that every citizen, every resident is, um, is actually um, informed and involved and um, understand their responsibility once this goes through. And it's the, um, those that are, um, you know, and, and that's, I guess that's the reason why I, I just want to explain why I support this 70%. And like Lucinda said, it, they would be able to do their due diligence and contacting everyone, not just stop when they have 50% and not contact anybody else. Oh and it'll happen with 70% too, but uh, uh, yeah. yeah. But yeah. still. Mm -hmm. Have a comment. Yeah, go ahead, um, Yeah, I, 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 I do um, understand uh, where Lucinda is coming from and also um, my colleague, um, Vice Chair, I think it's very important uh, if we up that, I think they'll be in a better position to get, say, okay, we need 70%. We don't, and, and not just stop there at 51% and that more people need to be involved and they, they would know more about it. And so that, that's probably um, something because they, uh, I, they probably don't contact everybody. They just have the 51% then they said, they said that's it. And that they made it everything, everybody, everything they out, out, the, out the door. But anyway, I think 70% would give them the, um, um, the community to work together and um, be, be well informed. I guess that's the bottom line to work together also. Okay, Patricia. Yeah. I think that 70% um, is an awfully high bar. And I, again, I don't think we're going to get uh, road maintenance districts anyway, because I think it is cost prohibitive. But if you're putting it at a 70%, it just makes it almost impossible. So. And Hieronima? I, I agree. I, I, I feel like I, I prefer the lower threshold just because the cost pro prohibitedness makes it that not too many are going to make it to that round anyway. And a 70% threshold might be too much. Yeah, and I guess that 70% might, might seem almost like unreachable, you know, maybe. But at the same time, though, you got to get make sure that you have everyone in that neighborhood and in forum. And um, we've had cases where that, that didn't happen. Well, one thing that is a requirement, Rose may want to come on, comment on this, but so for example, the, the community members that have come forward for the Veronica Lane, they, from what I understand, I did not do the count, but that they've got roughly 80% of the property owners have signed petitions. But um, in that process, now once they submit the position, petitions, one of the things that steps that Lindsay has to take is to send a letter that does tell all the property owners in that proposed district that there will be this public hearing and that it will go to the board for potential formation. So, you know, of course, that's, that's like 30 days or whatever notice, right? It's not ample time for them to have any influence on the process, probably. But one thing we have implemented as well is that if in fact people are really serious and they, and, and I think we've had probably four meetings in the last eight or nine years where people are serious enough that they're having a broad enough communication within the community. And then we'll say, okay, let's set up a community meeting and go over what's involved in forming a district, the two different types, da, 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 we march through all that. And then what I always tell them is then, then we leave and you all have your conversation. But, but I said, one of the things that's a requirement of that is that we will send a letter to everyone saying that we're having this meeting and, the, and this meeting is being driven by citizens within your community, your area, your neighborhood, 
And if you want to know more about this, you know, and here's the implications, then come to this meeting, right? And um, so we're, we're trying to get more information out up front so that we don't have that because that did happen and it happened in a lot of several of the districts. So I think that helps to that people at least on the radar, hey, I know there are people within my community who are pushing for that. Generally, they know because they're collecting some kind of money from people in a currently to, to get somebody to come out and grade their, their dirt road. And so, and then certain people don't pay. This is all about certain people not contributing, right, typically. And so they finally say, hey, we're done trying to go door to door to collect. We want to set up a district and, and have a mechanism that they have to pay. <laughs> I mean, they just get frustrated to the point. So that's what drives it. So, so we yeah. do have, we are putting other mechanisms in place, but. Um, well, I, no. I support whatever that needs, you know, 50% yeah. is fine. I was just thinking that, you know. No, you know, you're right. I think it's important. That's all. You Thank know, you. We, we really try to emphasize, you need to talk to everyone because if those people show up at the hearing, you know, the 20% that didn't sign are going to show up at the hearing and, and they're obviously going to voice their opinion, which probably is in opposition. And so you're, you're going to hear that and you, you may only hear from those 20%, right? So the, and then you've got to make a decision about is there a public benefit or not and a necessity. So Rose, do you want to add anything more? Yeah, we have Rose and then we have Geronimo lined up here too. So go ahead, Rose. Thank you, Chair Ryan. I was just going to add, I mean, one, as Lucinda said, you know, there is certainly the notice requirement, but that doesn't come until after the petition has been filed. And as she said, it's, um, you know, I, I want to say 20 days or 30 days prior to the hearing itself. So um, that's certainly not the same as, as, you know, being informed as people are collecting those signatures and being able to talk about it with community members. But I also want to stress as well that, um, you know, the statute, the statute genuinely sets the threshold. The statute sets the, the you know, 50% plus um, threshold for, for filing the petition. And then after that, the board's discretion is to determine the, uh, you know, whether the public convenience, necessity, or welfare will be promoted by the establishment of the district. So certainly, you know, the board can consider these other factors in, you know, whether the convenience, necessity, or welfare are promoted. Um, you know, I would caution against setting any kind of hard, um, you know, other uh, thresholds that are outside of the statute. Um, you know, I, I can see certainly using these policies as, as guidelines, you know, that, uh, you know, that the greater the support of a petition, um, then the more likely that promotes, uh, you know, public uh, welfare. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, that's really how the board could, should be thinking of this as a, as a guideline rather than any kind of, um, you know, uh, black line threshold, uh, because the statute is the statute is what sets it. Um, and then, you know, once the, the board utilizes its discretion, and makes a determine about public benefit, uh, you know, then it either shall or shall not create the district. So, um, so I just wanted to sort of provide some parameters to, 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 to these policies, especially when we're talking about uh, a signature threshold. Yeah, thank you, Rose. And it has always been articulated as, um, you know, as a, as a recommendation, no, and, and it's always been articulated too, is that the statute says 50 plus one, right? So, um, you know, it's more about what are we articulating as a recommendation, so. Yeah, we did, uh, for Matt and Eric, we waived uh, the higher threshold for the maintenance district uh, when we did that. Uh, Hieronima? Yeah, my, my only question was the, um, with the, the average historically, what's the average uh, of um, that participate? Is it all over the place? Is it like generally people reach 50, one, 50 plus one and stop doing their petitions or just based on what you've seen, what's kind of the average of, of what communities get when they get one of these um, improvement districts or I would say that the average was probably between 55 and 60%. We certainly had some that were greater than that, that were over 60%. And then 
I think we had several that just squeaked by, right, Chair, that, you know, with 50, you know, like probably 52 or 53. So, um, yeah, it, it's the due diligence that those in the community, how much they want to invest in the time and effort. And, for example, this area, they've invested a lot of time and effort in talking this through with their neighbors. So, um, you know, they were able to get 80 percent. So. Thank you. OK, so. Really, you can see these, it's really interesting. They're hard, districts are hard, but by the same token, there are opportunities for improvements for communities too. Mm -hmm. So uh, just on that, you know, we have two different pieces here. We have maintenance district that we are currently have a bar at 70%, but we have weighed 54. And currently the improvement districts are at 50 plus 1% as statute was written, uh, but the recommendation was to increase it to 70%. So going back to it, uh, I was asking about improvement districts, but I'm going to go through each board member just for clarity of uh, where your comfort level is. So I'll start, uh, uh, Supervisor Horseman. I think we're on improvement districts should stay at, as, at the statutory rate of 50 plus one. And maintenance districts, you're okay with? where the current bar is with the- Absolutely, uh, yes, where okay. the current bar is, okay. Okay, uh, District 2, uh, Radama? Uh, I agree, I think that the statutory should be respected at 50 plus one, and then on the, the other maintenance, 70% uh, threshold. Okay, uh, Judy? Um, I feel the same way, but I think, you know, at some point in time, we probably have to up that, especially with the larger um, districts, um, because the lower the, it is, the lower fewer people will be aware or informed or, or, or having per, their input into it. And that, um, and so um, I thought for she said 60%, so <laughs> that's it. Yeah, she's giving you trouble. That's what she's doing. You're just putting words in my mouth again, Judy. <laughs> well, she paying attention. Gee, you queued her up pretty quick there, Judy. Uh, let's see. Uh, and then uh, Lena. You know, I, I just think about how the more informed the beginning of the process, the, the more people that this is going to impact them. Some people uh, may not be involved um, or may, uh, may not be informed or are not involved in the current maintenance. And that's the reason why they're going to districts because they can't afford it. So because of that, somewhere in there, we really need to encourage whoever that's putting this together to really um, contact everyone. I don't know if it's, um, since since the county is the one that ends up being the um, the oversight monitor, maybe we need to. Even though the statute doesn't say, as soon as petition, well, we don't know usually until petition is. It's not formal until we get the petition, but you know somewhere along the way to make sure that we reach out um, to everyone and to let them know this is being proposed in your neighborhood. So maybe that's a way to get people to um, be informed. So that's, that's my main um, concern. So. Well, I think we can certainly set up within the policies that and practices that, that you know, the county takes some level of effort at the same time, we still have to recognize it is a citizen driven process, right? So, you know, we also don't want to bear that. I think Rose would say no, but it's still their responsibility, right? So, I think we can take prudent measures to make sure that there is communication. Um, and we can certainly build that into the process. I think the one thing I would ask for consideration is that for a road maintenance district, and, and as the chair pointed out, there have been times that the 70% was waived, that that be a consideration, particularly for areas where there has been a lot of discussion and a lot of communication. And 
and maybe they're they're at 65 or something, you know, should they still have the opportunity, you know, if they're at 60 or 65 to be able to bring that forward, right, for consideration. So particularly if they've secured all their easements, right, if they've if they've secured their deed for the for the easement um, and we've got the easement, then to me, that's that that's a real strong indicator as well. Right. So. Yeah, you would think that um, to get the easement, you've got you had everyone uh, pay into that cost. So, yeah, so anyway. but they right. don't go hand in hand necessarily. Right. Yeah, they so don't. <laughs> no cost to handing over your easement and getting the road improvement technically, you know? So, but I think if we can have the flexibility in those cases to be able to bring for, you know, say to the board, would you consider a waiver if in fact, you know, they've got a pretty, still a pretty good majority of people who want to move forward. So, uh, and they have the easement and they have the easements secured. Patricia. You know, I would not have a problem if on a if there is extenuating circumstances, as indicated, to uh, waive the 70 percent with road maintenance district. I think we should keep it as the standard. And if something uh, comes forward and we uh, with, as I said, extenuating circumstances, we can always consider a 65 percent um, uh, and, and, and move forward with it. So I don't think that's a real big problem. Yeah, so, you know, if we go uh, with the concept of, uh, as Rose suggested, consider them guidelines. Uh, these right, are the, the thresholds, uh, but people can request a waiver. And I think we were like 57% and 60-something percent uh, with Mountain Air. It depended upon the district. On, uh, uh, and I'm just barely pulling that out, so I could be off on that. But I think we were lower. I think that. you're right. It was in that ballpark, yeah. 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 Um, so the, the I, and I know we're belaboring it, but it's a big topic that we have here and we're talking about policies uh, associated with it. The one piece that I, you know, also wanted to suggest is the idea of improvement districts. So if we have uh, that systematic piece and it might be, you know, additional work on your side, uh, <coughs> uh, Lucinda, associated with the potential contribution uh, if, it, if it played into the system. You know, is there a different way of uh, uh, framing it uh, for, for a policy component on that? You mean like relative to the case that you brought up earlier? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think we could just describe cases like that where we've had districts or we have, you know, components of an area that did not go forward and they want to come forward and and can they do that through some mechanism? And, and, and I think we, I can draft up so a proposal relative to that. And yeah, I have the potential of bringing it back. Is that okay with the board on that? Yeah. We'll get it back. We look I at it, like it. Right. We don't like it, you know. You know, in, in those cases, it was, particularly when you look at Kachina, mm -hmm. um, you know, that it is outlier. I won't say it's affecting the maintenance system particularly, but there are some impacts to that, those decisions that were made by those individuals. So, um, and I think there's conversations and I know in one case, you know, one of the road maintenance districts that had gone forward historically hadn't collected enough money. Anyway, there was a long history there and they ultimately said, yeah, we'll pay for this improvement so I think some way that we still work because I also don't want people coming forward and say, well, and now they got it for free, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they would still need to contribute something so that, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, so that they don't feel like, like the rest of the neighborhood doesn't feel like, well, yeah, they held out and they then got it for free. That doesn't no. feel fair either. You know? No, I'm not suggesting that. Um, you know, when, when, Last piece, uh, uh, patience with all you guys. The drawback and what we're running into is basically uh, we haven't had the state uh, modify so that we have uh, indexing or a multiplier effect uh, to address the inflation component. That's the real area that would resolve these issues of uh, what to do and how to uh, approach these things. The drawback no increase is since 1992 
And we are now down to, I think there's less than, I think there's like a half a dozen states left that have not increased either a gas tax or a sales tax for roads. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're way behind the nation uh, on that. Uh, but the other piece that occurs, and you know, it, it's one that I'm probably a pain on this, but I'm, I'm seeing it. it. You know, basically, uh, if you look at our socioeconomic uh, status, and you can go uh, look at the uh, uh, different, uh, um, uh, oh gosh, I can't think of what we call them right now. My brain's a little short. Uh, spe- you know, our, our needs assessment that we've done, that we talked about through budget, is that, uh, you know, our, our income uh, uh, level is, we have a lot of poverty uh, in our county. And what, you know, I realized when I was going door to door on some issues prior to the campaign uh, was we're starting to get a default that people can't afford to live on the system. They're actually going out where we have lots of places uh, because they can't even afford the housing that's on our county system uh, on it. So we're having, it, it's creating a class have and have not uh, scenario that uh, somehow we need to uh, is there a different way that we approach uh, areas of, uh, that don't fit the full state system? You know, is it, uh, do they, you set up a, a mechanism that, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's through a nonprofit or whatever, and you have all the, if you got X amount of money uh, for that, you can put a blade, blade down or you could bring in cinder uh, and, and put up a liability barrier that the county wouldn't have accountability with it. You know, I wish we could create enough, like we did with the road maintenance districts when, uh, yeah, it was Tom's idea of uh, creating them. We pushed the legislation for a number of years, finally got it. And we, we were the ones that pushed that concept through the legislature. It would be interesting to take a look at our socioeconomic piece where we have off system roads. So is there a different way of approaching this? And, you know, I would hope, you know, it's not the time right now to look at it, but it's one I would suggest that we're encouraged that we take a look at uh, in the future with this. Um, I'm way off the clock with everything. As you guys said, you know, I'm, I, I do that to you, I'll get you way off clock, but I think we have a really good uh, discussion at board level. Uh, Great discussion. Any, and anything else from board members? Not seeing it. Lucinda, you good at this point? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Very good discussion. Appreciate the input. All right. So um, moving us on, we got uh, one, you know, the larger item that we have is, uh, well, once again, we're hitting the round table uh, component. We didn't have a chance for District 3, uh, 4 or 5 uh, to uh, give comments um, and, and also a county manager piece. I think the planning calendar, we always have the opportunity to bring it back at next meeting, Steve, on it. Uh, probably first case would be, are there any items of business from the county manager's update that, you know, you it's really important that you get out right now? I'll provide it to board members in an email. It's fine. Okay. Thanks. And then uh, provide the opportunity uh, for District 4 and District 5 to give your update uh, on it. And then to conclude the meeting, we're set up to go into an executive session uh, on that if the board votes in that direction. Um, so uh, go to District 4, uh, provide an opportunity for an update for District 4. Judy? Okay. Um, thank you. Chair for allowing me to uh, bring up some of the things that I've been working on. Um, basically, um, <clears throat> we've been real busy with um, the planning meetings and chapter meetings of the six chapters that are within our district. And a lot of those are happening on weekends, um, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and some of them are on Mondays. So, and these meetings are very lengthy and, and a lot of them are talking about at this point in time is the drought issues they have, infrastructure, roads, broadband, grazing, ARPA funds, and also um, the increases in gas, food, and um, just certain things like that. So um, 
And a lot of that is uh, something that um, they're trying to uh, get through the Navajo Nation. And, and like I said before, a Western agency is usually the last um, agency that's going to get some kind of help, you know, from, from anyone, uh, especially from um, uh, the Navajo Nation. So uh, we've been working with them and um, uh, making referrals and uh, giving them some direction and, get, and helping them get some information as how to go forward with certain things. And so anyway, um, that's what we've been doing. So that takes a bulk of our, our, our time there and then trying to um, um, assist them in that way. And then also, um, and then, um, and then also there, um, I just want to say, say congratulations to my sister, um, Teresa Hatafi, you know, uh, being appointed as, a, as a, a senator. And I really uh, think she's up to now, she's been communicating information and that, you know, that, that um, that's very beneficial, beneficial to the Native Americans. And so I'm really thankful for that. And then also we have um, Dr. Harold Begay, who is has been selected as a Navajo Nation uh, superintendent, Navajo Nation School superintendent um, for the overall Navajo Nation School. So um, he was a previous superintendent over at the Triple City U High School District, and he made he made a, a big difference in, in in scoring of our our, our grading of our district. We were like a D minus school, and by the time he left, about two and a half years later. Um, he had gotten us to a very high B school and overall. So that was good. So I, I trust that, you know, he's going to help the Navajo Nation in that way. Uh, so, and then as you all know, Naomi has left um, her position with us um, uh, about a week, two weeks ago now. And um, she is got, she has a full-time job right now. And um, so it, it, it's kind of hindering from her, you know, to be traveling to Flagstaff, going home, and then spend, trying to spend time with her family on weekends. So we, we are in the process of finding a, a replacement for her. And one of the persons that we're looking at right now is um, Belinda Curley of Tonalia. Um, she has submitted her resume, and I have yet to review that. So um, I'll be making a decision here sh uh, shortly, you know, to take uh, Naomi's place. So, and I think it's very important uh, because um, we work real closely with um, Kalani Lake Loop and also uh, Bird Spring Chapters and Coal Mine, but um, pretty much um, Redwood and Cameron, you know, that's another area. So, and, <clears throat> and the Hopi tribe. So that's where we're needing the help. So um, since she's from Tonalia, you know, we decided that you know, we should just get someone from that, that area to assist us. Again, the MOU with the Navajo Nation, I was working on that, trying to get things together and I have yet to submit it to Steve and also um, to our communications director just to uh, eyeball it for a uh, eyeball it and see how, and see what the contents uh, is doable or not doable and things like that. So that's, that's something that I think we need to get done because right now we don't have anything in place that where we would be able to really work. Uh, I think there's something maybe for the roads. Um, they uh, wrote uh, uh, certain parts of the road, roads uh, within the Navajo Nation that um, Lucinda has talked about. And so we need to do more than doubt that because I think in the health field and other areas, you know, we would be able to work together more closely, um, especially with the uh, District 4 um, uh, constituents. And then uh, again, um, I have a real big concern about one of the roads, which is Low Basin Road, uh, which is between um, to, uh, Loop and um, uh, Talani Lake area. Um, that <clears throat> I reported this before, and um, I did mention it to the Navajo Nation, but the, it, the ownership of that road is uh, the BIA. So BIA is not really uh, trying to do anything with it, but we're, I think it's a very high safety issue right for, at this point in time, because you can see, um, you know, the, um, the cables um, were very evident and um, the, 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 the um, cement blocks, they're, they're coming off of those cables and, and it's just getting narrower and narrower. So I'm trying to see how else we can get that, get that going and see how, what kind of help we can get. So I've been working on that too. And then also, um, um, 
I know there's fiber in a certain area, um, like Homai Mesa, and uh, we do, and I'm trying to work with the nation on that, you know, to see, um, because in coal mine, there's fiber right there at the chapter house and looking into it, we have um, 26 hot Navajo, NHA, Navajo Housing Authority homes right in, in one area. And then we also have a former JUA Bennett Freeze homes, um, JUA homes, right, just within that same vicinity. So there's a lot of students that go to school from there and yet, you know, they don't have internet access or anything. So I'm trying to see what can be done with that and working with um, the Navajo Nation on that one. So, um, and then I attended the tribal legislation, uh, legislators um, um, uh, call meeting down in Phoenix and um, they had some exhibits and there was a lot of dignitaries there and that um, they also had a um, uh, youth STEM workshop and I, I attended that too also and it was very informative and I enjoyed that. I also met with Pete Berkus on from uh, Tom Howland's office, and then uh, regarding the uh, funds for Napa National Chapters within the Coquitlam County. So um, I have I'm going to be asking for a written written document from 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 their office, and so, but uh, and then to share that if I have to. So. Um, but a lot of it was um, just these events happen right there at the state capitol and on the lawn of the state capitol. So, and then um, the Navajo Nation is really looking at uh, redistricting, and uh, they're pushing hard, um, you know, to get people signed up to to vote and stuff like that because they feel that you know the redistricting was not fair because it it it. Um, it's not allowing, um, it's going to, it's swaying one way, you know, to get have people vote in certain ways. And, and they, it, and it's like, um, they want to make sure that they're voting, um, um, they're, they, they have, they're voting and that their, their voices are going to be heard. So that's another big movement that's going on right now on the reservation. Um, so that's, um, the Navajo Nation winter session is going on and I've been, been on Facebook. Um, yesterday I was on there from nine till seven. There's a lot of information that's affecting the um, um, issues uh, on the reservation. So um, a lot of them they're talking about um, just anything. I guess it's a winter session. Every department is making their presentation. So I've been involved with that and taking some of that information and uh, sharing that, communicating that to the people that, that's in the area of um, District 4. So that even that takes a lot of time, you know, just to um, just to get information and share it. And then also the um, Forest Lake uh, quarter, we told them that we were going to be down there every quarter. We we're supposed to have been down there on December, no, January 15th, but we didn't go down there because of the snow and um, but we, we, we usually meet uh, with the homeowners association down there and then plus the fire district there and plus Mormon Lake. So those are uh, uh, the areas that we're working with, um, you know, trying to get information together and try to share information. So, um, um, and then, um, let's see, I have some more notes on here. But all in all, um, a lot of communication and a lot of um, um, information that's being shared. I think that's, um, it's a lot of advocacy and information and sharing information with my constituents out there. So that's all I have to share right now. Um, it's just a lot of meetings, a lot of information gathering and trying to communicate with the com communities out there. Thank you. Busy, busy, I'll tell you. Uh, Nina, uh, District 5. Okay, um, thank you. Let's see. You know, it's been, it is really busy. I, I think that we have more meetings now by Zoom than we had before we had Zoom and uh, driving between meetings. Um, so uh, the District 5 regional meetings, um, they were pretty much canceled because of the upsurge in the, um, in the, in the COVID that we all see. Um, the Marble Canyon, I want to thank Sue and our county manager, Steve, and 
all of the departments that came together to help me think out and plan out the regional meeting that that was scheduled for um, this month now. It'll be towards the end of the month or maybe in March that we're going to have out in the Marble Canyon all the way out to, well, we're going to include Bitter, um, Bitter Springs, Bottaway Gap, and, um, and all the way to Fredonia, um, the communities there. And the just, uh, you know, there's a sliver of um, unincorporated communities, the town of Fredonia, and then there's just uh, federal agencies. So they were very excited about the meeting, just really want to get prepared for the upcoming infrastructure bills that are um, these federal dollars that are coming through and to see what the, um, our federal agencies and partners are planning and see how we might be in um, our communities are included in those plans and you know, really looking at the future. And then maybe eventually turning this into a regional plan um, as a collective group. So there's a lot of, there's quite a few issues that we have to, we have to address as a community in that region. And really just um, having those conversations it is very necessary and trying to see which, how to resolve these issues, which is like broadband, water, uh, wastewater, just the, our, our narrow uh, 89A road and working with ADOT and then North Rim, you know, year around um, uh, opening there and their work, the Grand Canyon is working towards that. Um, just just an, a number of issues. We have uh, ranchers in the area and then we, we still dealing with the last year's fire on, on the um, Kaibab. So those are issues that we would just want to address. So that's um, a meeting that's going to move forward that, was, that we're going to reschedule and uh, we'll let you know when those meetings will be taking place. But I just still want to appreciate our county staff for coming together and really just helping us to think through this, um, this event. And then you know, as I, I think I informed all of you, Zenny Homes has moved into um, into NGS um, site, and so NGS uh, the site is where manufacturing company is established. They are they are using the generator and um, hauling water right now, but they they're working with the utility. Navajo Nation Utility Company to be able to hook all of those necessary amenities to be able to operate a um, manufacturing company. So that's that's what is um, what they're working on right now, and we are they're looking for employees uh, right now that can head up some of these projects, like um, you know just the um, so that's the, those are. Um, positions that are open that we are going to be we are sharing out there so we'd be able to um, help them to hire these individuals um, we had a community session get together and it was it was really um, interesting and enlightening about these buildings and how they're used for housing and office complex right in the middle of um, Mesa uh, so those are just just to learn more about that company was really interesting. Uh, I have decided not to attend the NACO legislative conference just because of the upsurge in the COVID. Um, really want to just participate by virtual and I know it was all in person. I think now they're starting to open up for virtual meetings, which I really hope that they do. Um, we are continuing to work on broadband. As you all know, that we had a broadband meeting that was also scheduled and that was canceled. And today just got off the phone. Um, we're, we're in the process of rescheduling it now with the Arizona Commerce Authority. And this is a broadband meeting with, um, on, on Navajo Nation with the um, all the counties, um, the state and the the three states, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona. Arizona, um, the a ACA and the governor's office is uh, sponsoring this one. 
The next meeting will be sponsored by the state of New Mexico in Gallup. So, and then from there we have, um, the Utah has contact me. So we'll be able to um, possibly have it, um, have them sponsor um, as well. And this is with all, all the counties as well as Navajo Nation officials and all the providers. Uh, this one of the, the meeting in New Mexico Verizon will be um, will be um, will be um, presenting this this upcoming meeting uh, at the Arizona. It will be the um, state broadband director Jeff will provide an update, and we're going to invite the state legislators, the governor, uh, tribal leaders to that, and then um, they. The thing that is holding us back when you talk about broadband, it sounds very simple, but it's actually very complex and a lot of details that you have to think through. And the whole up is the easement and um, our 89, um, Highway 89 and 160, that's what's holding that up. And any other project that we're gonna be uh, working on, that's gonna be the big issue, it always is. And so the broadband um, and the easement approvals through BIA, um, ADOT, Forest Service, we're going to have them present the Navajo Nation Land Department. And we're going to invite Senator Kelly and his staff because he's introducing legislation to um, maybe waive or make it easier for to get easements on federal lands. So we're going to be having that discussion at in um, at the next meeting at the ACA office in Phoenix. Um, so we are continue to move forward on that. Um, we just scheduled a roads very similar with the three states, Navajo Nation counties. We just scheduled the roads network meeting, which is on February twenty third. Oh, I mean February third. It'll be at the Navajo Nation Transportation Office in, um, in New Mexico. And we are talking about infrastructure and seeing how we may be able to um, bring the collective group together and be able to work together on roads. Um, and there are um, grants, there's infrastructure bill that's coming through. So we are, are getting prepared for that. That's what all these meetings are for. How do we take advantage? How do we, how are we ready for these dollars? And as, as grants from the federal agencies um, and all granting agencies now, the buzzword is to, um, is the, um, the collective group write, um, writing a grant, which is the, and that is what we're, aiming for and that's what um, we all talk about and that's what we're doing right now. Um, let me see, Grandview, I see this is like going back, um, Grandview Outlook and Page, we worked together on that. It finally had a dedication and that was really great and we were very involved in that. We had um, the, uh, it is a um, small little park. Um, and we also, um, uh, back to broadband, we're working with, of course, the, our, we have a great team. Who else, else has a great team? Coconino County does. Uh, Matt, Matt Fowler and Helen and Estello and Sue and many others with all the expertise. Um, we are, uh, you know, as you all know, the, the um, we're a preparing a grant for the, the ACA grant and we're putting that together right now and we're um, as just one of the grants in the Tuba City area for our office, the veterans office and also the senior citizens, possibly the Tuba City courthouse because our courts want that virtual, um, the, um, as we heard from the courts, they need that virtual um, conferencing from adult probation to possibly the courts. And that's what we're hoping that we'll be able to 
hook up and also our library in Tuba City. So that's what we're working on. I probably could provide more, but there's a lot of um, meetings that are taking place that are um, constantly moving and trying to see what how we can um, best meet the needs of our, our citizens and really not just the Coquinino County citizens, but much broader than that, because our, what we do impacts every, everyone in Northern Arizona. So we're trying to work um, collectively to be able to work together. Um, so we're constantly um, going back and forth on all of these projects. So really appreciate um, all of the county staff, really appreciate county manager, Steve Peru um, and, uh, and the staff. Oh, one more thing, <laughs> taxes. Thank you, Steve and staff again and public health. Um, we are now going through our tax training. We are to be tax preparers. Um, this is our eighth year and um, Miranda has been certified already to be a tax preparer. And um, I believe Stephanie is as well. We're gonna start preparing, um, providing taxes. We encourage everyone that, that to really get prepared to get your taxes done this year. There's been some changes in the um, tax um, bracket and there's some challenging. Um, IRS is, uh, has a great challenge that they, they are facing. So this year's tax is going to be more interesting because you're not, you may not get your taxes done right away because they are so backed up and their computer and technology system is so outdated that um, they're doing a lot of it by hand. Um, $9.8 million um, returns with air is still sitting there. They haven't gotten to it. Um, 2.3 million amended returns are still sitting there. Um, we have 2.8 billion uh, business returns that they have not gotten to. Not to mention the child tax credit letters that have to be mailed out. Um, not to mention people that didn't do their taxes last year. Um, and so they're really bad logged. So if you, um, if you want to, if you're owed um, money from the IRS, get your e-filing done. It's easier that way. You'll get your returns much faster. Uh, and if you owe money, you can maybe wait a little bit. So, <laughs> you know, we we are all preparing and I'm very, very happy and our, our uh, constituents are so happy that we from Coconino County really value this service that we provide of this free tax service um, to be able to be a free tax preparer for our citizens is a great honor for me and our staff and where it's tax season and we're gonna have fun and preparing everyone's taxes that want to have their taxes done. So thank you so much. And I just have to thank our, our staff again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. There's so much more, but that's that's gonna be it for now. Yeah, we're, we're all busy. And then also it's been a while since we've had an opportunity. That's, that's why I wanted to make sure uh, you had a chance to go ahead and do that. Uh, we're going to talk uh, in just a minute about the potential modification of uh, uh, the uh, schedule here. Like certificate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, went to, you went to school on taxes, huh? Yeah. I went <laughs> like, to school on taxes and passed again. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Put your shingle out there, huh? Uh, <laughs> just, just real quickly, I'm, I'm not going to cover too much with my district, uh, uh, but just uh, real quick, I. I am going to go into discussions associated with some of the traffic woes, uh, as you've heard over the years with uh, uh, Oak Creek Canyon, uh, City of Sedona, Forest Service, uh, uh, ADOT, although the meeting's more from a presentation by the uh, agencies that are doing things uh, to uh, somewhat of an advocacy component. So I'm, you know, I got to reach out and see, you know, can I help guide it or not? Or, just go attend and see see where we go with it. Uh, the um, 
Uh, we have a quick, uh, like, last minute set up with uh, Congressman O'Halloran to uh, uh, go up on Bill Williams Mountain on Friday. Uh, the uh, objective, uh, you know, one is to try and get the city council up there. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see who will go along. Uh, but, you know, as Geronimo had mentioned, a chance to look at uh, the effect of the helicopter and what we saw in the presentation earlier here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be meeting with the, uh, um, the Williams Republican Club uh, uh, pretty soon here, uh, given an update of uh, what we've been doing. Uh, let's see. Uh, the hot issue that I have in the district is, um, you know, we hadn't fully constructed the Belmont interchange. They are not interchange, but the roundabout. Roundabouts, no matter what, you know, my experience with Sedona is community's not going to like them fully. Some will really like them and others won't like them. Uh, but, you know, what is the design? How does it work? Uh, you know, we've had snow issues coming through. We haven't fully uh, implemented the uh, signage uh, associated with it. And so, uh, you know, we'll be interacting more with the community, but also, uh, uh, you know, solution-based uh, approach of what we're doing and, and how we're approaching it, what's going on associated with that. Uh, we've had a lot of people that moved in also that I've seen that, um, you know, they're used to their jurisdiction where they do build roads uh, and don't uh, have people come up with uh, uh, improvement districts. And so the, uh, uh, you know, understanding uh, uh, Arizona, uh, why you have lower taxes is, is part of it, uh, is that uh, the local jurisdictions, uh, in this case, the counties, uh, don't have that uh, same funding mechanism that you'll see in other areas. But uh, uh, that's a piece of uh, understanding that people have come from a lot of places. And that's not just it. You know, there are issues that we've had. Uh, and we're taking a look at it, but it also plays into the advocacy of, uh, you know, the state had shut down the rest stops. That's an impact. Uh, we didn't get the DCR, the expansion of I-40, because the funds went away for the state. Again, because gas taxes are locked in. And, uh, and so the interchanges uh, weren't expanded. The uh, interstates weren't expanded. And uh, so uh, it compounds the uh, discussion. And then you play in a you know, moment by moment uh, discussion uh, by social media rather than, uh, you know, we can't respond that rapidly uh, to everybody's uh, thoughts on what's happening. How do we communicate in a, a well-founded way of uh, communicate in a well-founded way of helping people understand uh, how we're approaching issues, what we can do, what we can't do. Uh, so those are those are big pieces, but we are continuing to work on that. As you all know, Snowplay's uh, uh, been in an impact in many areas, and uh, the trees did mention. Um, the, uh, there was one more that I had in there. Uh, let me jump on for the testimony. Um, Oh gosh! If there is, I'm, I'm not okay. gonna. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. Mr. Uh, Chair, but, you, want, you wanted to introduce your district director. Oh gosh, that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, so I have, um, as you all know, I did, Greg got a job with Public Works about two months ago or so, with three months ago when he's been working for me while also doing that and. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've been fortunate to hire uh, Tammy uh, Suho Vieco. How'd I do, Tammy, on that? I hope I, uh, I, uh, you gave me the phonetic pronunciation of your name. And I'm learning to spell it also. <laughs> uh, but uh, what a welcome, Tammy. A lot of people know Tammy. She's worked for us for, uh, you know, with Dave Rosema. Uh, uh, was over there. Uh, uh, worked for Bill Ring in an administrative role. Uh, and then Sue, uh, Sue just snuck her away. There's Tammy out there. And say hello, Tammy. Hello, everyone. And you did just fine on the name, Matt. Oh, good. I'll, I'll keep wearing it. I have to carry my, uh, my cheat sheet with me. But I'll, <laughs> thank you, Tammy. And welcome on board. So there's Tammy, uh, just a, a professional. People love her uh, throughout the uh, county organization. And, you know, it, it'll give Greg an opportunity to move on. And then, and then, just like I did with Lindsay, I got to cry because I'm losing Greg. He's leaving me. 
But Greg, where are you? He's out there. I, I want to thank Greg for wonderful years of service. You all know Greg and uh, what he's done uh, for the office. Uh, and uh, a neat thing is, you know, I, and I really do. I, working with uh, everybody, uh, it's it's always been a, a shared relationship in, in how our office runs. Uh, and also an opportunity for growth. Uh, you know, um, you've seen Lindsay go to become the clerk of the board. I've had other, uh, you know, we transition everybody to where they want to go, but we grow our own. And uh, Greg, uh, you've, you've done well, even though you're leaving me. So there's Greg. There he is. Yeah, I just really appreciate the opportunity extended to me by the county um, and you, Chair Ryan, uh, to serve in your office over the past two years. It's been such a learning experience and the honor that I've had to serve with not only you, but also with your colleagues uh, as we've worked on a variety of different things. It's, it's been a true honor. I'm still here and I will uh, miss working directly with you, uh, but I'm always a phone call away and hopefully I'll get some more plants. So thank you again. Uh, uh, if you want plants, what did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Matt Ryan. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Yeah, just thank, thank you, everyone. And it's been a real pleasure and honor. And thank you to the board for their support uh, during the transition. Yeah, just uh, uh, for, for those out there that are just learning of this, uh, uh, Tammy is the business manager here uh, over at uh, facilities and will continue to do that and assist uh, uh, up through the budget uh, while they're also onboarding another business manager uh, uh, for facilities. Uh, Greg will help Tammy with transition. Uh, uh, and she's a quick study. She's already grabbing it pretty quick here. And, uh, uh, but uh, Greg needs to get over to public work. So he'll uh, be transitioning out. But it'll take a little bit of time as we work through this, making sure every department uh, can do well. So there you go. Uh, Mr. Chair, so, just a quick uh, slight correction. So Tammy is the interim assistant director of public works, of, excuse me, facilities. So, yes. So we're doing that recruitment. But anyway. Yeah. So yeah they, have that, they have actually both recruitments are going on. So she is doing oh, that. And she'll be stepping, <laughs> stepping in with that as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Steve, uh, you okay. know, uh, let's, let's talk about the, we, so we're looking at, yeah. Yeah, so I asked Lindsay uh, for sake of the schedule because we've we've come to the end of the day, and I think we are kind of on on running on fumes. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to ask Lindsay to project the planning calendar uh, because the executive item session item. I know we have staff that have personal commitments uh, uh, after five, and so Lindsay, can you show the calendar? Because what I'd like to propose, Mr. Chair and members of the board. But since we don't have a public audience waiting for the outcome of this discussion, I'd like to push the executive session that we had originally scheduled now to uh, to February first. Uh, and and I don't I don't necessarily think we need to go through what's going to bump or what's not. If you tell the staff make it work, we want to put it earlier in the day because it's an important item uh, to have a discussion. The exec session uh, uh, is going to be focused on legal advice uh, regarding our implementation of the American Rescue Plan community investment area. Uh, so if we can uh, push that to the first thing or sometime you know, earlier in the day on, on February 1st, uh, I believe that, that would work. Um, also then from that, we wanna come back and we certainly want to acknowledge our nonprofit and community partners have, for bearing with us, it has taken a process, and I know that we've had several opportunities to, you know, uh, we've reached out to them. In fact, today we 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 were, you know, informed those in our partners uh, that we were not going to be coming out of exact session. So, what I would like to do, though, is is shoot for a, a follow up presentation that would be uh, an action item, uh, uh, consideration of an action item on February 2nd to, to, for a framework to implement for the board. So exec session on the 1st of February, uh, we go from that, uh, we, we create the, the scenario based on uh, advice from council and input from the board. And that uh, we do a date certain, February 22nd, coming back to the board uh, for a framework for consideration for implementation. Uh, again, it is an important program and uh, we do need to move on that, but again, 
uh, those are my suggestions for you. And again, looking at, at the planning calendar, you know, I, I think we can certainly look at that at the staff level and bump items and bump items that are that are certainly important, but not as time sensitive as this is. So Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back to you for board discussion. Okay, turn back to the board. Uh, you see what Steve's recommendation is there. Are you okay with that? Let me just, uh, I can't see everybody, uh, Patrice. Well, we really do need to move on with this. Um, and I know everybody is tired and um, uh, yes, I, I guess I'm okay with it. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. Uh, it's, we start to get a fatigue factor that's also happening here. Uh, but uh, Hieronymus? I agree. I, I'm pretty much done for today, and I, I like the idea of what's proposed. Okay. Uh, Lena? Uh, yes, I understand staff have other schedule uh, and after five, so I, I support it. Thanks. Yeah, and, um, uh, Judy needed to hop off. Uh, uh, she needed to head out, uh, so we lost Judy also uh, on that. So with that, yeah, we'll make modifications uh, to what we're doing with the calendar there. Um, and with that, um, that brings us to a wrap up. Steve, I'm assuming you, you know, you already reached out to Bill uh, and talked to him about um, that. Sue, Sue's doing that right now, so. Okay. You need um, us to hang on here or are you good? No, we're, I think we're fine because tomorrow at agenda review we can we can go over some of the some of the topic changes we'll we'll make on schedule. So, okay, all right. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody. Actually, a lot of really good stuff that happened today, uh, and thank you uh, also uh, for um, you know we've I've had some family losses here that I've been able to support uh, family, but you you all have been. Uh, uh, you know, understanding and helping out uh, as well uh, on that. Uh, so uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful day, and we'll, we'll see everybody uh, next week. Okay. Night, everyone. Night, all.